Block 4. Iris, grab some raincoats and follow Clay back up to the lighthouse ruins. Crocker said before he and the rest of the flare-wielding Strider group ran off. Iris thanks to some instruction from Kane knew where the raincoats were held in the land cruiser and picked up one for her and two more for Aliathra and Samantha who ran off without raincoats. She then returned to Clay who escorted Iris back up the cliff. The rest of Strider group descended to the beach. They had to struggle to find a fine line between the urgency of their steps with the caution of their footing against the slippery ground. After a tense descent down the slopes, the flare-wielding half of Strider group made it down without any complications. Pop the flares now, Crocker ordered. He loaded his flare gun and shot the first out of five shots into the air illuminating the shadowy beach in artificial sunlight. The ball of light that was expelled from the flare gun fell like a lamp hanging on a corner. It further illuminated the beach. Diaz, Abidia and Ken popped open their flares and began to run down the beach. They both agreed that they should be equidistant from each other as they waved the flares around to make the full stretch of the beach as visible as possible. The beach was quite large that Strider group are safe from the crashing waves but the beach is shallow enough that any large vessel will be marooned. The worst case scenario was that the ships will crash violently and be engulfed in fire and the best case in their gamble was that the ships will be marooned with minor damage to the ship and its precious cargo. Crocker hoped that these Tavai sailors are indeed skilled in maritime related magics if Zartruk and Aliathra's words are to go by. Meanwhile back up at the lighthouse ruins, Iris has just made it back up to the top of the lighthouse and is now assisting the elven mage with her own magics with Iris crystal necklace as an auxiliary power source. LT What is the status of those Tavai ships? Clay asked. They would be blind to not see this. Look, Samantha said before she pointed out towards the sea. The boats began to change course from blindly going to a crash course for Suville to now an illuminated sail for the beach below Cowell Point. The boats should in Samantha's intuition should notice the illuminated beach front filled with a trinity of red, green and white lights. Thunders cracked and gale winds shifted as all of Samantha and Strider hopes fell on this expeditious plan. The light, the light, it has returned to us. Cal Point shines once more. The elderly ghost feverishly cried. It was an ecstatic roar as the luminous materials that made its body glow brighter. The same can also be said for the younger looking ghost too. The ghost it is getting elated. The lighthouse must be the key. Iris said. The key to what? Samantha asked. For it to move on. Iris bluntly answered. Meanwhile back at the tavern. Sanjilf peeked over the window and he couldn't believe his eyes. The lighthouse somehow rematerialized in amidst the darkness of the stormy night. It was nearly the same structure, shape and state that he remembered in his younger years except for the being to be made of pure bright light. Soaring, illustrious and the most important of all gleaming against the obsidian deluge that is night. From what his old eyes can discern he could see none other than Samantha and her friends that she insists she calls team, standing alongside his tragically departed father-in-law Keon and his brother-in-law Farand. For the first time in a long time, he was reminded of times when he was a youthful young restaurateur who married the beautiful daughter of the lighthouse keeper. He had a dream to build the greatest tavern and inn in all of Gleesia. It renewed him a vigor that he thought was lost forever when he buried Dibon some time after that tragic accident. A vigor to continue on living. A tear fell from his eye. A tear of sweet respite. This Samantha Rose alleviated his burden. Okay, 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 eh? It's coming, it's coming. Diaz said as he saw the boats steer the course towards his direction. As soon as the Tavai smugglers on the could see the peaking grey of dry land, their sailors readied themselves with their water magics for a very rough landing. Conjuring the water around them to their will. The sailors created an artificial wave from the violent seas that they used to safely cushion their landing. The waters engulfed all of their hulls as they thrust themselves to the safety of dry land in a aim to land the ship in a less turbulent medium. Brace, a Tavai captain told his crew. Bollocks, get out of the way. Crocker yelled. Strider group dropped their flares and began to scramble away from the ships who sped past the beach and onto the wet and muddy plain inland. 
the water magic caused their boats to hover past the ocean before touching down ungracefully at the flat plain, slight capsizing their vessels as soon as the magic energies dissipated. Ultimately there was now a crash fire which relieved everyone in Strider Group. Let's go. Crocker told him. Diaz, Abidia and Kane followed the sergeant towards one of the boats where the crew emerged from their vessels, battered in rainwater but unharmed except for a few cosmetic cuts and bruises on their bodies. You, the sun shares her wealth, a Tavai told Crocker. It was a challenge phrase. Thankfully Aliath retorted them the correct response earlier to all of the teams involved in this operation. It was based off of a Tavai proverb about generosity, and the moon follows her example. Crocker responded. So, you are what Zartrik told us about? Your armor is impressive. The Tavai said. Thank you but let's get down to business. How much of these crystals do we got? Crocker said. Thirty crates all filled up just as you wanted. Ten each per boat. Zartrik will take care of our payment. Where can we hide them for now? The Airquester will surely investigate. The Tavai informed. His breath was weary from the storm he and his fellow sailors barely survived such an encounter. I know a place for now. Get your crew to port these and follow us. Diaz. Root. Mudwing carry some boxes and get them to the lonesome hearth now. Crocker ordered. For the next two hours. Strider alongside the Tavai smugglers ported all thirty crates to the lonesome hearth. They had to make multiple returns back to the boats to ensure every last crate was accounted for. From Cairn's observations, the crates weigh about ten kilograms each. Much to Sanjilf's astonishment and chagrin over the influx of newcomers into his establishment. What? Who are these people? Sanjilf asked. Tavai. Sea Elves, Samantha said after she hung her wet raincoat by the door and shaking off the raindrops from her body with a towel. Sea Elves? Nothing really good every comes with them. Hey, what are those boxes? Why are they glowing? Are those mana crystals? Enough to supply an army of mages? Sanjilf pointed out to Crocker who was storing the crates at the tavern's empty storage room. There wasn't much content outside of Sanjulf and Octu's personal supply of food for their nutrition, a few barrels of untapped wine, a box of dried meats and lastly some preserved produce. He didn't want to have his life's work seized by the guards for being an accessory to a crime. His debts to Jodand was already difficult enough to fulfill alone. Without his establishment scrapping by his meager paltry sums to the bank, he might as well sell himself into slavery. Look here innkeeper. The Tavai captain approached the fearful old man. The sea elf reached into his pocket and handed him over a full hand-sized bag at Sanjilf's hand. From the clinking noise that Samantha could hear it was a bag full of coins. Bribe money. This deal is going to make me famous amongst my cartel and I don't want some nosy innkeeper to ruin it for me. The sea elf captain said. Sanjilf tried to speak up but the Tavai cut him off. I would like to invest 10,000 ducats to this fine establishment, in addition to any donations from my motley crew here for shelter and a meal for the night. Do we have a deal? The Tavai proposed. The old innkeeper was left flabbergasted. His eyes and mouth were widened open by the large sum of ducats he heard the sea elf offer, not believing his ears at that moment. Sanjilf pushed the captain aside and headed to the bar counter of his tavern and opened the bag. He counted the golden, silver and bronze denominations of the bag. To his amazement, it was indeed exactly 10,000 ducats that he held on his hands. He turned to the Tavai captain, his worrisome concern over being an accessory to a crime transitioned to optimistic participation. I, 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 can pay. Off my de Deb. Please yes. Everyone, make yourselves at home tonight. I don't have much but everything is one the house for you for one night only. Sanjilf smiled, and for the first time in his life, he had tasted the success of prosperity. All the tired, thirsty and hungry congregation of Tavai sailors and Strider group cheered for the rest of the night. Dining, or more of rationing, on smoked fish, dried fruit and wine with a few shanties sang by Aliathra and the Tavai until they all collapsed in fulfilled pleasure. Sanjilf looked on and when he saw Samantha try to sleep on the chair of one of his tables, he carefully gave her a blanket and a pillow from one of the lonesome hearth's guest rooms for her to lay comfortably on.
he gave thanks to the gods for his change of fortune. Dash. The next day, Dash Strider. I think I fucked up. Ah, Byung-Chin said. He palmed his face as a massive headache assaulted him again. The next day after the stormy night was dry and blue skies like how the youth first entered Suville. They returned to Camp Gilly Leaf after the convoy that was meant to transport the precious mana crystal cargo to New Albany for Dr. Malone. They bid farewell to the Tavai who had to quickly get out of Suville once the order was delivered before the local authorities came. Their marooned boats re-entered the waters the same way how their ships were beached in the first place last night. It was no wonder as Samantha documented on her camera why the Tavai were renowned sailors. What happened? Did relationships break down with the Duke? Samantha asked. No. Actually it's never been better. It's just that. Well. Yesterday. The Duke shared with me a special bottle that keep me smiling for days such as yesterday and it was so dot damn good. Byung-Chin said. He is suffering from a hangover lieutenant. One of Byung-Chin's PMC bodyguards explained. And what happened? The lieutenant pressed further. You know about those dot game hiss that's happening tomorrow? Byung-Chin asked. The Corsi ad? Yes, I know. We noticed the town has been preparing for it. Hopefully the storm doesn't cancel it. Samantha answered. Well, Byung-Chin replied before he let out a large belch from his stomach it is going through. The corpo added. One day delayed to be exact. Which is two days from now. Byung-Chin finished. That's great. So, will you be there to watch the games with him in some fancy box thing? You're his guest after all. Not me. We are all are. Byung-Chin waved his hands carelessly while giving a loose smile on his reddened cheeks. We? Samantha twitched her eyebrows. Not completely all of you lieutenant but some of you will participate. Byung-Chin's bodyguard explained. Participate? As in? Play in the games? Samantha asked. Yes. During last night while we were dealing with that incident by the lighthouse, Mr. Byung-Chin and Duke the Bolt had a drinking session together to pass the time. The wine served was so. A. How do I say? Potent for lack of a better term. That it made Mr. Byung-Chin very loose-lipped, the bodyguard explained. I am actually more concerned about what happened in the lighthouse with Viking team. What happened? All I got was broken words and static. Samantha asked. First off I would want to commend your team for your quick thinking on averting a potential disaster first. The bodyguard clapped followed by everyone else in the camp congratulating the young lieutenant. She blushed with all the flattery she received and with a retained yet slowly fading smile she continued on with her inquiries. With gratitude. And now the incident. What happened? All I saw was the lighthouse turning off when it shouldn't be. Samantha asked. Sabotage. Viking lead stood up answered. My team were digging in at Zartrek's warehouse for the night when the storm hit. Then one of my men spotted a suspicious individual assaulting and then murdering the lighthouse keeper. We gave chase and managed to capture him, after some, chat time with him he squealed and led us to his friends. We managed to find this, the team leader presented to Samantha a ring, it had an intricate symbols of a bird-like creature and what can she only describe as four petals spreading outwards like a flower from what she could discern, in between the lines and crannies of the symbol. There were traces of a red paste that stuck to its surface. After smelling red material, she came to the conclusion that it must be some sort of wax. That looks too delicate for anything I have seen at the moment. Maybe it's not from here, Samantha asked. That looks of elven design is my guess. Iris added. Funny enough, we did find some elves there. They were doing some sort of ritual or something when took them by surprise. We managed to get some of them but a few managed to escape from the fight with some of them invisibility magic. Viking lead said. Hey, maybe Aliathra knows a thing about this. Samantha asked. She took the ring and head outside. Normally Aliathra wasn't allowed to be in such meetings due to her relatively recent assignment with the study and observations group. Her normal routine outside of eating breakfast with everyone was at the camp's lavatory washing her golden blonde hair and trying retain any grace still worthy of a former princess. They did indeed find her observing herself in the mirror. 
She was touching the screen's silver surface staring at herself when Samantha approached her. Good morning Aliathra, Samantha said. And also, with you Rose. Aliathra answered as she dried her hair. We need your help with something. Elven in nature. Can you help? The lieutenant asked. The elf nodded and Samantha promptly showed the ring. Immediately, Aliathra's eyes widened. She grabbed the ring. Her eyes blinking in disbelief as she examined the object with not only her sight but her touch and scent. After a long minute looking at the ring, the elf turned to Samantha again. Where did you get this ring? Aliathra asked. First, tell me what is this ring first? Samantha asked. This winged creature you see here? It is called the Bean Arbor. A small little bird native to my elf Elnora. It may be small but it is perhaps one of the most cunning creatures I have ever seen with my own eyes. Aliathra said. Oh? Tell me more. Samantha leaned over, eager to hear. Bean arbors love to eat berries and insects but it gets its name for how it attracts the latter. You see, the bean arbor can open their mouths to appear like plants in full bloom. If an insect such as a honeybee tries to get close to the bean arbor so it can pollinate. Once the bug gets close enough. It will quickly devour it whole. Deceptively beautiful but deadly when you least expect it. Like. There. Aliathra said before pausing. She hesitated to say a word. Miss Lytha, do you want to say something? Samantha asked. What happened? Lieutenant? What happened? Aliathra asked. Samantha sighed. It was best to tell her the hard truth. We found this on an elf who was caught trying to sabotage the lighthouse. The one you and Iris had to tag in for. Remember that storm? Samantha answered. How could they? All of those. Do they dot all of those? People. All of that. Crystals. Aliathra muttered. The elf became distraught. Her eyes redden as she began to shed tears. Tears of disbelief. Who? Samantha pressed. The Sephiliad. You remember them don't you? Aliathra said. Yes, I do. Elven diplomats and spies right? That's their ring? Samantha asked. For top secret documents, yes. But they caused the lighthouse to get turned off? Aliathra asked. Yes. We also found their camp where they were performing some sort of magical ritual too. Samantha added. They must have been trying to do some sort of curse or whatever against you and your UFAE masters. The storm, the games being cancelled. They are likely trying to make you look bad by creating contrived bad omens. Aliathra said. That's horrible. Samantha recoiled. Do they also intend for those Tavai ships with the crystals to crash on Suviel too? She asked further. Perhaps. I know Zartrak normally tries to stay away from them even if they offered him money since the requests they ask of him made him risk his reputation, friends and even his own life in many occasions. I am just. How could they? Aliathra cried. How could they what? Samantha asked. How could they be willing to do that? Risk thousands of people's lives just to stop you? Do they forget they are supposed to be spies? Not dot murderers? Despoilers? Or, or vandals? Do they forget that Nanith teaches to value life? Have they forgotten that? Aliathra began to cry. She fell on her knees on the ground and curled up. Samantha followed her down and held her ha ND on one hand and the elf's back with her other one. She knew that the elf was in a state of disbelief and she had to be there for her. Aliathro had essentially lost everything she had known. Her family, countrymen, status and other material sorts except the clothes and items she carried with her when she first ventured out into the world. I am so sorry Aliathra. It must be tough hearing this. Samantha said. I am a monster. The elf cried. My heart. My legs are impure and now my former sisters and brethren are hunting me. Worst off they are doing all they can to get find me and kill me. I am nothing but another monster to the elves that needs to be wiped off of the face of the world. Aliathra sobbed. Don't say that. You are an angel and I am thrilled to have you here with us. Samantha reassured her. You are thrilled? Aliathra turned her eyes back. They were doe-eyed as her ocean blues met with Samantha's olive greens. Happy. You are doing so much help. I mean if it weren't for you the Tavai would have crashed at Suville. You did good. No demon would ever do that right? Samantha reasoned. You. You're right. I did. Aliathra smiled amidst her tears. Look. 
Tomorrow will be our day off. We can do whatever we want during the games. A girl's night out perhaps? You, me and Iris out at the town? Enjoying the sights, Samantha proposed. Can we visit the art college then? I wish to hear the bards sing and the sculptures there. Aliathra asked. Sure, thing let's go back, Samantha said. She held the elf's hand and took her back to where the rest of them are at. But as they got there she could hear an intense argument going about. You want me? To participate? Diaz asked Bianchin. Ye dot r. Come on if you win you can keep the whining skews I don't know what to do with them. Bianchin answered. The rest of the youth soldiers gathered around gave awkward looks to Diaz and Bianchin as Samantha and Aliathra found their seats. What is going on? Samantha asked. You won't fucking believe what Bobby did with Duke Thibault. They made a bet. Crocker smiled. What kind of bet? You know when you drink too much you start to do stupid shit Rose? Well Bianchin said. Or at least according to his murky guards that he told the Duke that the some of us youth soldiers can win some of the games handily. You see, gambling is something the Duke and a lot of these Suvelis like to do outside of getting drunk, posing nude and singing a lot. Crocker said. Doesn't sound so bad. Samantha said. But. Then again, I don't think Colonel Polonsky or Major Holyfield would approve of us going unless there's something out of it. Is there something out of it? What's at stake? Well for us if we lose, we have to give some merchandise for free. Nothing too sensitive but it's quite a lot. I am talking about macaroni, pasta, books, sauces, and clothes. About a hundred thousand worth of some commodity shit. Then again, some of our shit are luxuries to these natives, like soap and salt. Crocker said. And if we win? Samantha asked. Mercantile permits free of charge and allowing our ships to come in and go here. We just need to win at five games and me and Diaz are gonna do some of them. Command got the heads up and are willing to play along. Crocker said. What games are you participating? Samantha asked. Me? A fighting tourney with the local Suvial Knights as my teammates. But there's a catch. Crocker informed. A catch? Not only I need to win the tourney for Suviel but also I need to be able to take out at least about a dozen number of opponents. Good thing I got my exosuit armor on since the games are very open-minded to say the least. Just that no killing, use designated weapons given by the tourney people and armor has to be at a set amount of thickness. My exosuit is pretty light outside of the pistons it chooses. Should be approved. What about Diaz? Samantha asked. Oh. Horse racing, Crocker said. Since when did Vincent know how to ride a horse? Aliathra asked. Didn't he told you that ah? Uh? Listen here lieutenant, next thing I want you to do is scream at Mr. Bianchin when I tell you. Diaz's horse is his Mustang. Crocker bluntly said. A car into a horse race? Isn't that unfair? Samantha said. She faced at the sheer ridiculousness of such a bet if it was one to begin with. I heard that L.T. Diaz turned around. And yes, even I have standards. He continued to protest. But look here Vinny, the horses there are said to be some of the fastest in all of Gleesia. The races are just like, I don't know Gran Turismo, Nasca, F1. But with horses, Bobby argued while he curled an awkward smile. Circus Maximus but on a circuit basically. Or something. I ain't cleaning any horse guts or roadkill if this is your plan. Diaz told back. I will probably just take my time sweet time or give them all a head start. Think of it this way. Goodwill. I mean you don't have to really win this game there's like a whole bunch more games we can go through. Yeah. I had to explain that shit to command that this is a goodwill mission. Just try to have fun at least, Bianchin reasoned. I am giving up a rest day for this, Diaz complained further. Well compared to what shit we all gone through, this is a vacation. Viking lead commented. Diaz paused and think for a moment. He raised his hand up for a second to protest before he pushed it back down again and think again. Fine, I will throw some chips this one. I just want to have a night out after this is all over, Diaz submitted. But no guarantees, Diaz said. Of course, maybe a night of drinks should be good, Bianchin said. Thank you. Diaz bowed down as he heads back to his chair. One last thing. 
since this is a goodwill visit there will be some people back from New Albany that will be coming to visit, mostly merchants and a few diplomats but Governor White's is gonna see if we can get ourselves our own booth at the festival at the last minute but worst case scenario it's just gonna be a flea market stall, Byung Chin said. Speaking of which, how is the governor right now? And Prince Clovich? Clay raised his hand. The prince should be at this hour boarding a ship that will take him to Geneva. Right now, someone is attached to him to make sure he behaves properly when he gets there. This could be the greatest news conference in about decades after the Treaty of Singapore, the bodyguard said. All right then, meeting is adjourned. Byung Chin concluded. He grabbed an ice pack and placed it on his head. Chapter 31, Play Hards Part 1 a scruffy but still together dark blue varsity jacket of West Point Military Academy which imprisoned Samantha's green buttoned up shirt was all that she wore outside that brought her otherwise military demeanor to of a casual wearing young woman of 23 autumns. She still had her tactical jeans, with a pistol for protection just in case, and her boots from her standard uniform but for the average Gleesian and even for Aris and Aliathro who have come to know the red-headed leader of Strider group is that she looks nothing as intimidating as many of them would say of their first impressions. For Iris, she was wearing the same clothes she had bought from that boutique in Kesselheim that Apara Corporation took the brunt of the bill for and by every playful glance of the mirror she sees herself dashing. For Aliathra she still wore her worn range armor with its Cecil for realm armor which is a tree bark that can be fashioned into armor that outperforms the protective properties of leather with the added benefit of being more receptive to magical enchantments that elves always added as Iris informed the lieutenant. For the elf's case, she made her range armor have insulation properties against fire of both natural and magical types. It looks like we are ready for our girls' night out in the town now, Samantha said. Today was a special day or at least that's how Samantha entreated to the vampire witch and the former elven princess. It was their day, but it's still morning. Aliathra raised. I mean, it's ladies' day. Samantha corrected herself. What is this ladies' day you speak of? Iris asked. Well... It's just something us women in the Federation call when where women get together and go out and have some fun together. Samantha explained, you can just go out like this every now and then? Iris asked. Yup, we do this so we can take a break from it all. No boys, just girls just doing girl things. You will get what I mean as time passes. Samantha reassured. Oh my. Aliathra blushed. That must be a lot of chaperones to keep an eye on them. With no chaperones. Samantha said. The elf princess eyes widened at the second word of that sentence. She was flushed to hear such an idea of no supervision was unthinkable for her or any other elven women for that matter. Her mother says that as a lady of elf Elnora. There is a degree of separation that she must and those of her position must have with other folks. Soirees under the eyes of the royal guards and having an attached company of knights during her studies days at the academy with her movements planned out for a decade such an unshackled and spontaneous time to just go out was the first ever sprouting of freedom that Aliathro had ever heard of. We, we can go to that museum. Right? With the statues? Aliathra asked. Yeah sure. Samantha nodded. Why not? The lieutenant shrugged. The bards must also be getting ready for their songs too. We can also catch that too after we look at the art exhibits. Iris mentioned. Off the girls went to the Kalkayo Sophistica dig Selfacruft, otherwise known as the College of Fine Arts and Crafts. The Suville sun radiated down at the idyllic duchy as the locals merrily opened themselves up for the first hours of festivities. Some children were playing or waiting for the exciting events that are scheduled today such as the games which also reminded Samantha that two of her squad mates were participating as an act of diplomatic goodwill to Duke Thibault but she knew that this will be more of a show of force unless they decide to hold themselves back but in her own honest opinion she doesn't know which is the correct choice to be perceived strong or to be perceived as just both had their own rights and wrongs as for the rest of the walk the duchy sprang into even more vibrancy as the festivities were being emplaced colored banners were raised summer flowers were installed and the folks strolled in celebratory wear of frilly costumes 
playful masks and extravagant hats. Suveal had turned into the makings of a so many colors. Samantha smiled whilst she held her camera. She devoured all the fantastic eye candy she saw and took. She did have to explain to the locals who were acting on suspicion by the other worlders strange eye-like device but after an explanation or at least as best she could by saying that. This object is a possessed by a painter so detailed and so fast that it can make an exact copy of the sight it saw when I command it. The natives were eager to be put into paint as they responded and gladly posed. They were indeed shocked at the sheer precision, detail and lighting the camera can produce in such an instance. They passed by Duke Thibault's fairy tale of a Lycanus castle just as the man alongside a horseback riding Robert Bianchin who was trying to keep a straight face whilst his horse trotted. His company of mercenary bodyguards were all jogging around him to keep up with the cavalcade. For Samantha she knew that their ultimate destination is still the art college albeit for the Duke, the games will be held at a field outside of the college whose premises are outside of the city proper and surrounded on the east the picturesque farmlands that the duchy is famous for and at the west the great blue sea, people are now flocking to the college as Samantha noticed, peasants, off-duty knights, travellers from faraway lands, townsfolks and nobles were all eagerly walking towards the festivities. Today was going to be a fun day Samantha said to herself. She worked hard for the past few months. Now she wants to play harder, and also show Iris and Alia throw a good time out in the town. Meanwhile, in a secluded tent near the Elven Bazaar part of the festival, some shocking news was discovered. The Duke invited these demons to these games, said a Cephid Liad agent. He was weary, his clothes torn and physically exhausted. Their plan to cancel the Corsiad of the highest possible degree. Not only where the plan failed in its intentions, but it was effectively countered by the unexpected arrival of these otherworlders who had come to their camp in the middle of their weather invocation ritual. Of the twelve Cephid Liad agents that were in that camp, only five got out with their lives. That is what I have heard from the ambassador. They will send several of their finest warriors to participate in the games. No doubt to show their power and impress everyone. They will likely be seduced by them and be vulnerable to whatever sorts of corruption or sweet nothings they will offer. Marxian said. There are also reports from that one such person accompanying the demons shares a likeness to her royal majesty princess Alia throw herself. Brenira said. She must be just some sort of shifter of sorts. Just to exercise some goodwill under false pretenses to the Duke. Cursed Waldorin. I doubt it's always that fat human and his guards near him that talks with the Duke. I doubt that's a shifter though. She most likely is being held captive by that red-headed one and her fellow demons. I heard that the fat human speaks to them very favorably and two of them will be competing in the games. Marxian said, if their intention is to impress the people of Suville with their feats we will need to show them that they are weak. We can use our holy spells to diminish them and then ultimately expose them for the tricksters they are, said Marxian. We will need to be careful when it comes to the fighting tournaments. The judges have been stepping up their procedures for any unscrupulous folks, Waltorin said. The Corsiad's fighting tournaments were notorious for cheating. Illegal substances that enhances the performances of teams pre-battle spell enchantments on tournament regulation equipment and poisoning the other teams beforehand were part of the course in the game. If it wasn't for the large prize money in the end, many fighters would have skipped this event. A demon would no doubt have the advantage of its superior physical prowess on its side but it can be diminished by the casting of holy spells upon it. Unfortunately, the Eth Island team's mage doesn't know how to cast them and only he is allowed to cast magic during the battle. As for the one entering the horse races, however, that would be a bit tougher if the rider representing the Outworlders will be mounting a horse borrowed from one of the Duke's own stables since he is there as a guest at the same time as he is a games participant or will it bring its own mount? Either way, outside of telling the Eth Island's representative horse rider the situation at hand, the best they can do is try to poison the other worlders mount if they can. What about the princess? What do you believe? Is she a shifter or being held captive by the demons? Marxian asked. 
I believe that she isn't the princess at all but someone of her likeness, said Brenira. She folded her arms as she said her piece. I think she was simply captured and now forced under to do the demon's bidding. We should see if we can find that red-headed woman. We may most certainly find Lady Aliathra. She must be rescued before the demons use her gifts against us, Waltorin argued. And if she is a shifter, then maybe she may know something or two about these other worlders. Brenira added. Either way that may sound something that we can do to salvage what we can from this calamity. If you see an opportunity take it but don't risk yourself too much. Lindis doesn't want to lose more of us to these demons, nodded Marxian. Dash. Crocker gazed at the black metal reinforced fists his exosuit embedded itself with. He was there, at the fight pits which he arrived so early in the morning that there were still candles shedding a few embers of lights before a dread took their warmth away to make way for the slowly rising sun on the horizon. The fighters inside had a sense of excitement and anxiety for all of their training and preparations will be put to the test at this tournament. Tournament officials began to make a roll call of the tournament's participants. They made their way past the pits accounting all of the fighters and recording whatever formalized position they will take during the games. Crocker got to admit, this tournament was more robust than he thought. I will take a sword and a mace please, Crocker told the tournament official. Excellent choice, the official said. It was honestly the only thing that he had any familiarity of using since the mace and a shield were similar in usage to a riot shield and club. He had a few stints of volunteering for anti-riot operations before. He was told that the tournament regulated weaponry were designed to be dull and at a set weight so it doesn't draw any life-threatening injuries but still cause some considerable damage to one's armor. Speaking about armor, Lewis' exosuit was allowed through due to a mix of technicality and plain ignorance. The technical loophole for his armor being a non-magically enchanted, enhanced armor with his exosuit's protective full-face helmet covering him being within the rules of the tournament. As for the ignorance part, Crocker's exosuit hydraulics were of non-magical in nature and were the secrets to his hidden strength. I heard that you were called the Ogre Breaker. Is it true you fought an ogre with your bare hands and won? One of his teammates asked. His exploits back in Tyrian did indeed perceived him. He was hastily pushed into the local Suvial team as a substitute for one of its linesmen who called in that he was unable to attend the games due to his house being flooded soaked by the storm days ago. Other than their gladness that they won't be a man down for their game, Crocker was still in the humble position of linesman which is the most basic unit of the game. The fighting games were split into many categories as Crocker heard through the officials' rules and quickly understood them. For the duels it's a match between who can get the most accurate hits into the other opponent within a set time frame will win. Another man from Camp Gilly will be in that category and he hopes for his success. As for the group matches, it was more of team coordination and to be able to eliminate another player you have to knock him down for only the feet up to the knees are allowed to touch the ground. Any other part and the tourney officials will count you out of the fight. Magic and any range combat on the other hand has another set of rules just for them. For archers or blistari, not only were they given regulation bows and crossbows but were given specially made arrows that are made to apply a significant amount of blunt force that the unwary warrior can be knocked down by it or if enough of said ammunition saturates its attacks then it can fall even the most steadfast of champions. For mages, they must write a waiver beforehand that details what kind of magic from what type of field they will use and must stick to spells that come from that school only. Any such range objects that may cause collateral damage to the audience are either heavily discouraged or outright banned. Thankfully a shield spell was cast on the stands as a precaution courtesy of the locals. Crocker reviewed his armor, he hasn't officially registered what kind of armor he would be wearing in which it is regulated that it can be of any material as long as there is no magical enchantment were discovered as evaluated by the judges who will classify beforehand. His suit not only allows him to perform Herculean tasks and a minor speed boost but with an additional modification, albeit one at a time every time he has to perform maintenance checks, add first aid injectors which is no pun intended his first choice of gear when he brings out his suit into a combat yet.
Unfortunately, it is considered an illegal substance so that it was considered a discard, unfortunately, an overclockability but in his experience it was risky as the structural integrity of his suit also accelerates the chances of a malfunction, and lastly a small jetpack propulsion systems that can allow him to jump higher or hover into the ground which is what he selected to have on his armor. So, your armor can fly, the judge said. His eyes were twitched in confusion as he observed the burly man before him. He was easily less than half of Lewis' size if I need to and only for a small amount of time. It is its fuel. I mean limits. If it's illegal I will remove it right now, Crocker said. Oh no, your armor. If I can say that is legal, it's just that. Well, it's because of your role in your team that I am quite worried about, the judge said. What do you mean by that? Crocker asked. Linesmen normally wear medium to heavy armor. Your dot armor if I can say that barely qualifies as light, the judge said. I mean it only protects your head, upper chest and some parts of your legs. You are going to feel the full force of everyone's weapons when you get out there at the grounds. I prefer to not be weighed down if I can help it. Crocker considered. Well, you need to be quick on your feet if you don't want to get a sword poked into you. They may be dull but they can still hurt, the judge said as he officially wrote down Crocker's contestant vitals on his paper. You are a linesman wearing light armor while carrying a shield and a mace. Remember that my colleagues who will be out there will want a fair but entertaining fight out there, the judge said. Crocker cracked his fists. He could hear the announcement horn at the distance which alerted the rest of Team Suville that the gathering of fighters from all teams is being called in. Promptly following their lead, Crocker walked out of the fighter's pit as the roar of the crowds engulfed him. The half-sun and half-pegasus banner of Souville flew proudly as he and his teammates draped themselves in the duchy's colors of sunset dusk and aquamarine to each half and half the color over their armor. Many eyes were directed towards Crocker, the women chatted to themselves as they mesmerized over his thick biceps and exotic tattoos. The men commented on his strange armor that he wore that just as the judge has said his piece was almost non-existent outside of several connecting areas over his body, but soon those murmurs turned from astoundment to belittling slander, is that what they call armor? One lightly bloused knight who wanted to have a night out for himself and his lovers asked, that armor won't protect him from anything. All of his skin is out. Is he like some sort of barbarian? Disgusting, scoffed an off-duty guardsman, for someone who can defeat a dozen land sharks and an ogre barehanded. Their fighters look so feeble. A nobleman jeered. All of the fighters about eight teams of them of differing sizes, shapes and colors gathered up to the podium up above them and to his sight. Crocker saw Duke the Bald accompanied by his entourage. Robert Bianchin and a rather dapper fellow carrying an elongated trumpet adorned with a flag. The dapper blew the horn as the crowds and the fighters seized all sound to stop and listen to him. The participants all turned their gazes upwards. A cheer for the fighters, the ladies and the lords. To commence our entertainment two teams shall cross swords, said the dapper fellow as he heralded the commencement of the Corsiad Games. Who virtues ignore all lands blow unclean shall be forever branded as shameful and obscene. The dapper herald spoke in rhymes. Crocker had to admit, his words were worth a dime. Then all of the fighters in their teams saluted with their weapons across for all of the crowds to be seen. Crocker felt ignorant as he was the last man to draw his sword and do the courtesy call. In the meantime, the crowds roared cheering the names of their nations and favorites. Crocker can see that outside of the humans who were likely just people from around the Slaeagian Empire. But there were also fantastic races ranging from animal-like humanoids who wore light armor yet held on their hands several javelins and darts tucked under their shields. He also saw elves who were dressed similarly to what Aliathra's ranger armor was with a mix of green and wood. Another sight was the dwarves who were just like the humans had a more armored uniform befitting of their pint-sized stature. Lastly, he also saw several crudely armored but imposing orcs who wore what is in his eyes scrap metal bundled up to look intimidating whilst covered on a layer of furs. Whilst the fighters prepare, let me say I am elated, to behold such a crowd on the edge, breath-baited, 
The Herald said. Eight teams enter this tournament, their heads held high but only one can take home the crown whose wreaths shall the victor's head will lie. The Herald said before he promptly blew the trumpet again. The first fight of the day is our own company of knights, errants of Suthiel who many here wish to see win the day. Their adversary, a foremost firm, bannerman from the Dwarven Mountains whose walls they affirm. The Herald declared the first bout. The rest of the fighters that were not called left the grounds leaving the Dwarven warriors and the Suthiel knights alone in the tournament field. The shield wall is unbreakable together, screamed one dwarf in his native tongue. The dwarves rely on formations to win due to their armor slowing them down, mentioned one of Crocker's teammates. So what? They can tire us out? Crocker asked. He knew that such a shield wall will be used as a draw away as someone lighter but armed much more offensively can go for the team's unguarded flanks. The Suthiel knight nodded in agreement. We just need to draw out the Dwarven Rangers with our skirmishers before making any push, he said. I see, but be ready in case things go not according to plan. Crocker nodded. After the last few moments of weapons and armor checking, the dapper herald walked towards a large bell near him and with a great strong pull, he rang the bell which signifies the start of the match. Let the courtyard begin. He exclaimed. The crowds roared as they are eager to see the beginning of the games commence. As expected, the dwarves gathered around the shield wall but it wasn't just the linesmen, but it was also the dwarven crossbowmen too. They fortified themselves inside the shield wall before raising their shields upwards on their heads to evolve it into a tortoise formation or the testudo. But this time, there were a crack underneath the formation to allow a crossbow to shoot out from. Several of the Suthiel knights scrambled to defend themselves from the hail of bolts but their unarmored comrades who were the mage and the skirmishers were shot down leaving only the linesmen and crocker left who created their own but crudely shaped shield wall due to a hasty arrangement by this change of events. We need to get close, the Suveli captain ordered atop the jackal box. Duke Thibault watched nervously as his team was being cut down by the dwarves. Are you so sure that your man can win this? Where is this indomitable strength you speak of about these special armors can give? Duke Thibault said. The Hercules Mark IV exosuit is not meant to be used as an armor but instead it is used to help the soldier do more for far less effort added in. It is called where I come from efficiency multiplication. Bobby said. Oh? Explain. The duke leaned closer. Efficiency is input divided by output. Input being how much effort you do something versus output is how much of what you wanted gets out of from your input. Therefore, efficiency is just an indicator. A sort of symbol that you can see on how well you can do your work. In a Paro Corp we believe in making things more efficient. Bobby explained. That still doesn't explain what makes this suit of armor Sir Lewis Crocker of yours so special. The Duke said, in our myths there was a hero named Hercules, who is said to be the strongest man to be ever born. It is said that he can have done thought to be impossible deeds such as carrying a mountain, outrunning a bull and fighting something ten times larger than him. In a Paro Corp we make suits like what Crocker is wearing. Some for agility and some for strength, he said. Imagine your knight being able to do more for you, the duchy and the people of your duchy if they have a suit like Crocker wears. They can carry more objects, do more without tiring too often, move faster in all terrains and be able to do it all again without any break. That is the power of a para corporation, efficiency at the palm of your hands. Yet Bobby internally was a bit embarrassed for himself. He was advertising a paro but the exact origins of the exosuit crocker war was from one of their competitors Militech but the Duke will likely not have any time to investigate it. The suits a para corporation sell to militaries and mercenary companies were more specialized compared to the more jack-of-all-trades suits Militech offers. But if the Duke asks for several suits of armor in exchange for money and other such beneficial guarantees then he will without hesitation give it to him with no knives behind his back. He can always just pass along the past generation exosuits to the Knights Errant of Suville. It could be quite an entertaining sight to see fully armored knights perform athletic feats with ease. What kind of armor does Crocker does he wear? The Duke asked. It is both, Bobby said, down back at the tournament arena.
The remaining Suveli knights closed the distance between them and the dwarves who dug in their heels on the dirt ready to shake resist the battering of the Suvel knights. All of the fighters' feet tore through the dirt and sand of the tournament grounds leaving slight marks and deep footsteps as the weight of their bodies pushed against each other in a clash of physical prowess. Despite their losses, the combined weight of the Suveli knights was of a match against the still intact dwarven bannermen. Crocker however, knew such a strategy have a low probability of working in their favor, brute force meeting brute force will only be a battle for attrition of energy. Then he got an idea, it was an old Chinese teaching he remembered reading from a Chinese fortune cookie dispenser as a joke sometime before his tour here in Benham 3. Water follows to the end while the mountain resists until it erodes. It is also another thing he knows that the strength of the wall is its weakest brick. Applying that to a shield, wall he has to look for the weakest link. Unfortunately, at the heat of the moment, he could barely see the white of the dwarves' eyes so trying to find the weakest link in a span of a few seconds would be too risky. Instead, Crocker thought why not create the weakness? He grabbed the dwarven warrior who was in front of him shield with his weapon hand and yanked the dwarf off of his shield wall, the stout and pint-sized powerhouses that they were. They did not expect to be pulled away rather than just pushed back until they were toppled over. For a split second a large glaring hole was exposed. Crocker thrusted the hydraulic presses of his exosuit forward, his feet drawing a line on the sand. With one great push at that brief second, the sheer weight of his multiplicative force produced by the 150-pound Hercules Mark IV suit plus his 167-pound itself and adding the combined weight of his seven remaining teammates of Suveli Knights Errants. They sent the dwarven bannermen flying in a miss of four-foot tall bodies. Their formation was decimated beyond any that they could conceive. All of them fell down on their backsides or face first onto the sandy ground in utter defeat. The crowds couldn't believe their eyes. The officials couldn't believe their eyes. Some tried to protest by accusing him of sneaking in some magic but the wizard judges confirmed to their own astonishment that no magic was detected among the other world throughout the entire matchup. Crocker stood alone in front of his teammates whilst he himself towered above the knocked down dwarves. What? Is this power? A dwarven bannerman said in a defeated voice. It is called kinetics sir. Crocker said. The audience's attention was held captive as they look upon the triumphant otherworlders who was shaped into a tattooed armed human man. Point made. Byung-Chin smugly smiled as the duke stared at the Herculean feat that had happened. Already the games had started with showstoppers and the courtyard had only barely begun. Dash. At around the same time but another part of the festival two knowledgeable people who know their machineries were at work placing all elbow greasing onto the hardiest of race horses since Secretariat. Even onlookers couldn't help but glance at this strange yet boldly flashing horse that stood amongst the rest of its peers. It was shorter than the other horses and held a wider body expanse. On its surface, the skin was of a setting sun with the visage of a single lone horse on each side that looked almost alive as it pounded across the land. Its legs were circular like a wheel made of luminescent metal instead of wood much to the disbelief of the natives as they only ever saw wheels of the flesh of trees. But the most peculiar feature of it all was the way it rumbles. Some say it coughs winds, others say it howls like the moor of fire but all can agree that it had an aspect of hoarded restlessness within that horse that its rider calls a Mustang 65. Okay. Insides are cleaned. Initiating the computer. Cain muttered. He was assigned to help Diaz tune up his car before the big race. There were some parameters that needed to be optimized since this race is had no pit stops or can afford to have any pit stops. Okay let's see how per Diaz smiled as he closed the lid of his car before turning around back to the driver's seat. Ready, set, go. Ken urged. Diaz revved his engines letting out a boisterous roar. He smiled as he heard his Mustang spring to life. It did however startle several of the contestants and onlookers who were starting to gather at the starting point of the horse race. 
People were scurrying for a place to stand and see the horses that will be participating in this event. Aside from Diaz's oddly shaped steed that he noticed that several onlookers admire the shiny fur which is actually just the waxed surface of his Mustang. As for the other steeds there were some fairly mundane but quite majestically presentable steeds with well-groomed hair and chic dresses from the tall cloaks of linen to jewelry adorned with some hair styling on the manes like braids and knots. That your horse neighs strange, is it sick? One of the contestants asked Diaz. She was a female elf of brown long hair of a lithe frame similar to Aliathra. Her slender legs were emphasized by the slim jockeying pants she wore. Diaz had to admit, that the woman had nice firm behind as he smiled. Men, always think with their eyes. Typical, Magda, Polotiel will leave you all to tasting my dust. The elf rider haughtily said. She twirled her long hair exposing the radiant and moist mane with some sense of oils and perfumes that matches her pride. Her eyes were dismissive seeing the Mustang for her own eyes and the painted horse decals on its sides. The elf thought she was seeing some sort of exotic breed of horse she never heard before but in her eyes it didn't matter. She was confident that she would win with her faithful steed. Well if it means seeing your nice butt, I don't mind losing. Diaz smirked. Such boorishness. The elf scoffed before she walked off with her horse breed. Hey. Diaz did she said that our horse is Agda? Ken asked. Yeah. He nodded. Iris told me about them once. They're considered the fastest horses in all of Gleesia. Even faster than thoroughbreds. Or at least that's what Isaac said. Ken said. Good to know. But that ass. Have you seen that one? Diaz pervertedly smiled. Focus Vincent. Remember this is just an exhibition despite the stakes. Ken reminded. Yeah. You're right. It's like brining a gun to a knife fight yeah? A Ford Mustang created and perfected by Shelby against actual horses. I mean, now that I mention that. Should I hold back? Diaz asked. More like bringing an MGL to a knife fight. Minus Iris power-ups. Ken said. There it is again with Iris. Do you ever? Thank you, huh? Maybe just try? Diaz asked. I, maybe. I, don't know. I. The engineer was at a loss for words. Just try. Initiate. You know you want to. Maybe later. During dinner huh? Sometime together? Diaz proposed. You are right. Maybe I should try at least once. Just. Keep that between us. Ken said awkwardly. Well I am a criminal. So I am a very good liar. Diaz blushed. Just then a herald approached the large stands beside the starting line of the race. He blew a horn grabbing the racer's attention. 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 The festivals, Raz Sefile Outra's duchy will commence in five minutes. He announced. Okay Diaz, one last review before we go, Ken said. This is an endurance race with at least 29 checkpoints between you and the finish line which is right in front of the Duke's castle. You need to pass every last one of those checkpoints otherwise it's all no good. This race is meant to take all day until sunset but your car can easily cut the distance in about an hour or less. I suggest just for the sake of not making the people think we are not gods at best or cheaters at best just try to go easy on them or maybe give them a head start. Also, my drone will provide aerial reconnaissance so I can keep track of your progress, he reminded. Yeah, thanks for that and the map on my phone too. These routes have festival outposts scattered on some of them. Plenty of people to see 700 horsepower in my Mustang. Diaz smiled. 700 horses? Are you a necromancer? Judges. One of the contestants who overheard their conversation exclaimed. I meant that as a metaphor. A figure of speech. Diaz tried to calm him. But that's true. Ken bluntly said. Shut it Ken you ain't helping. Diaz reprimanded. A judge approached them. After the contestant who waved the protest told his piece a mage was dispatched to examine for any magic on Diaz's Mustang. He had to make his horse neigh, kick and strut a few feet. As the mage used his innate senses to detect any illegal arcane energies within the Mustang. I detect no magic of any kind in this strange steed. The judge said. It's just a metaphor asshole. This horse has the power of 700 horses. Diaz boasted. Then let me see the, the track then. I wish to grin off of your brow. The rider badgered. 
Hey leave it to the elf girl over there with Agda thing. Whatever Diaz shot back, she has some great ones on her back to see that I don't mind losing. He gave a soft smile. You mean a dewy eerie and she is from the elven rainbow helms the elite guards of the earth island she is their best rider and the gdu are the fastest breeds known to all of gleesia the rider informed diaz took in that information before he headed back down to the driver seat of his car he could see the sun already radiating from up above him and the mirage lines waving around as it interacts the cool and warm air together leaving some of the dirt roads to give the illusion of water lying about Hey Kayan. It's morning right now so and I haven't gotten breakfast yet. What you're having? Diaz said. Well thanks to some purchases back at town we got some fresh eggs. Then our rations. I got a stove up so I am getting some real food cooked up finally. Kayan said. I can almost taste it. Diaz murmured. Attention all riders the race is about to start. The herald of the game said, try not to run over or scare the shit out of the horses Diaz. Kayan warned. Diaz nodded despite the fact that he was contacting him through radio. He didn't want to get any stains on his car except the inevitable dust he will eject from the ground. But then it him again. The fact that he is essentially bringing a gun to a, no a nuclear missile to a knife fight metaphorically speaking. He may be a hedonistic playhard who strives to always win every confrontational social, business encounter in all of his times as an agent for a para corporation. But all of this was different. There was no thrill to it if he just launched himself over a mushroom cloud of kick dust behind all the other racers, the prize wouldn't taste well if he had such an overwhelming advantage over them. The other contestants' horses were becoming restless as they all piled up around Diaz who was positioned in the exact middle of all of them. He can see that the elf woman he teased was a few positions away from him on his left. She was wearing her knightly helmet and her horse's eyes were focused with a steely gaze. A gaze on the long path towards victory. Riders, ready, get set, the herald announced. All of the horses hollered loudly as they took their first gasp of air for the long rush ahead. But for Diaz, he only swallowed his ego as his right hand lowered towards the keys of his Mustang and ignited its engine. Go! The horses galloped forward leaving a thick and impairing cloud of dust in its wake. It was hard for the race officials to see who was first to emerge from that dust cloud until their eyes shed off the last of the particles from its delicate surface. When the smoke cleared, to everyone and including Cairn's astonishment. The so-called hundred horses mount of Diaz was still stationary before the starting line. You, Vincent, is. Did something went wrong with your car? The engine isn't kicking. Ken radioed. Diaz sighed. I go when I feel like it. You got any of those eggs and some cups of coffee there for me? I ain't tracing on an empty stomach. Diaz said. Ken shrugged. The Federation team can afford this luxury and then again. It's only illegal to willingly go out of your mount once you cross the starting line under pain of disqualification. He too also feels just as bad at being an accessory for such for all intents and purposes. A diplomatic flex on the primitive natives. Diaz winning the race despite the head start from the other contestants could prove to be much more of better impression on the natives to their way of life and power and should be more receptive to a peaceful capitulation of hostilities and suspicion if all goes according to plan. Unknown to Cain, not everyone is impressed with Diaz's performances. The large number of native spectators still insistent that Diaz shows his oh so many horses powered steed. The engineer just so hopes that if he and Diaz have to explain to the officials that the Mustang has indeed had not a single trace of mana when they get probed by the mages officiating the integrity of the event. Magic is a way of life in this world and this world still not ready to embrace science and technology with open arms yet. But a demonstration on the Earthlings' superior ways would be a start to convince them that maybe these other worlders who are in their shape and form might not be so malevolent or hostile as they feared at first glance. But then what if despite such efforts from their more peaceful teams the natives would still rather dilute themselves in fear and paranoia? No doubt instigated by the Empire and their friends and lackeys who still foolishly believe that the youth come here in conquest rather than in peace.
a counter-misinformation campaign will likely have to happen in conjunction with their diplomatic missions from now on as Cairn thought. He will have to suggest this to High Command as soon as he is able. Fine. Scramble door sunny side up? Cairn asked. Dash. The complimentary wine was delicious as Samantha says so herself. She, alongside Iris and Elie are enjoying themselves in an art gallery in the Fine Arts College of Souville. It was an assault on all senses for the women, but a most indulgent assault. There was the pleasant sound of strings humming along the tune of the tintinabulation of flutes and the beating step of an exotic dancer laced in gold and scantily clad dress for the ambience that surrounded their ears. Their noses scented a collection of aromas from flowers, burnt spice mixes and even a few leaves which left them in a state of blissful lethargy. But the real draw was the hard work of the artists who studied in the college. An assortment of paintings, sculptures and mosaics kept the visitors captivated, especially Aliathra whose eyes caught a sculpture that stood by that mesmerizes the men in attendance, a nude woman as the artist intended to be its subject, her long hair brushing leisurely in the back by her slender hands. She was bathing as droplets of water fell down her marble skin from the neck down to her legs. The illusion of water falling was courtesy of a small water sprite that constantly showers the statue in moisture collected from a bucket to be siphoned off to its cloud-like visage before sprinkling it down to the statuesque stunner below. For the elven maiden, to see the woman displayed brandish herself so erotically made her feel thoughts of emancipation, the feeling of being back in control of herself. All those days of proper etiquette, Lady Likes behavior, predetermined expectations from the moment her mother conceptualized her in her queenly womb and all those prying eyes were all forgotten as she saw the fawn-like woman smile as she let the refreshing waters soothe her inanimate skin. Aliathra, Samantha poked her from behind. Ah, the elf jumped. Her sudden reflexes startled the crowd causing a chain reaction where the man next to her recoiled backward hitting another man, a custodian who was carrying a wooden bucket of green paint to lose his balance and spill onto two other attendees. Oh no, I am so sorry. Samantha rushed into apologies. Rose, is that you? Two familiar voices said at the same time. Bishop and St. Julf. What are you both doing here? Samantha asked. She could barely discern a Catholic priest's balding head and St. Julf's graying mane. Now turned Jade, from all the paint that covered them. Bishop's glasses had a splotch of green paint on the right-sided lens but he managed to cover the other side in time with a reflex of his hand. Wait. You know her cleric? Sanjilf turned to Bishop. Yes. We live together in New Albany and I know almost everyone there. But my god. I need to get these cleaned. Bishop sulked over his half-ruined eye air. But that still doesn't explain what you are doing here. Samantha asked. Well for me my child. I am actually helping out building the youth exhibit for this event. Did you also happen to know that I used to have some friends in the museum business in Madrid in the category of religious arts? Bishop said, the money I earned from those elves gave me a lot of things to do lately like actually enjoy the festival. I also volunteered to help cook the food for the students super and I got some time before I am needed back in. Sanjilf said, I see, father, what do you mean by friends in a Spanish museum? Samantha asked, wait. You are her parent? Does your god allow his clerics to have children where you come from? Sanjilf asked. No. No. It's just a title of respect. Nothing more. As for the friends, I was a restorer and conservationist in the Museo Nacional del Prado in Madrid. They pulled a few strings with my old workplace and they let me display these HD photos of the exhibits in here. Bishop replied. What about the paint all over you Father Bishop? Samantha asked. Oh, well, I think I can keep this on for a while since it reminds me of my younger days. I can never be mad at you. Go green arches. Ha. Huh? Bishop jovially smiled. Although. There is. Was Iris. I just wanted to say. I am sorry for all there things I said back in Tyrian. She really is nothing but help these past months here. Where is she by the way? Bishop asked. Samantha turned to both of her shoulders but only Aliathra stood behind her hiding her face in embarrassment. 
I will look for her. It is good to see you both again. Samantha excused herself. She grabbed Aliathra's hand and they weaved through the crowds of people who piled up all over the exhibits. Have you seen where Iris was? Samantha asked the elf. I think she went over there to the older paintings, Aliathra said. Samantha followed her directions and sure enough she saw Iris' dark purple dress with her pale white skin glowing amongst the filter of the college's golden interior. She was peering through a large painting of a man and a woman. Its frame was opulent and its grandeur rising up above the ceiling but contrasting its nobility was its violent scene. To Samantha's horror, the woman held a hammer, raising it high into the air with one hand and at the bottom, as she can see the painted woman's eyes beaming down onto a man laying sleepily onto the ground with a large nail resting on his head, all held steady by said hammer-pounding woman. Iris? Samantha asked. Samantha? Iris turned. You ran off, she said. Oh, I apologize. I wanted to see this painting again for a long time, Iris said. She turned back to the violent canvas, her eyes glaring with an intense synergy between her and the painting. You seem to be quite focused on that, the lieutenant commented. This painting. I know the story, Iris said. Oh, go on, Samantha prompted. During the days of Cadus Lae Jack, a woman by the name of Helene had her entire family murdered by a rival tribe and was said to be forcefully married to one of the rival chief's son who was responsible for killing most of her male family members. Iris foretold. She organized several of her tribesmen and managed to win the support of the newly established Slaegean kingdom to overthrow her family's murderers. At first the Slaegeans wanted to push her around but Helene stood firm and demanded among her land being annexed by the Slaegeans, and then being allowed to rule over it as a duke in equal footing to every other duke in the empire who oversees all the provinces of the empire, but she also demanded that she to be the one to kill her father and brother's murderers one by one. The king of the Slaegeans at the time was so astonished by her fiery temper that he allowed her that satisfaction. A great story. So why do you see yourself a lot in this painting huh? Samantha asked. When I first decided to work with Mirian as an enchanter for some of his Mordot special goods, I was still on the run from the Holy Order due to my vampiric heritage. I felt so helpless when I had to pay for protection from Divigo to keep the Inquisitors away from me. Then Divigo tried to accost me with more egregious demands and that's when I stopped paying for protection, as I had enough. And then you came to my home and as you earthlings would say the rest is history. Iris said, what do you mean by that? Aliathra asked. I helped Iris, permanently, get rid of someone who was extorting her. Let's just say that Tyrion is better off with Divigo gone am I right Iris? Samantha explained. The vampire witch affirmed with tilt of her head. This painting reminded me that even I can be powerful when I am cornered. Iris said. That is great to hear from you. See Aliathra. This is what a girl's night is like. We get to be ourselves for a while. Samantha said to the elven princess. I understand now. The elf nodded too. So, that nude statue. You took your time seeing it just as much as all the men are. Care to explain? Samantha asked. That statue is called a bathing nymph according to the sculptor who was feeding the water sprite with magic. I wanted to just spread my arms and just be free, Aliathra said. Free? As in not having to behave like a princess? Samantha said. Not completely. I have to behave like everyone else. Not as unbridled as the nymphs. Just less chained to so many traditions and social cues, Aliathra said. Oh. So that's why you have been looking at all of those nude statues lately. You are how we called it sheltered. Makes sense give you are of course well. You know. Samantha said. I cannot believe that I am saying this. But I felt free with you then back at Eth Island. She confessed. So, what about you? Did you see any of these works of art that caught your eye? Aliathra asked. It's not a painting nor a statue but a song that I heard from a bard that we passed by. I don't remember well the lyrics but it's about a baby Pegasus who struggled to fly but after practicing he managed to do it and saw. Oh, you mean there. Can you two keep a secret? Samantha asked. I have a fear of not being good enough. Samantha said. Not being good enough? But you are the best person I have ever met. Well. 
other than Cain and Sir Mirian. Iris objected. That's because I let that fear rule me every day of my life, the lieutenant confessed. Normally you're not supposed to let fear take over you but I let it change me, mold me into what I am now. I used to actually be pretty bad at school. Then I was bullied because I sucked at sports and not having the latest gadgets since most of our money is used to treat my father for cancer. But after I followed on to my father's footsteps as so started by my great-great-grandfather, Leah Major who served at World War II, he as everyone who served afterward wanted to make their family proud of them. Samantha said, World War II? What do you mean by your world is in Earth and then war? And then there are two of them? Aliath Rezai's asked with dread. Even Iris also grew pale from that thought and she was already as pale as she is right now. To hear that her world had a war where everyone, every nation participated was the likes of which they never heard of before. Most wars were instigated by the Empire or the Black Tree Pact and they were wars of conquest against lesser nations. But they were told beforehand that all of the youth had similar sizes technology and know-how so the thought of them fight amongst each other in such a world-spanning share is nigh impossible to imagine. Samantha was alarmed of herself with the careless slip of the tongue. It is not a proper time to say it but I will assure you that the reason the youth exists now is that we had to go through those periods several times. Samantha explained, you suffered through several of them? Were they like the legends of the Dark Lord Allbone? Aliathra asked. In some ways, yes. But we managed to pick up the pieces and rebuild our tomorrow. As I said, it is because of those world wars that the United Federation was born from the ashes of their predecessors. You know there is a saying that sometimes something beautiful can come out of something ugly, that is how the UFAE was born. She explained. I have to confess once more that I further underestimated you other worlders. Aliathra humbled herself. I know Aliathra. I know. Samantha nodded. Just then, a ring was heard from Samantha's pocket. It was from Robert Bianchin. She picked up the phone and answered. Lieutenant my dear, how are you? You won't believe what I just did. And don't worry it's actually good. Robert Bianchin greeted. What is it? Samantha asked. I managed to get you and all the other soldiers with us on this mission to feast with Duke Thibault. He is getting impressed by all of the shit we have been doing both today and earlier, Bobby said. Oh, so, no need to pay for some tavern food? Straight from his table? Samantha asked. Yeah, you, me, Miriam, your squad and all the others. There's roast pig or I think it looks like a pig. It smells like one, Bobby said. At the background noise of that call, Samantha can discern the echoes of cheering behind her that perturbed with the corpo's voice. What am I hearing over there? What noise is all of that? Samantha asked. Oh, that's Crocker. He's just killing it with his exosuit virtually single-handedly. Hang on. He is coming back in. Remember the Duke's tent at sunset all right? Bobby reminded before hanging up. Dash Sergeant. 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 Bobby fought his way through the human flood of victorious Suvelli knights. Mr. Bianchin, I didn't expect you haul yourself here. What's happening? Crocker asked, while you were beating back those lion face warriors from some desert place I can't remember the name of. Anyways, while you were kicking their asses with reinforced fists, I have been making deals back up on the Duke's box. Bobby answered. What kind of deals? Well, outside of the ones of that bet I made drunk I have been pitching the Duke about your suit. I told him that although not magical, you would still think it did. I said that just imagine your knights duking it out and saving damsels with your gear. Bobby said. You're planning to sell exosuits to Suville? Crocker asked with exclamation. If it means he gets to like us then yes. I am trying to get into his good side after all. Bobby replied, first off, you are giving advanced technology to these natives for what? A paper saying peace be with you and me? Second you know my Hercules suit is from your rival, right? Crocker asked, okay for the suit. Yes I know it's Militech's but it doesn't matter on that end since he won't tell the difference anyway. Second, I told him I am a merchant of dot solutions when I told him about Aparo Corp and we make stuff that solves problems. 
Besides would you get mad at the guy who works for the company that practically runs 80% of every hardware store in the youth space huh? Bobby argued. Your solution could cause more problems than it could solve. Crocker argued back. Could. You said could. Keyword. Besides we in Aparo Corp have thousands of means of solving any dot anomalous deviations in our plans, besides, in same vein to Major Holyfield's Meiji restoration motif we have decided to take in our own initiative in making this planet more at home, by starting just as the Japanese Emperor did in westernization, we in Aparo will make the Gleasons go through the industrial revolution whether they want to or not. You have to admit it, deep down in your heart. This is inevitable just like all of our history, Bobby lectured. Lewis was mixed with anger and admissive humility. All of his winnings and all of his performance was all just an unwilling sales pitch to advertise a military industrial complex corporation's sales reports. His reasoning was also sound despite the lack of tact and subtlety in his words. The advanced technology the youth enjoys will spread from word of mouth heralds and messengers etc. through all of the worlds. Many would fear, others would come to examine but for sure it will be soon that all of the world knows the United Federation's name. Just be sure those knights errant folks use it for good all right? Crocker gave his only request as he wiped off the sweat of his brow and bandaged a cut on his arm from a stray spear grazing past him from the lion warriors that he had jostled earlier. He for at least the shortest while got to know these knights errant of Souville, despite their pompous demeanor with colorful armors and showmanship they are still trained soldiers beneath their dolly appearance who also were sworn to protect their homeland, who is he to judge if they dress at the same time as renaissance fair cosplayers if the people see them as essentially their local law enforcers. Speaking about all of those, I also have to issue a warning. Bobby discreetly shifted his voice lower by sitting down on the bench next to the burly cockney. What did you find out? Crocker asked. Not me but have you ever wondered where your teammates Corporal Edward Clay and that hillbilly guy with the beard is? Bobby asked. You mean a bee dyer? I assume they are just enjoying their day off. Crocker answered. That is where you are wrong. Me and a state security agent have been very observant lately about the behavior of the people around us and we have reasons to believe that they might try to harm our delegation. Bobby answered. Cut to the chase. Kf. What do I need to look out for? Crocker asked. You are at the finals now and the last opponents before you can drink that sweet victory are the elves. The state sec agent have a working theory that some or perhaps even all of the elves are working for the elven Sephiliad. They might try to expose you as a demon and they may try to use cheats to make sure they can be warned of any magical shit they might pull. I heard they can be crafty if you let them run amok on their own. See if you can spot any of them doing this. Byung Chin said. The corpo gestured his right hand with its ring finger tucked down by his thumb only leaving his pinky, middle finger and index finger raised up. It reminded Crocker of the Catholic Trinity gesture that he catches further Bishop Wave around every time he blesses anything or anyone, Dr. Malona, and yes he is involved in this and may I inform you he has been detailing a lot of things about the natives in remarkable details. But I digress, this gesture is used by elven mages to better channel their innate magic thing or whatever, I don't know other than it makes them shoot stuff from their hands more efficiently. Ask your elf princess when you see her again when this is over. I understand thank you for the warning. I will do my best with my team to fight off these elves. Crocker nodded before he got back to diagnosing any damages to his suit, but Bobby lightly slapped Crocker on his shoulder with an alarming concern. Do not give me your best. I need you to win this not for yourself and the knights errant but if you lose to those elves my credibility is off. Bobby said. Credibility. Crocker twitched up his eyebrows. He says I have been offering him the stars and he doesn't believe me until I can fully demonstrate our power to trump against all odds. I may be overdoing it but as Don Aparo would say, bless to the risk takers, for if there are none in this world, the world will still be in the stone ages. Bobby said, are you saying that if I don't win, we can kiss all we done for the duke goodbye? Crocker asked. The corpo only nodded silently confirming Crocker's fears. God fucking damn it all. Crocker sulked. 
He just wanted to have some fun and he didn't care about losing just the thrill of letting of some steam was all the pleasure he needed, but now, the stakes were bet upwards by the powers that be, win and the youth's best interest, his mandate will be pushed forward, lose and it's back to square one at best, a war against the natives at worst. Just as Crocker riddled himself in pre-fight anxiety, Bobby's phone rang. Talk to me. What? Diaz. Rioting. Where? Race. Shit. I am coming. Bobby's usually slick diplomatic demeanor turned into cold sweat as the words came from out of his phone's call. What? Was it? Crocker stood up from the bench to ask. Less asking, more doing. Above all else. Kick those elitist pricks with the Hercules suit for me and it should all be good. I need to find the dwarf Luya right now. Bobby hurried off. Meanwhile, at the elven corner in the fighting pits. The elven fighting tournament team nodded in agreement when Brenira confirmed their suspicion of the upstart exotic warrior fighting on the same side as the Suveli knight Serent. The inhuman strength and speed were unheard of any ordinary human to display. Then came Brenira and a few other of her colleagues and explained to them that the exotic warrior in the worst excuse of an armor in all of the blacksmithing and engineering design is actually the work of something far more sinister. A demon dressed to be like the shape of a human, infiltrating the empire and by default their ally and making demonic deals with the nobles to offer the power in exchange for their allegiances. Take these rings and place them either on your mage hand, do it quietly. Brenniru instructed the elven fighters. By close examination, the elves with their arcane attuned physiology could sense magic of a more fixed variety. There was a specific signal of mana resonating within these rings. What are these exactly? The team mage inquired. Rings of Radiancy, courtesy from the cult of Fida the god of virtue. Make sure you pick your time to strike when the strange warrior that the Suvial knights have is showing his demon powers in his guise. Then expose him to holy magic so we can show that they are nobody else but demons. The duke will surely see reason and back out from their demonic contract signings. Brenira said. What about the other ones? Surely that the other world he came with will make a move once we know we are onto them. The elven mage raised. Do not worry. One of my colleagues is meeting up with someone from inside the duke's court and the single grey order office in the duchy to take care of the matter. Just focus on taking down this one demon and if we need you again for more help then be ready to answer. Brenira said. The F Island team complied discreetly. They were a collection of some of the finest fencers and combat magicians in all of their nation, all assembled at Suville for one purpose, for their gods, king, and country. If the standing army and navy were the twin hands of true elven power and glee easier than the eyes, ears, and nose of the Eth Island Entendre were the Sephiliad, their institution was responsible for growing, solidifying and protecting their nation's interests across the whole world is what made the Entente, the Entente deep connections to many mercantile guilds, other civilizations and a vast amount of influence over the magical and arcane studies ensure that the elves always stay on top of what they do best ever since the time of the first demonic invasion, protecting the world from those who seek its ravishment. They all nodded and took the holy pendants of Gani the goddess of justice and wisdom, also known in the human interpretation of the pantheon to be the just Gana the goddess of the hearth. They need to be subtle with taking down this demon and worst case scenario they have to force a public exposition of this vile creature spreading its subversive lies and seductive promises to the land for all to see. And maybe then after they defeat him, all of the worlds will unite once more to send back the other worlders to whence they came. Besides, a Cephid Liad is never wrong with their deductions, aren't they? Chapter 32, Play Hards Part 2 what the hell is going on? Bobby interrogated Ken and Diaz. Nothing, Diaz said. Nothing? Are you deaf Diaz? I am hearing boos and cusses from the crowd. Look, Bobby pointed out. They were indeed jeering at Diaz for his inaction. It was already three hours into the Raz Sephile Outraz Duchy and the races except the Mustang were long off the start already hitting their first checkpoints. They were exhausting an aura of absolute disappointment after all of Vinny's boasting of his steed having the power of 700 horses. Liar. 
Is this the other world as best? Pathetic. Charlatan. All talk no might. The crowds jeered. For the earthlings on the other hand it was perhaps the laziest brunch in all of time. Diaz sat down as Bobby can observe three cups of three in one instant coffee, four eggs worth of sunny side up eggs, twelve strips of cured ham and two bundles of grapes. Kane wasn't at his usual studious self and was also sharing along the excessive ration they had. Diaz, I don't care if doing this doesn't feel rewarding and all but you are making me look bad right now. Bobby argued. Look, the race is about 12 hours long at the minimum according to what we heard. I can afford a head start. Let them have their fun. Diaz dismissed. The crowd became more restless and they began to start tossing whatever refuse they could grab towards the other worlders such as pre-masticated scraps, dirt, rocks and even a large splinter of wood. Get out of here you poltroon. One of them said. What's a poltroon? Diaz asked. It's another way of saying chicken Vinny. Ken bluntly said. Chicken? Diaz grinded his teeth at that insult. Just then one of the scraps of food, a pre-masticated piece of fruit with a fragile exterior landed on the bonnet of Diaz's Mustang. Its emerald and pulpy contents desecrated the waxy luster Diaz had worked so hard to remove the dirt stains from the time he played bait for some land sharks. My Mustang, Diaz cried. He rose from his chair and rushed towards his car towel at hand. Bobby and Kane followed behind him as Diaz frantically sterilized the fruity stains on its wake. His pride and joy that he helped build from the frame up thanks to Aparo's classical revival campaign of fitting in old but timeless car models with new technologies to adapt to the modern roads and needs of the roadster today. He got one of these models for free after spending five years of excellent services to Don Aparo and his organization. He designed everything himself from the motor specifications, the red paint with the running horse decals and even the ornamental pearly white manual. Clutch stick. Are you going to let them just do that to you and your car Vinny? Bobby challenged. Vinny was now seething with rage and internal belittlement. His sense of feeling victorious was overridden by his fear of the perception of weakness. It was an encompassing anger, that, after he finished removing the stains from his hood, he turned to Cain. Get your drone, he said. It wasn't his usual devil make care accent he was known having, but instead devoid of humor. He was being serious right now. Boss, you got a hanky? Get ready to set me off. Diaz turned to Bobby. They both nodded. Ken ran back to his computer set up behind the stables and readied his drone's engines. Meanwhile Robert Bianchin walked towards the raucous causing crowd and put on his most poised stance. He was honestly scared that he might get his clothes violated by whatever the onlookers could throw at him but he needed to salvage this for his paycheck's sake. Ladies and gentlemen, people of Gleesia of all races, colors and creeds, the Aparo Corporation, which means a really big merchant guild would like to apologize for the dot technical difficulties you have seen, Bobby addressed the crowd. The crowd was still jeering at him but thankfully nothing was being thrown at him at the moment so the Aparo Corpo have to wrap this up fast before it gets worse. As my associate Vincent Diaz has said that yes, his steed has the power of 700 horses and he would gladly show you how we, the United Federation of Earth have the best horses in all of Gleesia, the pinnacle of earthling technology. Observe, Bobby said. He walked back to the car where Diaz had just finished starting up the engines of his Mustang alongside Cairn's little Recon drone hovering above him. Bobby pulled out his hanky and looked towards Diaz. Dare runner pulled down all of the windows of his car before he turned on the music player of his car via a Bluetooth function to his smartphone's collection of music fondly dubbed epic racing tunes. He then turned to Bobby and gave him a smile with a thumbs up. Diaz is ready. Time to end these horses whole career, he said as he grasped the Mustang's steering wheel tightly. Ready. Bobby began to count down. The Mustang began to roar to life as the jeering crowd became silenced as they held their breath. Get set, Bobby continued. Loud musics began to play from Diaz's Mustang, to the astonishment of the crowds. They didn't know that his steed can also sing and play music. Specifically what they could discern the sound of a lute and a drum. Go. 
Bobby swiped down his handkerchief with a great burst of zero to sixty agility, the Mustang launched off creating a choking cloud of dust that impaired the eyes and expelled the air out of several of the people's lungs out. As the dust clear, they saw the lazy steed was no longer sitting idly before the finishing line but instead was galloping at what the natives saw at an incalculable speed. By the gods no horse can run that fast. One of them said. For Diaz however, the top speed of his Mustang being a 150 miles per hour whilst the entire race distance was over 160 miles in total. The map is an entire encircling of the duchy's land across hills, fields and a few forested areas, terrain that Diaz is familiar in navigating efficiently in for all of his time smuggling high-value contraband with his Mustang. The only challenge is to not accidentally run over any of the poor sods who raced with their mortal mounts for pragmatic and aesthetic reasons. Although he did want to take a photo of that elf knight's big butt before he made them bite his dust. Okay Diaz, you got some stragglers right now slow it down a bit. Cairn warned. Three horses Diaz saw walking I idly by. Perhaps they were conserving their energy or they got of the wrong footing as the dare runner thinks. After he sped past them three horses and their riders were toppled over not out of any physical force but in terror over the roar of Diaz's engines. Well. It's only illegal if you touch them. Ken remarked. As Diaz sped through the racetrack. Words began to spread around the festive latentes of the strange horse that glided through the earth with the speed of the birds, the grace of a dancing nymph and the endurance of a minotaur. Whenever Diaz passed by a checkpoint, the race officials didn't have the time to blink once before Diaz sped through. Within no time, the farming fields and rolling hills transitioned to the hard rock of the crudely paved hill passes of Souville that separates the duchy from the wilds east of them. To most horses this was the most difficult part of the race and several horse feeders were on standby near the checkpoints providing hay and water for the rest of the journey. When Diaz passed by one, in a haughty display of his skill, he would drift around them in a circle his engines and wheels roaring loudly terrifying the horses and their riders. I ain't slow. I just really need my breakfast. Diaz teased. Impossible? No steed can run that fast without magic. A race official commented. Are you sure he is not under the effects of the spell long strider? One of the riders asked. Absolutely no trace. The race official alarmingly said. The riders seeing the threat to their racing positions ran back to their steeds and gid yapped. Hey watch out for the descent Diaz, slow it down. Cairn said. Perhaps the most dangerous part of the race as Diaz can attest is the descent down the mountain through a winding path. There were no safety rails and if the fall wouldn't kill someone physically, the prospect of being overtaken by a more alpine footed steed would kill any chances of getting the victory. There were a few people who were now winding down the snake-like pass as carefully as they could but for Diaz this was another display of his driving skills. He shifted to lower gear, then floored the brakes and prepared to make several hard turns. The resulting friction of his tailor made and grooved tires made him glide effortlessly on every turn gracefully with cutthroat split timing. Just like New Torino. Diaz smiled. Wow, that's actually pretty impressive. But I am still not letting you drive a land cruiser again. Ken radioed. After descending down to the mountain pass Diaz was now behind the top leaders of the race and lo and behold, he saw Riand with Egda horse in its immaculate silver skin. You, how did you get here so quickly? The elf knight angrily asked. I smuggle shit like your ass for years. Diaz answered. His Mustang began to meet the same speed as the elven horse not out of any mechanical error but out of a spiteful display of haughty behavior by Diaz. The corpo pulled out the camera of his smartphone and began to record the elven rider. You got a great thick butt by the way. It's going on Instagram and you ain't stopping my Mustang for shit. Diaz cracked a smile before speeding off. Oh no you don't. The elven rider said as she raised her hand in gesture. It was signal for Cephiliad agent Waltorin to activate the trap, a runic trap, designed specifically for demons and the monsters. It had to be made quickly for the silver and powdered mana crystal compound that is the component for such a spell take a while to actually form a rune large enough for something the size of the Mustang to make. 
It was also quite expensive to have such a compound to begin with thanks to the aforementioned materials being hard to come by. Take this demon scum, Walt Orin cursed before running away to hide, but as Diaz sped past the rune, the delay between activation and detonation was milliseconds too long for the blast to even touch Mustang. Never mind that holy magic too much their foolish chagrin won't affect them anyway. Whoa. Diaz looked back from behind him to see the magic. Did you see that? Added Vinny. Oh yeah, you should be in the lead now and the rest of the run is just some straight passes and a few turns around the farms before returning to New Souville. Kane said. Good. Get yourself over there if I were you. You're gonna see Gli Easy's first car meet. Diaz smiled as he sped off. The forests below the mountains now transitioned again to the farming fields of Souville's rich bread and wine culture. Diaz can also see the favors and decor of the Courchiad festival again. He had to take care of slowing down to make the racing officials record his passing so he can still remain within the bounds of the rules. He even made sure to emphasize his car's non-magical nature of his steed to hammer down the fact that he is indeed not cheating. At least via magical aids. To the natives, the sight of his steed was terrifying and awe-inspiring to behold, its roar complemented by the way its wheeled feet passed through the dirt like the gust of air it leaves on its wake. Within no time, he had cleared 28 out of the 29 checkpoints he needed to pass before the home stretch. As Diaz made it around the corner leading to the Duke's palace, he was astonished to see that the road that was meant to be opened is being used as pedestrian way for festival onlookers, the race official in charge of the last checkpoint between him and victory. It was the last turn before it is a beeline from the finish line as Diaz remembered in the map. Diaz, watch out, the road. Ken suddenly roared on his radio. Shit. Diaz gust as he blared his horn and slammed his brakes. The people seeing the runaway horse charging at them began to scramble away with a shocked race official nearly losing his balance. Diaz had to sway the weight of his car back and forth to maintain the slowing speed while also his momentum. As he the skin of his car's teeth met the corner, Diaz turned to his left as hard as he could, drifting perfectly by the pedestrians who were in awe by the horse's vigor and ultimately unharmed. Dude. P.L.S. Tell me you saw that. Diaz said. I saw that too. Damn that was close. Ken said. Did you get that on picture? That's what some people call the Tokyo Drift. Diaz smiled. He sped off, now seeing the fairy tale spires that adorned the Duke's palace, passing through the gate and cutting through the finish line where the workers were still trying to attach the finish ribbon onto the posts. After the confusion of the loud roar and the torrent of wind passed by, to the absolute shock of both the guards, the attendees, the Sovali noble court and a few foreign dignitaries, they saw Diaz and his steed the Mustang standing in front of them. Its engines were like the exhaustive panting of breath, as Diaz turned off the engine of his car and walked out from the driver's seat and slid his body by the hood and windshield and lay down his body lazily behind his hands. What is this? The herald of the games emerged. I finished your race in under an hour. Diaz smiled. Impossible. No horse can run that fast. You must be cheating. The herald disputed. I don't think so. I checked his steed and there are no traces of magic in any inch of its body. A mage argued. He also made it pass through all the checkpoints. The judges there sent out their tweeter bird messages to me just this instant. Huffed another racing official. The Herald couldn't believe, even the onlookers too. This horse tore through one of the most prestigious horse racing events in all of Gleesia like if it wasn't anything. The exasperated look on his colleagues, men he trusted for decades saying the exact same words made the Herald realize that they speak the truth. The winner of their Raz Sefi Lautras Duchy is. Wait, I never got your name. The Herald was about to announce but inquired Diaz. To his fairness, he was a last-minute addition. Vincent Diaz but you can call me Dare Runner and this steed is called a Ford Mustang one of the fastest horses where I come from. Diaz smiled. Several light-footed and soft-faced maidens in flower crowns walked up to Diaz and gave Diaz a victor's laurels for both him and his steed. They wore nothing else but the virgin white robes that were draped over their skin. Your boon my lord, they said in unison. 
Hang on, wait let me take a selfie for the boys back home. Diaz smiled as he grabbed his phone and took a selfie photo with it. No. Shit. My car is dirty. I need it cleaned. Diaz turned around. Only the finest waters for your noble steed are brave sir. One of the flowery maidens said. He can see the young women grab their sponges as they began to scrub the dirt-stained surface of the Mustang. The color at the water was golden, and there was sparkly look on its surface alongside a fermented fruity scent as Diaz caught on his sense. Are you bathing my Mustang? In wine? Diaz asked. Indeed a brave champion. It is tradition that the winner's horse be bathed in the finest Targrosa wine in all of the land. You are also given a several bottles of Targrosa for your own drinking pleasure, the maiden said. She handed him with a lithe grace a basket filled with golden colored grapes and the Targrosa wine bottles of at least six quantities. The girls smiled and bowed before the corpo as they began to pamper Diaz's Mustang with buckets filled of the wine. You are quite handsome as we all do say so ourselves. The maiden giggled alongside the others. Diaz. You did it. Ken smiled as he ran towards Diaz alongside Mr. Byongchen. Oh. You got some of that wine too. That's a regional specialty but it's basically champagne. Bobby added. Champagne eh? Diaz turned back to the congratulatory maiden. How much is this bottle worth? Every bottle of Targrosa is worth a thousand ducats my lord. It is an honor to even just hold one bottle let alone drink from it as per tradition in Souville. She replied. Perfect. This is how we do it back at Earth. Diaz smiled coyly as he popped open the bottle, placed his thumb on the opened neck of the fantastic champagne and began to shake it. Don't do that, it will exp. The maiden tried to warn Diaz, but Diaz immediately let go of his thumb forcefully ejecting the carbonated contents up in the air. Gravity did the rest of the job as it rained down to the ground. Most of the wine landed on the victory maidens whose white robes became damp then translucent before clinging tightly on the maidens' bodily features. You are quite a feisty prince, aren't you? The maiden commented. Hey, this actually work and I worked hard and I play hard and now think fast. Diaz flirted as he grabbed a bucket of wine and began to splash the victory maiden in its auric juices. Oh, Diaz always a charmer you are. I ain't letting you outshine me. Bobby smiled and grabbed another bucket of wine and splashed Diaz with it in kind. That's a lot of money you are burning there. Let me join. Ken said as he joined in the fun. For the rest of the afternoon, Diaz, Bobby and Ken held the easiest first car meet and wet t-shirt or robe contest. There was laughter, music and a few carefully placed words by Bobby and some help with Ken that molded the hearts and the minds of the natives to the youth and their way of life and what they wished to be able to do more here in Gleesia. It was a most unexpected type of party but thanks to some hosting skills by Robert Byongchin. They managed to integrate such a celebration for the Quashad. Even the Herald of the Games wished to add such the blatant disregarding act of Targrosa popping to be a new tradition for victors of future Raz Sefile Outras Duchy. When the rest of the contestants made it to the finish line, they were in awe by the deceptive power the Mustang had compared to their steeds. Many names were given to the youth such as the Bardock horse when they heard the music emitting out of the Mustang's car. Then there was the Merchant of Kings for Bobby, the Shadowy Man for Cain and Sun Nymphs getting wet for the aforementioned wet robe contest that Diaz created, but most especially from the enraged loss of words by a Dewey Eerie and calling Diaz a Hothraig or a Speed Demon before storming of back to the Elven Embassy. Too bad for Diaz. He took it as a compliment. Dash. I am telling you there might be something not right about those elves. Crockett tried again to warn his team captain of his suspicions. That is because they are magically attuned. Green blood. Our mage will be mostly locked out for this one until we can get theirs first. We just need to wait for an opening then push. Elves are fragile when it comes to sheer brute force. The captain said. Sir. I don't think the plan of running around their fighters to attack the elven mage will work. I suggest we try draw so, Crockett tried to argue but he was shushed by the captain. I am the leader of this band and you have to do what I say, the duke told me. Now get out there and make me that shield wall. 
the captain ordered. Crocker reluctantly had to follow him. Deep down he knows that there might be something horribly wrong with these elves but he needs to keep his toes in check. If worst case scenario comes, he will have Obedia and Clay to back him up, wherever they may be in the crowd. He just needs to get through this final challenge and he can at last take a much deserved round of beer. He rendezvous with his teammates and form the center of the mobile shield wall that united all of the knight's errant combined weight with his own. Crocker peeked through the gaps of the shield wall to get a better look on the elves. He saw them across the field standing stoically with their great swords, bows and spears. Their gear was light with leather-like coverings of hardened yet flexible tree bark covering their bodies with the armor being present at their forearms, chests, helmets and legs. They were like statues or a football's defensive wall standing side by side to each other staring at the approaching adversaries before them. What's interesting about these Athylan elves is that only the spearmen wielded enlarged kite shields whilst the rest had no other means of protection outside of their tree armor. Let the battle begin and may the best team win, the herald announced as he blew his horn commencing the tourney's finals. The Suveli knights slowly pushed forward immediately to pressure the central core of the elven formation whilst the archers winged around their flanks looking to exploit any openings that the elves might have in order to goad them to direct their ire at them. As for the mage on Crocker's team he is preparing to cast some sort of ritual-like spell behind him and it was the priority that he is to be protected as long as possible before the real fight can begin. Looking forwards. Crocker see that the elves were now on the move, changing their formation. In response to the flanking fire of the Suvali archers, the shield-bearing spearmen with lightning discipline formed a protective embrasure with their shields with the gaps where the elven archers can continue to fire unbinded while enjoying the protection of cover. This did decrease the frontal center of the elves leaving only the great swords behind. At first, they continued to stand idly staring down at the Suveli causing Crocker to be unnerved. Something is not right. Crocker told his teammates. They are going to start spinning. One of the knights said beside him. Spinning? Crocker questioned. Hi. One of the elves holding the great swords beckoned. He and five other fellow great swords wielders gripped their swords and stepped forward with their left foot. Then with lethal grace began to swing their blades vertically with machine-like efficiency. For Crocker it was similar to the way a wood shipper's blades awaiting the logs to be shredded to pieces. And they were inching closer towards it. Now, split, ordered the captain. The shield wall disbanded, liquefying the formation with the Suveli mage. With his spell prepared casting his hand to the ground causing the land beneath the elves' feet to be liquefied. It was some sort of spell that Crocker can discern that riles the ground to be turned into quicksand. The elves were caught by the impeding terrain halting their slow advance yet their blades were continuing to spin. Now archers! The captain roared. The archers redirected their fire at the vulnerable elves hailing a torrent of arrows down on the elves. But as they fell on the ground in barrage after barrage, Crocker spotted something suspicious about the elves. Their faces remained stoic despite the stressful ordeal for a start. Shouldn't they be panicking or at the very least alarmed by all of the arrows raining down on them? He examined closer and realized that despite the heavy rainfall of arrows, not a single arrow became stuck to the elves' armor, but instead somehow phased through them. It was an illusion. Hi. A voice roared behind them. The elves on the quicksand dissipated before it was revealed that the elven great swords were in fact invisible for the entire time until now. They had been anticipating that the knights errants would scramble to avoid the superior technique of their little Thule Magal or Whirlwind Blade formation, as their great swords can effortlessly hack through their tournament regulated shields. It's a trick, the captain warned before he was knocked down to the ground by one of the elves. The other great swordsmen wasted no time capitalizing on the shock. They swung their blades at the rhythm of the whistling winds as they cut down the exposed knights errant of Suvil effortlessly. The team's archer and mage too fared no better when the blunted arrows knocked them into the ground and thus kicking them out for the rest of the fight. And thus, all that was left of the Suveli team was Crocker who managed to slip away during the commotion. Oh me, oh my, that must have been painful, like a thorn to the heart, only more painful. 
The Herald commented with his rhymes. If this were a real battle it would have been a massacre of the highest degree, though Crocker did have to give where credit is due to these elves. Aliathra was indeed correct of how disciplined and how executive their battle prowess and tactics were. Get the demon. One of the elves yelled pointing at Crocker. Demon, do me. What are you talking about? Crocker denied. How dare you kidnap the princess and try to seduce both Prince Clovich and Duke Thibault. You will not defile our lands any longer. Prepare to be vanquished. One of the elves said. To his dismay the elves began to surround him with their weapons aimed at him. This was no longer a friendly competition of who had the best warriors. This was now the most dangerous game. Suddenly their weapons began to ignite in a bright white glow. So brilliant in its luminescence that Crocker's eyes were forced to shed a few arduous tears in bodily instinct. It would have been blinding if it weren't for his full-faced helmet designed to absorb flashbang-like lights. The elves were about to cast their holy magic at him as they tensed their weapons back readying to fire their magic using their swords as a focus point. Crocker got to his feet and thought his next move fast. He has to get away from this encirclement. Bending his knee points of his exosuit, Crocker leapt upwards the moment the elves fired their spells by slashing away the magic with their great swords. The spells instead of striking their intended target was instead striking down their fellow elves who were knocked down by the sheer magical force of the blasts of holy magics. Hey, what are you doing? Is that holy magic you are using? One of the officials protested. Crocker landed several feet away now no longer surrounded but still clearly outnumbered 15 to 1. The elves stood back up from the ground. Their immaculate robes of silk stained with dirty and they gritted their teeth on how this other world slighted them. You are supposed to stay down. Stay down. The tourney official cried. You are dis. H-M-M-M-P-H-H. The official tried to use his authority at the elves' brazen display of non-compliance to the rules only for a magical bolt to shoot him at the mouth silencing him. People of Suville, You are being deceived. The warrior you see before you are not what you think he is. It is a monster disguised to look like one of us. Ada, Ak. The elf tried to proclaim his intentions only for his jaw to meet the thousands strong force of Crocker's exosuit arm. You talk too much. Crocker grinned. The elves recomposed themselves as they tense their stances to fight this absolute beast of a monster who claims he is human. Monster? He doesn't have any magical proper. Ah another judge protested but he too was silenced by the magical bolt that blocked their mouths from expelling words. More of the elves began to conjure up magic from their hands, all while their fingers were tucked in various of poses in the shape of magical runes that emerged from their hands ready to burst out. Hey, no fair. You are all cheating. The crowd jeered at the elves. Some of the elves tried to explain to the attendees of the dire situation they are in but to no avail. The mob's anger was too heavy that the elves' warnings were drowned by the crowd's scornful distaste. The rest began to fire away all sorts of magical projectiles at Crocker from fireballs, ice shards and lightning bolts. You want a monster huh? Well since you asked me, I will show you what this monster can do. Crocker spat. The big burly half mary man reached into a keypad on his left arm which gave an overlay of his suit's functionality. He scrolled through the menus until he reached one such button appropriate for such a dire occasion. Overdrive performance. The button had big yellow warning outlines around it foreshadowing the dangerous nature of this mode. Without hesitation, Crocker pressed the button as he felt the energy core within his powered suit detonated to life. He felt the forelimbs of the Hercules MK. 4 surge with enhanced electrical power. His stiff robotic movements became much more fluid in flexibility without the sacrifice of thousands of newtons worth of force. Come on, come all, I'll take all of you I feared pompous pricks. Crocker roared as he charged towards the elves. He clenched his fists as the enhanced mechanisms of his suit readies itself. He dashed hastily forward towards the elves his enormous size contrasting with his ferocious speed. Those caught in his way soon learned that corporeally, that it was futile to block, weave, parry for his combined force was just simply beyond any doubt in the elves' mind, always faster.
To them it was like fighting against a great tidal bore. Crocker would be punched one elite elven warrior so hard that it would crack whatever armor he was wearing to mangled shrapnel in addition to the sheer force sending him flying off across the arena or violently colliding with the walls below of spectator stands. Nobody in the arena couldn't believe what they were seeing. The Ogre Breaker was no tall tale myth. It was every degree of tangible reality that this man in the strange armor could tear apart one of Gleesia's greatest warriors like if it was nothing. Every punch, kick and vigorous grapple could be felt in all senses by the crowd held pensively captive by the passionate sight before them. Many didn't bother to run away from this battle as many wanted to see how this all ended. It was a landslide offensive for Crocker as one by one he took down the elves knocking the out cold to the floor, their bodies crushed beneath the thousands of newtons of force the Hercules suit dished out. Before long, there were only two elven assailants left amongst the initial fifteen warriors who stepped inside the arena, the rest of their compatriots laying on the ground inert with only anguish and despondency on how they were so easily humbled they were before Crocker. Hey get up, get up, Crocker urged one of his knocked out teammates who only lay down on the ground both in compliance to the rules and in terror. What are you doing? The knight errant asked. Just get everyone out of here, they are here for me, Crocker said. You will be purged demon. Halloween the elf mage cried. His hands began to charge a brilliant hue of red-yellow light from within him. All the power and prayers he could muster converged to him. He would destroy this demon once and for all or die trying. Yet Crocker again was even more angered at these elves' hubris. He pushed the Suveli knight away, non-verbally urging to run away with the rest of his bewildered teammates. He turned to the elven mage and a sinister deduction came to his head. If the elves need to make fancy poses with their hands fingers to cast their spells then perhaps, he can disrupt there as his studies with Aliathra and Iris would say. A mage's DUI by physically disharmonizing said tapping of magical portents. With the Hercules suit's amplified agility Crocker grasped the elf's hands, his large hand easily eclipsing the combined size of the elven mages, and with fiendish enmity he crushed them both like a shattered fruit with pulp and bone ejecting out of the elf's hands. He screamed in intense pain as the magic in his hands began to pile up dangerously cascading into an unstable ball of energy. Quickly, Crocker with his superior strength pushed away the elf before his body was fully engulfed in magical energy. Like pulling the grenade pin off of the other man's pocket, the elf mage exploded in radiant flames killing him instantly. You, a feminine yet martial voice boomed behind Crocker. Another elf. This time a woman wielding a spear pointing glaringly at the exosuit soldier. I am Brenira the Singing Blade, Inquisitor of the Great Radiant Tower. You have committed crimes against the people of the light and the land in which they inhabited on with your disgusting monstrosities. Brenner boastfully indicted. What are you talking about? Crocker questioned. You arrived here and started to corrupt the land with your metal cities and seducing the sovereign prince of Tyrian and the princess Alia through Ether to your tunes corrupting them with your promises of power and grandeur for the price of their souls. You devour the land with your great beasts feeding the life out of the soil and leaving nothing but ash and rock in their wake. Brenny justified. No. No. You are wrong. All of you are wrong. We are being set up. This thing? Us being demons? That is, Crocker defended himself and the colony. Lies. All lies. All bone will never return while the Alliance still breathes. Brenny shot him down. For your crime of simply daring to return spawn of all bone. I shall vanquish you off the face of the world. Brenny roared as she charges towards Crocker, her spear point facing towards him. Crocker weaved past Brenny barely at the nick of time, his exhaustion from both the overclocking and extraordinary output of his mind and body starting to wear on him. He needed to end this fight fast. Brenny spear had a large spear point as Crocker could scantily observe. The way the blade was designed made it ideal for both slashing sideways for a cut as it was thrusting forward for a stab. In essence it was essentially a short sword with a rather elegant finish on an elongated pole worthy to be wielded by a hackneyed, 
world-spanning and boastfully leading high elven civilization that all imaginations could conjure when they hear about what they think of when they hear those words. Gilded in gold, fashioned in a blue felt-handled pole with an elegant blade to match, the elf walloped with her polium with a barrage of strikes that Crocker barely managed to hold on with the protective armor of his suit's mechanical arms. Thanks to his hobby of boxing with a few occasional fights that were not friendly spars, Croc maintained his defenses but he was already starting to feel the elf's attack wearing him down. Take this, Brenira shouted as she swoops down her spear, this time at another angle. The spear tip slashed an exposed part of Croc's soft flesh drawing blood. Damn you elf bitch, Croc let his rage get the better of him. He launched a wild haymaker punch towards the elf but the female warrior was expecting of this. She was trying to rile up the demon before her to make him on edge so he could make the mistake of foregoing his defenses. Her spear tip parried Crocker's wild punch before, with the grace worth decades of consistent refinement of skill. She pushed Crocker away from her with a blunt ball point of the other side of her spear giving her the distance she needs with her superior reach. A flawed technique, Brenira derided. Lewis recoiled at the shock, the pommel strike causing his helmet to ring troublesomely in a daze. He could almost not hear the ringing of his helmet's built in radio. Crocker, I saw everything. We are coming for you. ETA 120 seconds. The voice of Edward Clay trumpeted. Is about foo king time. Crocker spat. He regained his focus quick enough to see that the elf actuating her arms back with her spear for a mighty thrust. Crocker strafe right. The spear missing its mark by a mere inch before he grappled the polium's handle with his left hand and elbowing the elven warrior with his right to stun her. Her hands promptly loosened its grip giving Crocker the opportunity to yank the spear out of her lithe hands before shoving her back with a swift knee to her abdomen. Now holding the spear, Crocker bitterly snapped it in two like a twig with the fulcrum of his armored knee. Stop this before more people get hurt. We don't have to fight. Crocker pleaded to the elf's desire to protect. Don't raise your charlatan voice of mercy with me demon. To think you can seduce Prince Clovich and Princess Aliathra. Brenny Rowapund. She pulled out her sword and readied herself for a more up-close and personal expulsion of otherworldly invaders. I am surprised you can think at all. Crocker miffed. In guard, Brenira rallied as she swung her blades rapidly at the youth soldier. Raising his guard, Crocker blocked the slashes of Brenira's elven sword. The mythical elven steel colliding with years upon years of Earth's greatest feats of engineering. It was a battle of the fantastic against the architectural. And Crocker was slowly running out of time. Suit battery is at critical capacity. The Hercules MK. Fours you I warned. He and also his trusty suit was about to lose steam. We are here. Breaching. Clay radioed on his helmet. Bright flashes erupted from the ground blinding everyone in the arena. Luckily for Crocker his helmet again negated the effects of the youth's flashbangs. The cavalry arrived just in time as hordes of both youth soldiers and a pyro corp PMCs descended upon the arena grounds. Jumping over the railings they were rushing towards the downed delven warriors and one mage's seared corpse arresting the injured but still very much alive elven warriors whose hands were restrained by the nylon flexicuffs the reinforcements bore on them. The warriors could only succumb to the defeat and disgrace of being captured alive for their enervated bodies could do little to no amount of resistance as the grungy demons restrained their hands and gathered them up. No, my people, Brenira despaired. Her stance evaporated on the sight of everything falling apart in the worst possible way for a soldier, a spine servant of the Astilbian throne could be. What? Are you? She looked despondently at Crocker. With one last half of his now depleted exosuit's power, Crocker stomped the ground intimidatingly as he rested his arms around his waists. The ground quaked as the earth broke apart on the suit's heavy shock wave. Exosuit battery fully depleted. Engaging safety protocol number three, releasing bindings, the UI announced. As it said, the bindings that tied Crocker's body to his exosuit were released causing Crocker, due to his exhaustion to nearly fall forward where it is not for a quick reflex of his sore feet catching his body. 
The elven warrior stood there unresponsively as Crocker, with what little energy he had left walked up to her and delivered one final haymaker punch to her head knocking her out. Victorious but tired, Crocker could only go on to his knees on the sandy ground panting and sweating with sores all over his muscles, near his side. He noticed and caught his eyes the broken spear tip that Brennero had on her polium before he snapped it off. He grabbed the spear point and held it tight on his hand as a keepsake, a little souvenir for this tour of duty. He was for all intents and purposes, proud of himself. It looks like that playful hobby of boxing paid off after all. He could only leave a smile as Clay and a bee die rushed towards him. Crocker, are you alright? Clay asked. Where the fuck was you when I needed you minutes ago? Crocker asked. I wasn't expecting the entire Elven Tourney team to be trying to kill you. I had to get help. Besides, a bee dyer was there covering you the whole time from the Jukul box. But he couldn't get a good shot in. Clay answered. Those elves were fast if I say so myself. A bee dyer said. You should have taken the shot. Crocker reprimanded. Immediately, a native healer with an official Korshiad uniform and a U-field medic arrived on the scene and assessed Crocker's injuries. So, am I still good? Crocker asked both of them, flesh wounds. They will heal. The field medic answered as he wrapped a bandage around the few cuts on Crocker's flesh. Every time however the medic touched his body, Crocker winced. Your muscles have overexerted themselves due intense fighting. The healer added as she soothed Crocker's wounds with her magics. But will it heal? Crocker asked. You will need to be spoon fed for a few days. The healer answered meekly, bollocks, Crocker cursed, dash 10 broken beyond repair training dummies, 4 smashed windows, 2 occasions of the same wall being demolished and a singed magical instructor were the casualties of Faith Lens training in the College of Magi. To say he was prodigy in the magical arts would be a little to a description of a person of extraordinary ability. Faith Len whenever he was taught a new spell would always get the spell right at the first or second time, he attempted them, from the humble yet serviceable spell of producing a flame to light a campfire, conjuring a mage hand to pick up an object from a distance to a simple warding spell, the young chosen one always delivered to the wonderment of his instructors. But when it came to the more complex or outright dangerous spells however, those beams of all became low jittering stress thanks to the aforementioned casualties of damage to the college's property and one staff. Focus boy. You need to learn how to control your gift. Carlyle lectured. I can't help it Miss Silverdane. It's just that with these marvelous spells I can finally do incredible things. Like when can I go fight a dragon? Or search for lost relics. By the gods. When will we go to Terian and take the fight to those demons? I mean, that's why I got the mark of the bane right? From the crystal? Faith Len said. He proudly bore that mark he was painfully inscribed upon his head that signify his status as a chosen one. The brand mark was shaped like a teardrop that formed around the actual script of the ancient word of anathema being Gweninija. At first it was an honor for the college to accept a crystal chosen, but the more that Faith lends Sally through his lessons while boastfully telling all of his fellow students whom he sat in with in class and also the professors themselves, the more that people were reluctant to be anywhere near him, his status or not, the Grey Order had to separate him from the entire student body for private lessons to not risk an incident. That is Methro again Faith Len. Remember your titles of respect. Carlyle reminded him. Aware of pride child. You are still young and have yet to know the perils of the world. You do not know what it is like to see the darkness of this world. Look, I am the chosen one here. My destiny is to go out there and fighting those demons in glorious battle not staying here and waste time with your lecture and needless training. If you let me out there. I can vanquish the demons. Faith Len begged incessantly. I had the misfortune of so many before you with that attitude to die in within their first year as a guildsman. Carlyle protested. Maybe he is right in some aspects. Mita's voice interrupted Faith Len's buzzes. She stood before them. Not in her usual roguish leathers but in a simple clothed shirt and pants. Her skin was exposed leaving little to the imagination of her figure and also several scars obtained from a few. 
Lucky hits on her flesh. Fresh out of her tiring journey from Tyrian and now back at the Sanctuary of Herring Point once again to relay all of what she had found. Meter, you are back. How was Tyrian? I heard you had failed. Kalia asked. Tyrian? The crossroad city. Where the demons took over. What was it like? Were the demons eating people? Building their armies? Summoning more of their accursed brain through their vile vessels and obscene rituals? Faith Len badgered. He had dropped his draining sword and shield onto the floor as he skipped towards the Crow leader with his fawning infatuation on the harangking Grey Order member. None much that I had seen of from my short time there, from the looks of it. Their takeover was surprisingly placid since none of the walls that the citadel is famous for was destroyed. Meter answered, maybe that prince let them in. He would be known in the history books for generations as the arch-traitor. I can see it now with the scribes already. Faith Len vowed, so Meter, how did you and your crows manage to get out of that demon stronghold alive? Did you use smoke bombs? Some assault atop the city roofs. Sliced up a few of them? The boy asked. Mita's face turned aside much to her chagrin. The more that the boy talked about her crows the more of the anguish of being forced to leave her crows. The people she had personally trained them from neophyte to adepts, behind to fates worse than death. She remembered the sacrifices they had made to ensure that at least one of them could make it out of that damned city alive, and that one was Mita. It was not supposed to be the master who became like a parent to the other crows to bury her denotative children without a body to give the proper blessings off. She had to personally light a lone candle for every crow that didn't make it. The child's naive provocation of what she was forced for her own pride and her reputation to endure was absolutely tasteless despite the fact that the boy, chosen one or not, is likely not heard the grim news. She almost wanted to quietly walk away at this moment and her checking up on her colleague and this promising young lad was a mistake. Carlia, realizing the Crow Master's bereft cues, grabbed Faith Len's shoulder. The Crow Master normally only talk what she needs to be said child, Carlia said, her stiff grasp of the Chosen One's shoulder barring him from his restless inquests. Yes, what needs to be said? I can say with confidence that the demons will only get stronger as time passes further and we must not delay. However, I am afraid this boy is not ready yet for the journey ahead, Mita said. Oh, you're just like Lady Silverdane, saying I am not ready. Faith Len mocked Mita's dainty voice. Both the High Mage and the Crow were disgusted at his arrogance. The power within him also grew his ego, too. The two women composed themselves. They need to continue. The child will learn through time. You are not ready in the sense that you need a blade worthy of your power, Mita continued. You mean can rifle? We are going to look for King Caldell's tomb? Faith Len asked. I thought it was lost forever, perhaps, but I don't think chasing some tacky rumor from a crazed hermit would produce anything of value. I mean he told me that the place where he pointed at where he says where he thinks the tomb is that the villagers are all dot not right in the head before they chased him off, Mita said, I had my fair share of insane hermits telling the wildest things only to find out that they are actually speaking something true, besides, in my experience all rumors have a seed of truth written somewhere. Maybe we should just investigate this man's claims, Carlia argued crossing her arms questioningly. Perhaps, but I would rather go through a task that is much more certain such as getting the chosen one here his own blade, Mita said. My own blade? The boy muttered. Faith Len stopped and looked at the crow dumbfounded for a moment, only to come to the realization of what she meant when she says that he needed a blade worthy for him. He was going to get a weapon. His own sword of fabled quality. A blade made out of act coolite. I am going to get. My own sword? That is magnificent. Wait. I need to think of a name first. Demon Destroyer? Light of the Gods? Sword of the Saints? Who would be the blacksmith though? Will I be able to choose how the blade will be shaped? I always wanted to hold an elven curved sword, but also wanted to have a very eastern styled crossguard too with snake emblems. Can I? Can I? Can I? The boy pestered. Hold on first child, those can be arranged but there's just a problem. The act coolite themselves. The dwarves have it and we need to get the ingots ourselves. Mito informed. From here to the Estelrooks. 
that's going to be a long journey for us, but also, the mountains themselves, I heard they are scary. Faith Len shuddered, don't worry, Findrum's voice introduced itself. He walked into the room alongside Petra Rukdorf and a few knights. I know my way around the Astrox like the back of my hand. Our destination is my clan hold of Tyler, home of the greatest forge in all of Sainagred that can rival those elven pansies in Aiagrath. Sipag's breath, also known as the forge by the volcano. That's where I got my two lucky axes here. I can't wait for you to meet the smiths there and my niece who works as a tavern maid. She would love to see you and of course her uncle again. Findrim said, you still need to be able to lift your own weight around and just sitting here practicing your fireballs to your sword stances can only do you so much, but the best teacher is experience out there in the world. So, every time we stop by a city or town with a grey order office, you should take a quest that is local to that area. You will need to warm up for the real fight ahead. Undead, vampires and bandits most likely and the occasional roaming monsters is what we should expect. But you need to be ready for whatever deeds that Gleesia will require of you so let's get your hand dirty. The more you sweat now will be the more you will bleed in battle and we need you to be ready when we go to the Astrox and wherever from there. Petra said, what do you mean? We, are you saying? Faith Len widened his eyes on the realization. Yes, I Petra the faithful Regdorf, with Findrim the monster slayer, Carlia Silverdane and Mita the crow master will accompany Faith Len their bane Garm Haik, the chosen one of the crystal heart on his journey. Petra said with formal honorifics finished with a polite bow. In addition, the king has also has given you a substantial sum of ducats to invest on your journey a retinue of knights and legionnaires for some grunt work, guildsmen for the more special times and mages for everything magic related of course, you will meet them later however when we get set off by the emperor in a few days. Findrim said, alongside them we will have a caravan's worth of traveling gear for all us on our journey that will follow us to the heart of darkness of where gates of Tyrian itself lay on, we will need to wait for now since the Empire is hard at work gathering everything and everyone we need for our journey. Petra added, I can't believe it. Faith Len jumped for joy. He was going on an epic quest to save the world with some of the Grey Order's finest heroes. He remembered the stories of the hero's journey with his companions, camping together, singing together and fighting together they all did as they fulfilled their goal of saving the world they loved from destruction. With the best possible companions at his side, a fully stocked caravan of all the things you can ask for a long hauling journey and of course once he gets his own legendary act Kulite Sword, Faith Len Garmhaik will be able to fulfill his destiny as the bane at which all the other worldly demons who dared return when they were once banished. They will curse his name while the bards will sing in praise to him. Faith Len Gweninija Garmhaik, Hero of Gleesia, Dash. Echoes of Laughter, Merriment dining and drinking alongside the melodies of romantic bards plucking, pulsating and whistling their instruments away in the night at Duke Thibault's tent. A private affair was being commenced, a feast for the celebration of the first day of the Corsi ad. The Duke's court feasted and played alongside the winners of the competitions of the day for it was a privilege to even just be in the same tent as the Duke for only the finest foods were served at his table. Diaz and Crocker sat there at the honorary table alongside the other day's victors which each other whilst the rest of Strider group, Lulia Amirian and Mr. Bianchin sat along a separate table reserved for guests of honor. They were by common denomination sat adjacent to the large flowery table for the duke and his closest advisers with the guests of honor sat on his left and the victors at his right. The meals served was generous portions of meats, fishes and fruits all concocted by the region's best chefs served alongside sweet wines to refresh their palates. Samantha, Aliathro and Bobby helped themselves excessively with the wine being served. Diaz and Cain gorged on the courses of meals set before them, whilst in the other hand, Crocker had to be spoon-fed every morsel by a woman who volunteered to help him eat his fill. His muscles were too sore for him to lift himself up and the doctors told him he will need to take some vitamin shots at his person for a few days before he can get back to duty. Not that the sore gunner didn't mind, the woman had a pretty face.
If only he could only just muster the strength and visual clarity to smile due to his entire body covered head to toe with hot compresses. Is it true you not only fought those elves and won but also took on an ogre brave sir? The woman asked him. Crocker grunted in broken moans, his body, too impaired to speak properly. I think he is trying to say yes. Diaz explained to the girl. Why not talk to me sweetie? I am the best tracer right now in the world and I can actually talk. Diaz bragged. Crocker moaned again, he just wanted to give plain fuck you to Diaz since he wanted to keep the last to himself. Meanwhile back at the guests table, the scene was much merrier. It was so funny that even the drill sergeant couldn't help but laugh. Normally he would have made us to push ups but the sarge let it go for this one. Samantha told a joke from her West Point days to her teammates. Every one of the soldiers laughed with Clay laughing the loudest. However, Iris and Aliathra happily looked on. To Strider's entire credit, Samantha is a completely different person when she downs a few rounds of alcohol into her systems. Oh my fucking good, that would ruin West Pointer's rep for being robots if more found out. Clay rioted stomping the table rowdily. I even shared that on Reddit and got about a hundred likes on that one yeah? Someone called it a fake since it came from West Point but it's true. Samantha drunkenly pointed out before she downed another round of wine. Ken almost spat out the foul meat on his mouth when he heard of Samantha's joke too. At the same time since he was next to Iris, he grabbed her almost by instinct or perhaps unwittingly, by the hip around the vampire which is design address. It was form-fitting that by touch leaves little to the imagination of what her hips was like. Iris blushed and looked towards Cain. She could feel the caress of his strong black arms wrapping around her with his warmth inflaming her from within. She shuffled closer to the Nigerian to further enjoy his pleasant company. She just couldn't help it with him. His strength and intellect seduced her alongside the man's exotic skin stone which was as black as a new moon sky. Where many would flee before her, he was the first to stand up against her. Everyone feared the vampires, even Lulia Amirian held some of his own reservations for her due to her exceptional magical talents. Cain was different. He was proud of his own intellect that complements well with his physical prowess. Seeing him out there fighting or carrying all of those heavy machinery around while still being able to entertain whatever inquiries that she would forward to him was astonishing. Iris always thought that intelligence and strength were mutually exclusive to each other. You were either a desk jockeying scholar or a dull-headed brute whose muscles think faster than their brain. Yeah, you look great with each other. Hickaby Dyer clumsily nudged. The ale in his breath masked his sincere tone. Everyone laughed, even Aliathra saw to it that the vampire did indeed look great together with the obsidian colored man. Cairn indeed was an exceptional individual, smart yet also strong. He just lacks all charisma due to his rather straightforward and calculative nature. Diaz though. Despite his boisterousness can indeed back up his words which was something the elf princess liked about him. Iris. A little warning. There's a saying where I come from. Samantha placed her shoulder at Iris. Once you go black, you can never go back. She said before sipping another round of wine. Ken's eyes widened at the implications of his superior's comments. He was attracted to the vampire in a way but out of professional reasons due to her inquisitive nature. Her arcane talents and overall competency in handling explosives thanks to his teaching. He tried to tactfully move the vampire witch away but she only coiled him harder. Don't fight it, admit it, you like each other, Clay said. Fine, Ken submitted. Maybe I do. But why Iris? He asked the vampire. You are everything I want in a man. Tall, strong, handsome, and smart. Just like Bandle Thunderhand. Iris said. You read Bandle Thunderhand? Aliathra jumped when she hearkened those familiar words. You too? Iris turned to Aliathra. Who is this Bandle Thunderhand? Samantha asked. Only the most handsome, dashing and magnificent bird in all of Alphalnora and beyond. Me and my sister read all of his adventures, all twenty of them. Oh, I wish I can get the twenty-first back home. But then, 
you know. Aliath Ra transitioned to a downed expression when she had to mention again about her home. I only got to book 7. Iris added. Maybe I can tell you what happened after Bandle jumped off of that giant tree. Aliath Ra giggled. Attention. Attention. May I have your attention PLS? Duke the Bolt announced. A dinner bell rang loudly across the tent grabbing everyone's attention. All turned to him as they saw the Duke stood up along with a very ecstatic Luya Amirian and Prim Robert Bianchin. As you all know, these other worlders have been shown to display strength, intellect and discretion at all terms and they have also shown to be nothing else but willing to cooperate and help us in our time of need now and also to the future. The Duke said. It worked as Samantha couldn't believe it. Duke the Bolt has just been brought over to the youth's side thanks to Mr. Byung-chin over there. Although she still had her reservations about it most likely a monopolistic move in of a paro core industrial and economic muscles but it was all for the good of stability in the region. She didn't want to see another messy corporate wart zone like what she saw in Kesselheim again. To my night captain. You will be made the most indomitable in all the lands with the aid, training and new arms to be given to you by a para merchant guild. To my ducal architect, only the finest stones and brick for you, and to my treasurer. Wait, where is he? Duke the ball tasked. Oh, Jorgen just excused himself right now. He said he drank too much wine right now and he is at the back, said one of the servant girls. Well I will tell him the good news myself when he comes back. But for now, let us toast to unity, harmony and prosperity for Suville. Lechida, the duke cheered. Servants began to spread around the tent passing a golden goblet filled with red wine to each of the guests. Even the youth mission had their share of the tap too. Lechida, the duke repeated. Everyone copied what he said and with a mighty roar all shouted. Lechida. And promptly gulped. Qua. Iris cursed. She violently expelled the red wine onto the floor. Everyone in the tent looked towards the vampire which she collapsed with her hands grasping the discarded liquid and her knees wobbling in weakness. What happened? Samantha asked as she knelt down beside her. This. Wine. It dot poisoned me. Iris muttered slowly. What do you mean? Samantha pressed. La Dewey Rose. This wine. I can feel it. Holy magics. It has been consecrated. Aliathra added. Consecrated? Samantha turned to the elf. Adrenaline surged through her, stimulating her once inebriated brain. There was only one group of people she knows who can poison drink with holy enchantments. Die you demon filth. One of the servants roared. He revealed his hair to see the thin outlines of leaf-shaped ears on his right fist that he pointed defiantly at Mr. Byung-chin's direction. His arm sprouted two bone-like limbs with a tensed string stretched back along its long points. It was a sort of hand-drawn crossbow. It was the Sephid Liad. With little time to think and the fate of what could be the most urgently needed diplomatic mission in all of the youth's history. Samantha. Now powered with adrenaline that purged the toxins within her leapt out of her table and dived towards in between the firing distance of the elven assassin and Bobby just as the former squeezed the trigger. A crossbow bolt, enchanted with holy magics shot forth but thanks to Samantha's reflexes met her body instead of Bobby's. The lieutenant's figure slided down across the floor with Rose in slight shock of what she had just done. She just took a bullet or bolt. Yet strangely she didn't feel anything. No biting pain nor any feeling of something stuck between her. She felt strangely warm. You will die too. The Sephid Liad assassin as he reloaded his crossbow for another round and walked towards Sam to finish her off. Samantha was caught in the moment as panic took over her. She forgot her training of reaching down to the pistol on her waist and drawing before the superior adversary has a chance to finish her off. She could only just, with the young nerves of hers, reach her hand barehandedly like an unarmed civilian pleading for her life. But then, a lightning spark of green energy suddenly erupted from Samantha's right hand, the same hand that she remembered where the strange mark she received days ago appeared. She had kept it a secret between her squad mates, at least until after this diplomatic mission was over and they are all back at New Albany where she can report to Colonel Polonsky. The lightning bolt of energy was also followed with a loud rapturous thunder that shook the earth with a boom. 
The magic's bolt struck her would-be finisher dead center and to Samantha's horror, the assailant was vaporized before her. He faded into dust alongside his clothes and weapon. He was gone beyond gone. The one with the red hair. She's a mage. Another one ordered. Three more Sephiriad agents revealed themselves from the disguises of servants. Hands drawn with either magic or a magically enchanted hand bows attached to their forearms. They shot towards Samantha with all of their self-righteous fury as the lieutenant scrambled for cover, but the missiles were too fast for Samantha's reflexes, striking her body once again. Yet instead of her going into a shock over herself getting shot, Samantha felt the previously felt warmth again, turning hotter and hotter inside her body. Like a surge of electricity being left unstable in its current, Samantha's instincts turned from survival to the suddenly encompassing need to expel. She stood up as lightning bolts and the light green energies filled with excited winds of magic giving the lieutenant a jade glow. She took a good look at the three elves with their hands drawn forth to her and their faces tainted with turbulence as if they never expected something like this to happen in their attempted subterfuge. In that brief moment, Samantha had one thought in mind. That she really needed to kill all of these three people. Just as soon as she thought. The energies around her complied. More lightning bolts came forth from within her in a violent discharge of power. It blinded nearly everyone with its pure flashes of light. Three missiles shot forth and spread themselves each towards the assailants that Samantha saw as the assassins. Two struck two assassins down, their bodies evaporating to dust. Whilst the third one had to fire across the crowded tent towards the farthest assassin in the room. Luckily for him. Unlike his poor colleagues, he casted a magical ward on time shielding him from the blow, but the blast resulting from the magic dissipating was great enough that he was pushed backwards all the way past the door. Get him! One of the ducal guards shouted. The knights errant of Suville drew their swords and began to make chase for the Cephidliad agent who dared to try to make an attempt on the duke's life or at least that what they believe it looked like since Mr. Byongchen was right next to Duke the Bald at the table. The entire tent was set ablaze with frights and frantic foot dreads as the attendants in the tent scrambled to safety with the duke quickly being dragged away by his bodyguards. There's been an attack, the duke screamed. Meanwhile the rest of Strider group approached Samantha who after discharging the magical energy that she had indispelled, she slid down on her knees as she could feel her hands burning like hot steam. She took of her gloves not caring that she exposed her strange brand mark to her colleagues that also glowed brightly in the same jade energy that she had released earlier. Lieutenant, how did you do that? Clay asked. Indeed. You are not a mage how can? Iris tried to approach Samantha, but then her fangs began to water with saliva as she approached the lieutenant. She felt the power of some enormous amount of energy within her that made the vampire which wet with appetite. Before she could get her hands on Samantha, Ken pulled Iris away. He didn't want her to betray her vampiric nature in public and he knew by the time he spent with her about her quirky habits. Maybe Iris was right about that she is attracted to him. But it wasn't just Ken's protective instincts that were the reason he deflected Iris away from Samantha. According to his scanner on his shades, he could detect copious amounts of radioactivity within Samantha. She's nuclear, Ken said. What? Where? Samantha exclaimed. She scrambled around her body in confusion to Ken's declaration. You are, Ken added, me? How? Samantha questioned. Neutralize her quick, Bobby ordered. I am sorry Lieutenant. Clay apologized as he pulled elbowed Samantha's head knocking her before the Lieutenant could react. What the hell just happened? Why did one of us just shoot magic? Bobby asked. I don't know how she did that honestly. Ken answered. Sir Mudwin, if I may. Aliathra tapped Ken's shoulder. Look at Ledewey Rose's hand. She pointed out all of Strider group, Mr. Byongchin and Lula Amirian approached Samantha. They now see with their own naked eyes the strange mark on Samantha's hand. It's like some sort of rune, Lula said. Not just any rune, but it is a brand of choosing, Aliathra said. 
she knelt down on Samantha's unconscious body and held her hand up for the rest of her acquaintances to better examine. Only Miriam and Iris shared a surprised but knowledgeable nod to this strange mark whilst the earthlings were confused. Are you saying that, Samantha? Iris began question upon the implications of what Aliathra had deduced. She has been chosen by the sacred crystal heart. Aliathra informed everyone. Her mark in my tongue, Ranupata meaning the shareholder. I believe Samantha, no, I am sure, that Samantha has been gifted not by blood, but by the great crystal heart itself. Dash Marxian barely made it away from his pursuers by sheer dumb look. He was so confident at first when he securing his benefactor, a man on the inside of the juke will tend to smuggle them in with servant disguises to assassinate the demons who attend on Duke Thibault's side. He thought that blessing the toasting wine with holy magics would poison the demons or at least weaken them enough for his men to close in for the kill. Yet in a sick twist of fate, he was foiled again. That red-headed woman, the one they call Samantha Rose revealed her hidden magical talents upon him and vaporized his friend Walt Torin and the rest of the Cephid Liad cell assigned to Suville. He was all that is left. Now with this Samantha Rose name etched within his head, Marxian vowed for vengeance. He will vanquish that vile demoness if it's the last thing he do. But for now, he needs to regroup with his contact. They needed a new plan. The elven spy ran across the festive streets of New Suville using the celebrations as cover as he made his way discreetly towards the rendezvous point. He knew that their contact within the Duke's court had just as much to lose as the elves and the Empire are if the other worlders were allowed to establish their footings in the Duchy of Suville. He made his way upon a shady alley and whistled a special tune that he arranged with the contact as a challenge word. Another whistle responded and it was the correct response. Jodent, Gresky Jodent, Marxian said. Did you kill them? Gresky Jodent, the chief tax collector of Suville emerged from the shadows. No, we have failed. One of the demons used magic against us. I was the only survivor. Marxian regrettably answered. By the gods. We have no more options left but one. Gresky Jodent said. No. We are not going for the last option. This could put you at risk too. Marxian dissuaded. If that demon who goes by the name of Triple underscore Aparo wraps the duke around his finger then you can say goodbye to Suville and give the entire duchy to the demons in a silver plate. You, me, your royal family and the empire will lose everything. Gresky said. It was a well-guarded secret among the Sapphide Liad and the Slaeetan Empire that Gresky Jodent, a former lawyer and tax collector from Herring Point was given the de facto means of power in the Duchy of Suville. They had little faith at Duke Thibault's ability to rule over Suville so they assigned him to be in charge of the tax collection going through the region. He was also given permission to set up various extortive schemes like loan sharking and accelerated processing of important documents in order to increase the revenue that the empire got. He had established himself from the power base of his bank for over 20 years starting from Thibault's ascension. The duke was more concerned about keeping himself and all his subjects in a constant state of felicitous bread and circuses. But with the coming of the other worlders and how this Aparo demon whispered sweet nothings of promises of power and wealth in exchange for the one thing Gresky Jodent hated the most. Exclusivity rights. He absolutely hated sharing. Fine. But we will only get one chance at this. It's all or nothing. What is the plan? Marxian asked the chief tax collector. Two things. One the Grey Order. There are a lot of Grey Order adventurers here in Suville celebrating the festivities or just passing by. We will use them for our plan. Gresky explained. How will you get these adventurers to agree to help us? Just bribe them with all of your ducats. Marxian questioned. Bribe is such a harsh word. More of a word I prefer. Anyways, to the second part of my plan, you and I know that both of our realms have very differing views of magic and the people who uses them am I correct? Gresky asked. Yes, I do. The elven agent nodded. 
The Slaeetan Empire and the Eth Island Entente share different views of how magic should be harnessed. For the elves, magic should be nurtured and accepted with educational grants and openings to possible high salaried arcane related jobs within the Entente for the beneficial strength of the true elves. But for the Empire's perspective, magic needs to be controlled for the correct purposes. Guards Officials and even the College of Magi themselves need to keep a record of every magic user in the world. They, the magic users must be reported upon seeing the first signs of magical potential. The Empire's processes state that they must be sent to a special education affiliated with the College to learn both the strength and dangers of their powers to indoctrinate them to use their gifts for the benefit of the state only. Most mages who didn't decide to join the ranks of the college registered with the Grey Order Guild with the Empire's agents always closely monitoring their actions. Harboring an independently aligned mage or being one yourself with the stigmatic title of Rogue Mage is a punishable offense of the highest degree. Many of these rogue mages, with their nefarious reasons for not registering themselves with the College of Magi would hide themselves away, practicing their dangerous arts in secret. There were numerous occurrences of attacks, accidents and other forms of mishaps caused by these rogue mages which only further pushed by the Slaeetan Senate to enact harsher and stricter laws and punishment against them and their associates. It was much a shock to Marxian that the vampire, one by the name of Aris Kadahagan was among the side of the demons. She and perhaps more of her twisted kind might have also began to align themselves with the other worlders. To both Greski and Marxian this must stop. I can accuse the Duke of harboring a rogue mage. This will give us some time to place the right people in the Duke's palace to make their apprehension. The Duke will be ruined and for my work in exposing treachery within the Duchy, the Emperor will award my family the Dukedom of Souville. Greski conspired. I see. Is that where the Grey Order comes in? Marxian asked. Them and also my guards, your fellow elves from the Embassy and a few others in between too. Greski added. Marxian nodded. The plan was clear to him now. It was this or the last of an important region in the Empire. Understood? Good. We will need to make the arrangements. Follow me to the Grey Order office. My guards will protect you. I know the manager well, Greski said. A cadre of guards engulfed Marxian as the scheming Greski marched forth with them following behind him for their plot to enact. Yet despite all of Greski's attempts of subtlety, there was one person who overheard the chief tax collector's conspiracy. He emerged from his darkened corner behind some wooden boxes as they stood their mouths agape in terror and pants still loosened downwards and his bottom still exposed. It was Father Bishop. He had retreated behind that alleyway for a moment of relief after eating glutinously Sanjilf's signature braised prawns in a sweet root and chalembi stew with a side of grapes. He wanted a moment to relax as he excreted the food away, as if by the hands of the Almighty himself. The Catholic priest chose that certain alleyway where he overheard the conspiracy against the youth and him take place. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, these monsters will not stop us. They will not stop Sacratera. He needed to warn someone, anyone, of the danger ahead. Chapter 33, The Counter-Coup Part 1 a sharp ringing sensation from her ears and the piercing luminescence of a light bulb above her person greeted Lieutenant Samantha Rose as she awoke from unconsciousness. Her head swirled as she rose from the blanket less white cot in her monotone grey room which was minimalistic as it got with only a toilet and a sink with a mirror to accompany the lone bed. It is a holding cell. She got herself inside a military brig. When she managed to gather her bearings, she remembers what happened beforehand. She was attacked by elven mages and in her attempt at a drunken defense, she somehow blasted out what she can only fathom as magical energy, the same likes of which her squadmates, the specialists Iris the Vampire Witch and Aliathra the ex-princess could accomplish. Was it the result of her hand, especially the mark, or did she down too many rounds of that succulent Suvelli red wine last night and now in her drunken stupor got herself in trouble or for her own safety in the brig? All of Samantha's were answered when her ears caught the cell's door cheering outward. Lieutenant Rose, 
the voice of Major Holyfield emerged from the breath of the outside world. Alongside him was an attachment of two bodyguards, the snow white and raven black contrasts of her squad mate Iris Cadahagan and lastly, none other than the rotund figure wrapped around a lab coat shape that is Dr. Malone. If the last two are any to go by, Major, Samantha tensed up to salute, don't salute me. Holyfield suddenly shouted. His voice reverberated a fearful confusion by his tone and posture. His arm was tense with his right hand inching closer for a quick draw of his .45 caliber. Also, his two carders of bodyguards were just inches away from releasing their self-restraints of their trigger discipline. For Malona however, his eyes were of curious or aimed towards Samantha's branded hand. Observing the intricate trust-colored rune marks that she bestowed on her skin. Miss Cadahagan shared the sentiments of Holyfield's abashment and Malona's engrossment over Rose's strange branding. Dr. Malona would like to answer some questions for you. About that? A thing in your arm. Holyfield informed. I will sir but what brings you here T. Samantha nodded but she was cut off again by the Major. I am the one here asking the questions here. Not you. Right now, in this room. I am not your friend nor your superior until I know what the hell is going on. Answer the doctor's question. He ordered. I have my eye on you. He added a cold and piercing warning to the lieutenant. Shall I begin? Dr. Malona asked the Major. Holyfield approved with a quiet nod. What can you remember last night? Malona inquired. We were having a feast. I was enjoying myself and then suddenly a bunch of elven assassins who shoot magic showed and tried to shoot at us specifically at Mr. Bianchin. Samantha answered, I dove in front of the magic missiles they threw at Bobby's direction and somehow I managed to block them all. How come you managed to get out unscathed? Those magic missiles as Iris informed me can punch through armor. Malona asked, I don't know. All I know is that I felt some sort of electricity surging in me after I landed. It felt like the magic energies were attracted to me. When one of the assassins came up to finish me off, I raised my hand and suddenly a bolt of lightning escaped me. It felt like the blood on my veins was roaring. Samantha explained. The doctor turned his head to Aris who stood quietly on his left side. She nodded upon observing Samantha's accounts for the events transpired last night, for she herself was a witness. I see. That mark of yours. When did you get that mark? Malona pointed at Samantha's hand. This? How long was I out? Samantha returned fire with a question. She needed to clarify something first before giving an exact timeline. It all happened last night. It is around 9 a.m. now. Malona told her. That means. About dot a. Four or five days if I remember. Samantha said. Around the same time. Malona muttered carelessly. Around the same time? As for what? Samantha asked. Doctor. Show her. Holyfield said. Malona took off his lab coat to reveal his full buttoned up polo. He then proceeded much to the shakiness of Samantha's predicaments, to unbutton his polo. Halfway through, he pulled the two sides of his top open. To Samantha's shock, he too had a runic-like brand. This time on the scientist's breastbone. Although different in strokes, the similarity of the writing was the same in terms of styling. It was as if her hand's brand and Malona's brand on his chest were from the same language. I got this around the same time as you said you got yours, Malona said. Me and Daly Aethra know of this language it was an old style of writing in Vigory called Gulweg script or the old magic language. Iris said. Explain. Samantha requested. Centuries ago, Vigori was a different language than it was today. It was borrowed from the elven languages and formed around the existing human languages at the time from around the Stla Aegean tribal period. Not many people still use Gulweg script today except two entities, college scholars when reading and translating old texts of magic dating back long ago. And the last one who I am afraid to say but is the likeliest person to brand you. The Sacred Crystal Heart. Iris said, The Sacred Crystal Heart? What is that? Samantha asked. It is a giant crystal that is said to house some sort of powerful magical entity inside it. It occasionally talks to the clergyman in the Great Cathedral. In Herring Point, 
Legend says that during a time of great crisis, the Crystal Heart would bestow powers to one or more individuals when a great crisis comes that threatens Klee easier. The last time it was used was around the time of King Kul Delstla Ajax period. Iris said, By my closest translations of the brands you and Sir Melona have, you have the brand saying Ranupata meaning the shareholder judging your ability to absorb and give off magics for the scientist, fitting his name. He has the brand of Estes Skull, meaning the scholar, let me guess. He too was chosen by this crystal heart? Samantha inquired. Iris nodded. So, what is my power then, if I am branded by this crystal heart? Samantha questioned, according to my initial readings on you when I was dragged in here. And if you ask, you are still in Suville, Lieutenant. My readings say that there is a significant trace of mana energies within you, probably left over by what happened yesterday. Melona said, mana.power.so. Delhi.shsh. Iris began to quiver, her knees shaking weak and her mouth salivating. Her eyes pierced her like the finest main meal set upon her. Ramirez, escort Iris out of here and pass her a packet of January's. Holyfield, his escort on his right. January's is artificial blood made from stem cells and infused with fresh oxygen meant to be a universal substitute for real human blood but controversially it was regulated amongst the youth states for various economic, moral and safety concerns. It was made by a para corporation and is commercially available albeit with some regulations about a few years ago. Iris has been given a weekly ration of the artificial blood courtesy of the pharmaceutical hand of a para corporation's many trades. The two walked out leaving Samantha with Holyfield. The other bodyguard of his and Dr. Malona left. Let me continue. But please forgive Iris. She was feeling like that when we brought her here. Melona apologized. Anyways, you, as I hypothesize, that you can absorb mana energies upon close contact, then store them within yourself like a battery. I checked your internals and you are storing quite a bit of power inside you. But, Melona stuttered as he talked about storage. But what? Samantha asked. Storage room always have a limit. Holyfield said. I theorized that if you reach a certain limit and extend beyond it, you will somehow reach a sort of supercritical like a reactor. A nuclear reactor, Melona hesitatingly informed. Are you saying I can explode if I take too much mana? Samantha leapt. Yes. Which is why I'm not hesitating right now to end you right here and quietly. Holyfield said. Why? I am a good soldier. I was always a good soldier. I always diligently follow the youth state and I don't plan on deviating from our principles ever. Samantha objected and I cannot risk the lives of my men or Colonel Polonsky's too. I see no other options but to dispose of you one way or the other. Now you can either leave Glee easier quietly on the next cargo ship. Holyfield stated his intentions. He then pulled out his pistol from its holster and pointed at Samantha's head at point-blank range. Or you leave in a body bag, Holyfield said. Tension rose for an agonizing moment as Samantha sweated bullets down her freckled cheeks. She just got here in Glee easier and was starting to not only feel comfortable working on this tour of duty but also getting to know everyone and everything about this fantasy world for herself. Her photography collection that she does for the state was also starting to pile up nicely too and she didn't want to have all of it end right here and now. Rose felt helpless at that moment yet she also understood where the Major was coming from. She has powers she has no idea how to control and if it goes wrong then she could explode like a nuclear bomb with devastating results. What? But the little voice in my head is saying that it objects to it. Melona raised his hand. You. Or it objects to me, tell me, then what other nonsense did that voice in you say? Holyfield turned to the scientist. She can control it. She's like a mage like every other else. Just, with some limits, Melona said. Oh, eating up mana until she explodes like a nuke? How can you address that doctor? Holyfield said. I, well you remember Actocolite and Gyronite report? Melona asked. Yes. One is made to absorb and automatically obtain to store unbinilium's radioactive energies. The latter is used as a sort of insulator to keep unbinilium energies from jumping too much around. 
Wait. Continue, Doctor. The Major's tension lowered as the gears on his head spun to process the good Doctor's studies. Well, I can weave with maybe some help from a paracorp a sort of special suit for the Lieutenant. A containment suit made of actocolite, so she can be of use with her new skills as a sort of mage by absorbing then releasing the mana energies in controlled and concentrated blasts. Then Gyronite like the ones from King Martin's tomb to help keep the mana energies to a minimum and acceptable level. A few cybernetic implants here and there and she could be very useful. I mean, she is a chosen one after all just like me, Melona said. The Major was stunned at that moment. He lowered his pistol and fastened it back to his holster and ordered his other escort to stand down too. So, you need Gyronite and Actocolite am I correct? He asked. Just Actocolite, then some help from a par like engineers who had made hazmat suits and body armor plus some machinery there and there. I mean I think King Martin has not much more use from the Gyronite in his too many more since he likes to go around Tyrian a lot and he enjoys our protection. I am sure he can understand, Melona said. That sounds actually feasible doctor. The Major composed himself back to his idle yet no-nonsense stoic demeanor. You can hear a voice. Doctor? Samantha asked. Yeah, it keeps telling me whether I dream or whenever I am near Unvinilium. Sort of like some sort of guide. It tells me what I need to know whatever I can get my hands on from the Recon teams. Best I talk about it sometime later when you visit me at my lab again if you got the time yeah? Oh, by the way. Thank you for that shipment of Mana Crystals. Although I was about to have some fun with them when Major Holyfield drags me out of my lab to you. I just want to get this over with and head back to my lab. The team won't start without me. The scientist replied. What about my team? Samantha asked. Last I checked, they were at Cal Point on some additional scouting. The land there is pretty good for a base for all of us to use if the Duke allows it, Holyfield said. I will go talk with Agent the Sut now about what I managed to gather. He is a bit annoyed that he isn't here to do the talking but trust me, you would rather have me interviewing you than him. Samantha gulped. Intelligence officers were some of the most clandestine and unconventional people under the employ of the youth state. They had a reputation of having an unfettered approach to their jobs against any threats to the state's interplanetary unity. The Major then turned his head to Dr. Malona. Containment suit idea of yours. How long would it take for you to give that to the Lieutenant? He asked. Three months I think, Malona answered. You have one, he sternly informed. Dash. A hot vegetable soup complimentary from Sanjilf paired well the spaghetti bolognese rations that Strider is scheduled to use today. Among all the MREs that the Ufif have, the popular favorite among all service members is the spaghetti bolognese ration. It was the closest it could get to real food as a survey would say. That's why there were stockpiles of tomato sauce cans being piled up due to the hearty taste and nutrition it gave to each youth reef serviceman. Ken and Iris weren't there to enjoy the ration as the two were called in by Mr. Byongchen for an important meeting about yesterday's events. For now, Sergeant Crocker is effectively in charge, yet all of them were anxious about the fate of their original CO, Lieutenant Rose. Most especially Corporal Clay. I hope I didn't hit her too hard, cause I don't know what the hell just happened. Clay stood up and waved his arms in lamentation. We all are Clay. Shit. I wonder what would dem suits would say when they find out. A bead I mentioned before he took a spoonful of soup on his mouth. It's called high command again root. Crocker corrected. Also, it's likely they brought in some coats from the science team along too if we are going by what we saw last night. The sergeant cupped his hand on his face, in vain trying to make sense of everything that had happened. He saw his commanding officer, his superior and a sort of a daughter to him shoot what he can only describe as magic from her hands. How was it all possible? What did Iris say about that mark on her hand? He had never seen anything like that before and lastly why Samantha? Why her among everyone else? How come she could exhibit such an ability for arcane arts yet everyone else couldn't? He sulked down before he remembered the newcomer in their group who sat quietly across him beside Diaz. Aliathra, 
I need an explanation I needed it yesterday. Crocker ordered. The elf turned pale as Crocker's imposing frame shadowed over her lithe elven body. She was paralyzed and cowardly to say a word in front of him. Sarge, I think you're scaring her. Abedire commented. I'll cut to the bloody chase. How can Samantha shoot magic like you and Iris? Crocker asked the elf. I don't know. The elf answered. From what I see is that the mark on Samantha's hand is from the sacred crystal heart. It bestows her the ability to cast magic to what extent I don't know. Aliathro explained. Why her? Why is she chosen? Crocker asked. Aliathro answered. I am not sure about that. The Crystal Heart is invoked to choose heroes to save the day during a crisis that can threaten the world. The Slay Agents normally would invoke the Heart to choose heroes against you people but somehow for an unknown reason, it chose Ledui Rose. That doesn't make sense at all why the Heart chose to give great power to the enemy to defeat the enemy. Clay gave his inquiry. Is that Crystal Heart thinks using Samantha to get close to us and kill us all? Crocker asked. I don't know. All I know is that normally you are born a mage not made into one. Us mages can easily detect another mage by their innate mana reserves within them. If Samantha was born one, I would have seen it myself too. Aliathra answered. So, are you saying that perhaps Samantha never had any mana shoved into her until now? Crocker pressed. The elf nodded in affirmation. Crocker turned away, again cupping his hand on his face. There isn't. How? Why? Crocker stuttered. Stuff. Stuff like this. It is not normal. Crocker said. Sarge this whole world is not normal. Abedaya argued. I fucking read those old books okay? But it's the lieutenant, not Gleesia, not Tyrion, not Iris nor it is not Aliathra, Crocker said. But magic is a celebrated craft given by the gods to aid us in our lives. La Dewey Rose should be happy that she has the gift. The elf argued. Well not to us it ain't. Gifts are meant to be something that the person getting it would like to have. Samantha. The lieutenant never asked for this. This. Mark or whatever Iris called it. She sure as shit ain't asking for it by the look of her face. Crocker argued. It takes time to understand the extent of your DUI, Sir Crocker. She will need time to learn. For sure Iris must be divulging her knowledge of magics to your superiors as we speak. Aliathra reassures the sergeant. It's not her that you should be afraid of Miss Luther. It's high command and the scientists you must fear. Crocker dreadfully warned. What would they do to her? Aliathra asked. The scene turned from an ignited debate to an awkward silence for the youth personnel in that room. They knew what the High Command and their Parvenu government-funded science divisions were capable of, although some of the news they heard could be just slanderous rumors meant to discredit them for unethical practices. Elfie. Girlie. You. I just want to say that. Remember the time about your heart? The metal one you got? Diaz asserted with as much bravery as he could muster. Indeed. The heart you gave me to save my life. I am still not so sure about having it within me. Aliathra nodded. Well imagine that but. The doctors. I mean healers. Don't have your best interests at heart. Diaz said. I do not understand. The elf trembled. Crocker. Don't ask or don't tell the colonel or the major how I know this but. Samantha is whether she likes it or not, is now government property, Diaz said, property, as in your superiors own her, like a slave, Aliathra's eyes jumped in horror on her realization of Diaz's words, if I recall from the hack, any anomalous anything is to be sent and studied by the scientific and experimental agency for advanced research and development, or I like to call it, C.R.D., it doesn't matter what it is, if we cannot understand it, they will take it and study it, Diaz said. It's true, Clay admitted. What the Corpa said is true. Samantha is whether we like it or not a magic user just like you and Iris. Yeah, to be honest with you all. I am pretty scared of you sometimes, Abedaya commented. Why should you be? Magic is a gift. Samantha should learn to wield her awesome powers. I wonder what kind of affinity she would have. Maybe like me, or Iris. Aliathra began to get ahead of herself. Again, that is not the point Miss Luther. She is. Or was not wielding magic before and now she can. Why her and not us? 
Virtually all of us are non-magic users, or whatever you call them. Crocker argued back. What are they called? People who can't do magic? Clay asked. Milbore which means empty handed for they don't have any mana from their hands. Aliathra answered, but see this. At least in my eyes Miss Lathra. Magic is a thing we don't understand and we see as something dangerous. Don't you get it? Crocker said his piece. So is your science and metal technology. You make the world bend to your will and mess with the natural order of things. I mean, you gave me this heart and these legs when you could have easily left me to die. But you didn't. Aliathra pleaded. Her eyes began to shed drops of red and tears as she beat her breasts at first and then to her prosthetic legs too. This time, Crocker and alongside him the rest of the youth personnel were left in shock. A different sort of shock too. The elf, the primitive in the group was correct. The youth sees magic as dangerous, while the natives see their technology just as disruptive too. Nobody knew how to respond to the elven princess argument. Then a panic knocking noise followed up from the lonesome hearth's front door. The knob twisted and out comes a distressingly sweaty and exhaustive further Rudy Bishop. He hunched down as he gasped for breath. His eyes were wildly jumping side to side when Bishop scanned the room and to his relief. He spotted the familiar faces of Strider Group. Padre, what are you doing here? Diaz asked. There's something happening. I, I, Bishop panted. Breathe, take a deep breath, inhale and out. Crocker walked up to the bishop to guide the old man to a chair. Yet the clergyman refused to rest, resisting with all of his exhausted energy to not rest. His panting sounds turned from gasps to barely coherent words. Did something happen to you? Crocker asked. Bad guys. The priest ejected from his mouth with all of his breath. What? Crocker questioned. A shadow then appeared from the exposed entrance of the room. He walked up to the entrance and to the alarm of everyone's ears. They heard a scabbard unsheathing. You lead us right to them. A tall man with long hair and a scrabble of facial hair haughtily declared. Out came from his right hand a shinning sabre encrusted with a gold handle. He was followed by several other men and women, their hands revealing the sight of weapons. Bows, swords, staffs, axes and even a double-pointed spear pointed at Strider Group and the debilitated Silesian with violent intent. Hey, weapons are not allowed. Three Sanjil Fangrily walked up to the armed men to reprimand them but he was swiftly cut down by the first man who drew his saber and without hesitation cut him down. No, Crocker cried out. Take them out before they could fight back, he declared to his companions. Ambush, Clay shouted as he dove towards his carbine rifle sitting idly by on the bar counter. Draw, Diaz smirked as his augmented reflexes drew Ruina from his pocket and he began to open fire at their assailants. Abidaya kicked the table he sat on to create the cover as he to drew April the revolver from his sheath and opened fire. Aliathra crawled towards the long bearded man and hid them. She was defenseless at the moment without her bow and arrow which was lying away from her a few meters across another table. Crocker meanwhile held his ground behind a support pillar of the inn drawing his pistol whilst dragging the bleeding Sanjulf away from danger, keeping his hand tightly covering the cut wound he was inflicted on. A fight occurred in the close quarter dining hall of the Candle Hearth Hostel. Some of the ambushers had not expected their quarry to draw their weapons so quickly and with such a range that they didn't have the time to realize how outclassed they were when the bullets pierced their bodies, killing them on the spot. The rest of them, about at least eight of them, jumped to whatever minuscule cover they could hide from. But even then, wooden furniture wasn't strong enough to protect them from bullets made over centuries of refinement and engineering. Some were shot not understanding how such invisible arrows could cut through their cover while those with the instincts to move swiftly continued to stand their ground. Who the hell are these guys? Clay asked as he opened fire with his carbine laying down suppressing automatic fire. I don't know. Take them down. Crocker ordered as he took control of the situation. Flanking. Diaz shouted as he spotted several of their assailants huddled up into one large banquet table flipped down against them. He emerged quickly and with his superior speed, he slid down to the ground barely dodging arrow and magic fire before gunning down three more adventurers from behind that table before hugging down behind another one. 
no good. Retreat. One of the ambushers cried. Several of them began to kick up their heels and began to flee, making a beeline for the front door from which they came. I need one of them alive. Crocker yelled. Aliathra, hearing this knew what she needed to do. Whether it's out of her newfound friendship with Samantha or her own self-preservation instincts to follow Crocker and continue to enjoy the youth's protection. The elf's hands begin to conjure magic once again. It was the first time in a long while since she could use her powers again. With a flick of her fingers, her hand cast a mix of alteration and restoration magics called paralysis. She aimed at one of the fleeing ambushes. The young man felt his body numb as if the muscles within him stopped working as he fell limply at the ground taking the rest of the opportunity so that their location won't be compromised. A bee dire and clay gunned down the last of their assailants with their weapons. Clear. Everything is clear, Clay said. Crocker sighed in relief. Master. Opta despaired as his little goblin legs ran towards his bleeding master. I. I don't. Have time. To live. Please. There. Letter Will Sandil rattled, his warmth chilled and his body stiffened with rigor mortis. The little goblin only cried mournful tears as he saw his master and his only companion fade in his eyes. Even with Eleathra's intervention, she couldn't save her as she tried frantically reanimate him, but there was little life to work with for a proper restoration despite her exceptional abilities. All she could do was wipe off the blood from Sandilf's wound and closed his eyes. Normally. Restoration spells are less effective the more aged a person gets although this phenomenon as she studied back at her college is only prevalent amongst hawks, humans, beast folks and some cases dwarves. The ever youthful elves couldn't find an understanding of why such an occurrence happened to the more fading races compared to themselves. May Tivna guide you safely and may Nanith welcome you to her garden, Aliathra whispered to Sandilf Stedier. The prayer of mournful comfort when one comes to pass off of this mortal coil. The goblin tugged the elf's lithe body like a child being borne down a great tragedy and in front of him. Opta shielded his eyes from the disheartening sight. He hugged for comfort like when the departed one's relatives seek to hug those closest to them for comfort. Under her own knowledge, goblins were repulsive creatures like their barbaric kin the orcs. But to see a goblin mourn for a human contradicts all that she was taught by the school. Turn around to the goblin, Aliathra returned his embrace. The elf let the goblin pour out his sorrow and share it with her. Even Bishop who stood idly by a few meters away shared a heartfelt tear fall down from his eyes and staining his glasses. He shared some part of guilt within him that this man, who loved the final things in life and tried his best to share generously his passions to the world was cruelly snuffed away before his natural time could come. Meanwhile, Crocker looked towards the paralyzed ambusher with vengeful intent. He brutishly carried him over to the table with his two arms and caressed the man's throat. Who sent you? Crocker roared with an opening question. The man responded with spit on Crocker's face. The exosuit man responded with a quick punch from his right hand. He may be out of his currently awaiting repairs exosuit but he can still deliver a mean beatdown with his bare fists. Religious weightlifting and shadow boxing sessions do that to one's muscles. I ain't gonna ask again, Crocker responded. WHO sent you? He raised the man up so that his eyes could meet his. The Grey Order. We. The Grey Order will wipe Suviel of your corruption. Joden would see to it, the man said. An adventurer, here? Aliathra commented as she stood up with the less teary-eyed doctor holding her hand. Princess, you are as they say. Quite a stunning beauty in person, the adventurer said. Diaz stood in between the man's gaze and Aliathra's. He was quite slighted for that move. This elf was his mark and even then, outside of the need for feminine stimulation, Diaz felt he had an obligation to guide Aliathra through her present state of prosthetics taking over several parts of her body. Too bad. It's too late for you. The elven embassy paid handsomely for your safe return if you could be rescued. The adventurer said. Jodent, Gresky Jodent, the tax collector, and the Entente elves? What do they have to do with all of this? Crocker slammed the table to intimidate the captive further. 
he ordered us, adventurers, to apprehend the duke so he could be removed from his position for someone as capable as Jodan to replace him to save Suville from your corruption. The duke was always a childish buffoon anyway so he should be removed one way or another. So Jodan paid you handsomely for this too? Crocker shook the adventurer violently. More than that if we succeed in this quest, the emperor will honor us with knighthood and the people will praise our glory in preventing the takeover of the demon horde in Suville and we will bathe in riches filled with elven sealer and slay each and ducats. The captive laughed. Crocker began to pat down the adventurer for anything of a grain of truth to his statements. Was this man trying to taunt them or is the diplomatic team in danger? Penetrating his pockets, Crocker found a letter signed with the approving seal of Gresky Jodent's familiar emblem alongside several coins of two different varieties judging by the minting used in its production. Judging by the way they were designed, the sergeant saw the all-familiar engravings relevant to a slay each and ducat of its varying sizes and amounts of precious metals. For the other variety of coins, compared to the ducat, these elven sealer had a more refined engraving of uniformity and the aesthetic pleasing that elves are obsessed in attaining. Seeing the elven coins made Aliathra's blood spike around her. She couldn't believe that her noble father would do such a dirty handed thing in launching a coup d'etat. He had always thought that he was a kind and humble ruler who always chooses the least violent approaches to his problems. Why are my people in this? Aliathra walked up to the captive, her nerves struck by the words of this man. My lady. The Sephid Liad wish just the same to rid of these demons off the face of the world. Can't you see it? The adventurer teased. You mentioned Elven Sealer, gold from my father's treasury. Who is financing you? The Sephid Liad should have been decimated here? The elf asked. Who else but Ambassador Thelanil and Agent Thelanil? But mostly the Ambassador. He is already calling in more of your paladins to come here as we speak especially your brother the adventurer taunted don't you dare bring his name into this aliathra called him out who is this thelanil crocker asked the eth island ambassador to suville i know where the embassy is aliathra said crocker nodded so what will you do now we are everywhere you are all surrounded you cannot win the adventurer laughed this crocker pushed his weight down to the adventurer crushing his throat killing him. Damn crocodile. Shit. Remind me never to piss you off. Diaz cringed. He is our only lead to this. What exactly is fucking happening right now? Clay wondered. Ah don't worry, my camera is on. It's always on. They will see everything. Crocker reassured. He then placed his hand on his chin to think now that he began to process what he just learned now. Adventurers backed by Gresky and the elves. How common are adventurers from the Grey Order? Crocker asked Aliathra. Quite a lot, maybe about every five people is an adventurer or had taken the job before, Aliathra answered. But at this time during the games? I say that maybe several thousands of them are here right now. I think five thousand of them are here for the festivities, Aliathra added. Well, it had to be subtle judging by the way Gresky is trying to seize power. He can't just ask all of them to go after Duke Thibault. Too much room for error, maybe give or take. A thousand about as much? Crocker reasoned. Hey, I am a bit slow here. But what are you thinking about? What is going on? Abidaya raised his hand. Coo, Abidaya. The Duke is going to get cooed. Sudden military overthrow. And I bet the Grey Order is the muscle behind this, Crocker said. If the coup happens and I assume Jodan is gonna take over then. Abed began to process through his thoughts. We can kiss all that we did here goodbye. Shit. Diaz cursed. We need to warn everyone now, Bishop said. Father. I mean Mr. Bishop. How did you get here and how did you know where to find us? Crocker asked. Sanjulf. Poor Sanjulf here told me that you do binocular things here and would be here for the day, you were the only team I could find. I did manage to warn some of our attendees in the courtyard about this but some of them don't believe me. Well, they will now. Clay get me a line with Camp Gillyleaf. Code Black. Code Black. Crocker shouted orders. Dash.
After a hasty drive back to Camp Gilly Leaf and a briefing of the situation, the camp was alive with activity as soldiers alongside their PMC colleagues scrambled to their stations. Strider Group who were the bearers of such news were personally called into the presence of Major Holyfield in his private tent. He stood arms wide on a holographic map showing the entire duchy before him alongside his right-hand man in the Bureau of Intelligence, Agent Desardt. On the line on a satellite phone is Bobby Byung-Chin who is currently attending another of Duke the Balt's many parties that he must attend by showcasing his appearance that day in his palace. Strider was also reunited with Iris and Cairn to whom they both shared what happened to Samantha's interrogation. For now, much to the squad's relief, she is safe for now. A coup is imminent and it's all those damn elves and the Empire's fault. I should have blasted that palace when I had the chance. Holyfield muttered. They will learn in time Major. But we must act now in the present. We need to protect our people from these savages and then deal with these plotters. Dasad said. How? Huh? What's the plan? Byung-Chin said. Well the elves' main actor is the ambassador to Suville. A guy named. A. The Larniel? Is that how you say it? Anyway Zaliathra knows where the embassy is. Not too far away from the docks actually. Crocker said. Okay, but we will need to get close with some subtlety. Armed soldiers rushing towards the embassy would probably tip off our guy there. Dasat said. I can dispatch a group of mercs to dispose of the embassy and apprehend the ambassador. That should cut off any elven support they have. Or at the very least we should be able to unravel more of this plot. Diaz, accompany the elf girl with you. Byung-Chin said. We will have to also dispose of that Jodent guy too. Where would he be at this hour? Is he in the palace with you Mr. Byung-Chin? Crocker asked. No, Duke told me that he has his own thing at his mansion. A. Hey, just get ready to move out. I will ask him if he can let me know about where he lives. Byung-Chin said. Speaking about the palace Mr. Byung-Chin, but will the Duke be there for the entire time? Holyfield asks. Yes. Actually, he won't come out for the rest of the games no more after that incident at the tent. Byung-Chin confirmed. We need to protect him at all costs. Otherwise, our whole mission will fall apart. Holyfield said. Thankfully you accompanied the rest of my PMCs with you. They got all sorts of guns. I just need to sneak them into the palace and we should be good if they try to make a move. Byung-Chin gave his affirmative nod. Very well, as you say your reinforcements plus a company of marines will arrive at your location shortly. Be sure to make sure they get through, Holyfield said. As for everyone else, Embassy and also Jodent's mansion, when I call your squad. Names proceed accordingly to your assigned rally point then deploy immediately, Holyfield ordered. Agent Desardt, promptly now that the briefing of this crisis has been done, cut off Spiongchin's connection now that it has been concluded. For the Aparo Corpo, who has been sipping wine and charming everyone in the Ducal Palace with his charismatic voice and sharp suit styled with a stylish purple silk scarf, it made him for the first time in Gleesia feel spooked. Talking the ways of a salesman was like breathing to Robert, always relying on the muscle of his contractors in case something goes pear-shaped. However, the real threat of him getting skewered by dozens of swords made him weak in the knees as he wiped off the cold sweat off of his wrinkled forehead. Oh dear, my new friend Sir B. Yankin, do you seem to be already tired? Is the party too much for you now? Tilda Duke the Bolt walked up to him. His mouth was drunk with wine and his belly bloated with glutinous indigestion. The rest of the decadent court was as equally enthralled by the festivities of food, drink, song, dance, and spectacle. A perfect opportunity for something horribly wrong to happen to all of them. Fighting back his dulled senses, Byung-Chin forced up a smile. It was time for a little bit of subterfuge. My lord, if I may, remind you about our little deal? The contracts and materials you wish to pay and receive for our services? Bobby asked. Indeed, a plot of land for your people to do you gold magic with. I have to say if this indeed works through, Suville could be making more money than Athilan and Harren points together. I can't wait to tell my chief tax collector, Greski Jodent that we now can solve many of our ducat problems now. 
The Duke optimistically slapped his hand on Bobby's shoulder. Yes, may I have a word with you? Also, your captain of the guard and any of your still sober officials to come with me in private. Something is wrong, Byung-chin said. Oh? What is it? The Duke's cheerful face soured into concern. Something that could destroy this deal before it could even be put into ink. Please take me somewhere private. I will explain everything there. It's about your dearest cousin, Klovich, Byung-chin requested. The Duke, always eager to make more money and always loved his cousins in the Rian family agreed. Gathering what strength and mental cognizance left, he gathered several of his still mostly sober officials and his oblivious but ultimately abstained ducal guards from the knights errant including the captain himself to follow him to the palace's study room which was off limits to the guests. Placing everyone haphazardly at a chair by a large table in the middle of the study, Byung-chin closed the door and ordered his personal retinue of contractors and several ducal guards to keep watch and wait for more soldiers. There is still one more part of the plan that he needs to secure the duke's eternal favor. The dice is cast as he could hear the echoes of a super osprey chopping its wings towards the ducal palace carrying within it. A para mercenaries and Yafif soldiers armed to the teeth for a fight, but aside from their machine guns, assault rifles, and cybernetic upgrades, their greatest weapon, mightier than any of the youth's arsenal was held by one suited Aparo employee. He carried with him, a briefcase. It was the letter that Crockett took out from his assailant that damns the chief tax collector and the Eth Island Embassy of Conspiracy, a conspiracy to commit treason. Dash. Calorial may embrace you in her twilight, Ambassador Thelanil prayed to the goddess of the moon for the Cephidliad agent Marxian. The patron deity of the Cephidliad, Calorial the pearl maiden of the moon is known to be reserved and secretive who when she speaks she is always known to say the right words is an entity favored by those whose jobs require diplomacy or subtlety such as the nature of the Cephidliad when it comes to espionage and diplomacy for it was their duty. Thelanil busied himself by fixing the collar of his stimulating mint cloak with golden designs of vine leaves branching out around his body while he anxiously cycled through all of the day's events, yet one concern stood out from all the party planning and conversation with the local fire and nobles of Souville. His collusion with Gresky Jodent was orchestrated with the help of Marxian. He had a productive albeit distressing discussion of what happened to the rest of the Cephid Liad who were deployed to Souville. They were originally supposed to be dispatched to reach Tyrian but the circumstances of the other world as coming to Souville first before they barely got off the boat forced them to change plans. They needed to discredit these Uafir from seducing the frivolous Duke Thibault or else the demons would take away a strategically important harbour for both the youth and the Entente. The first attempt was to exploit local superstitions with the form of a few weather manipulations in the form of a storm and the cause of accidents by disabling the lighthouse in Old Souville Harbour. The plan went well for only one day until they were somehow discovered by the other worlders. From the survivors' accounts, it was a massacre with few survivors, especially some of Eth Island's best mages who specialized in hydra manipulation were killed. The second attempt to discredit the other worlders was in the Corsiad themselves. With some bribery and a few subtle nods, the ambassador and the surviving Sephiliad tried to stretch the rules and in one attempt to expose the demons in front of all of the festival goers. However, it failed in the worst possible way it could fail. The elves were seen as the malevolent forces and the other worlders as the heroes of the games. The third time was more a desperate measure than anything else. The surviving elven spies decided to disguise themselves as servants being staffed by the duke for his feast at his personal tent but it was foiled. However, it did expose one of the demons to be able to use magic in an effort to protect themselves and their quarry the duke, yet it was strategically and tactically a failure for the demons were unscathed. The duke condemning his assailants and Marxian being the last survivor of the dispatched Cephid Liad from the homeland. They had one card left to play, it was the most conspicuous but the most straightforward. 
They will attempt a coup. Jodent will provide insider access to the palace with the help of some guards and servants plus a significant amount of funding to be used to pay off several Grey Order adventurers he can muster under the promise of riches and titles. The embassy's role in this is the other half of the financing of their muscle, the adventurers to act for one part. The elves' other role is what will happen after the coup. With their influence in the Imperial Slay Aegean court, they can legitimize Greski Jodent's role as the new Duke of Suville after forging up some documents detailing the Duke's corruption and the dealings with the other worlders. Subtlety will have to be used for now until the Empire and the Entente can muster enough strength to properly march to Tyrion and expel the demon menace. But for now, they need to go into damage control. Deny the enemy to gather its strength while giving time for them to do it themselves. He had heard rumors of a chosen one being selected back in Herring Point weeks prior and according to what he got from Imperial messengers. The Emperor is planning to invest heavily in this one man that the Sacred Crystal Heart chose to. Right now, they are still planning out what exactly will this chosen one will do next after everything has been prepared. Jodent's seize of power should be enough political clout to have him forcefully expel the other world as quietly from Suviel without causing too much panic during the festivities. There were several nobles who will support him but can't do it openly lest they be stripped of their titles provided by the Duke. The adventurers and Jodent's men will storm the palace and arrest Duke the Balt and this one Serbi Yankin under the cover of the festivities at around midnight and stop the other worlders' provocative push deep into the Empire's homeland. If the promise of monetary reward wasn't enough. The attainment of titles such as the coveted knighthood which means to your average Grey Order adventurer as a permanent source of honor and livelihood with benefits ranging from exclusive contracts not available to commoners and even some noblemen, several off-the-list privileges that shops across the empire can provide for knights, to a steady income for themselves and their families for the rest of their time. All for the price of an attempt to commit treason. Yet some of the volunteers who quietly nodded to the compensation that is proportional to the risks involved that the slaying of evil aligned creatures was just as a bountiful bonus as being set for life. Marxian was sent off to observe the send-off of the paid-off adventurers that Greski promised will number by the hundreds for this endeavor before personally meeting up with Jodent at his villa so he can be sent off to Herring Point and report to Lindis, the Sephid Liad spymaster assigned by the one true king of the elves to merge with the rest of them there. The door magically locked itself with an enchantment meant to keep out non-elves or virtually anyone unwelcome out of the embassy tonight. Was their night as all the Ethylan elves gathered around the embassy to celebrate the Corsiad. There was a slightly somber air from the disappointed participants that contrasted the smells of honeyed cheeses, elven wine, provided courtesy of Zartruk and his Tavai, and some music. The ambassador helped himself to the assortment of treats laid before him as he celebrated a with a toast to all of the attendees of his little party. Tonight shall be the night that they will celebrate that they will not make the same mistakes their forefathers had made on allowing the demons to fester in their own world unchecked. Dash. Let them through. They are with me, Bianchin told the Suveli sentry guarding the door. The Super Osprey landed quietly at the Duke's gardens at an unoccupied part of the palace. Sentries stationed there recognized the soldiers as being the same cut of Bianchin's retinue but were more numerous than they count and grew concerned when the armed men escorted a man dressed similarly to Bianchin but instead of a cherry face he had a look of impatient conviction at the guards. He and the men of the Superospri were stopped by the knights who were alarmed of the metal beast that flew so quietly yet daringly to the ducal palace. They can feel the Osprey's wing beating tremble to the rhythm of their ornate steel armor. It took Bobby to send out a representative of his own retinue to clear up their emergent arrival. Yet even then, they only barely were allowed through as the watchful eyes of the palace guards scanned them for any heinous moves. The Apara Mercs and the Ufif Marines practiced restraint as they knew that the guards are only doing their jobs and this crisis was an emergency. Yet emergencies require urgency which the guards did not permit to allow. Thus, 
creating a tense situation of impatient youth and anxious palace guards staring down at each other. The only reason the alarm wasn't raised is because of the innate trust Byung-chin implanted at the Duke plus the slight familiarity of Byung-chin's chosen private military contractors. Their hearts pounded restlessly as a contingent of Apara Merxes courted the sweet man into the palace quietly careful not to alarm the guests. Byung-chin had the insight when people were less reluctant to talk to the Aparo Corpo when his guards were standing idly by his side with their tall frame, their intimidating rifles and alloy-plated body armor in an amalgamated geometry the likes of which no blacksmith had the expertise to replicate such an alien appearance. They passed by the fresco interiors and stylistic walls of the Tuscan-like home of the Bolt, seeing exotic goods from all over Gleesia collected into one building. It was like a museum. Every room a differing style, region or stimulation awaited, but like many museums it was a complicated labyrinth. Every moment they stepped foot at a room that wasn't where Duke and Byung-chin is standing is a drop of sand falling shorter down their invisible timer. There was virtually no time to lose once the entourage made their way to the same study room Bobby dragged the Duke and his block into, knocking on the door and confirming their presence. Byung-chin opened the door and let his subordinate into the secure building. Finally, get in, get in. Byung-chin ushered. You need to tell me right now how is this all happening? Why in the heavens and God's name are there suddenly more men coming here than your promised retinue 10? You promised you will only need 10 bodyguards. That is obviously over there more than 10 in that. He, Lee, cop, tur of yours? The guard captain walked towards Byung-chin for an explanation. You won't believe me if I say it. Letter. Byung-chin ordered the Aparo employee with the briefcase to open it. With a flick of a switch and a quick gesture, Byung-chin handed the guard captain the incriminating letter. The captain grabbed the letter and began to examine it, his head moving down to each letter of every little juicy tidbit of conspiracy the letter contained. The writing was eloquent as a nobleman should, but his words, masked with the honeyed handwriting was poison to his eyes. His heart sank as he darted towards Byung-chin as anxious sweat fell down on him from his heart's dwindling disbelief. The letter stated that Gresky Jodent's appointment by the Duke himself decades before thanks to the manipulations of the Emperor with approval of the Emperor to keep Suville in state of economic stagnation. All of the parties and festivals would cause an inflation effect on price tags in Suville which would be a reason to pass several burdensome taxes and tariffs which Jodent is in charge of setting. The bread and circuses of Suville famous across the land for a celebration once every moon was used both as a clever distraction from the economic cutthroats of this results on Suville economically stagnant and decadent as local commoners struggle to make by at best or fall short like Sanjilf at worst, tainting a great tyranny of Suville's reputation being the pearl of the Dragatoy Eyes coast. Suville was meant to be a cash cow for the empire to suck its teeth with and it was no wonder that pirates and smugglers such as Zartrix Tava and all sorts of brigands seemed to keep the knights errants so busy from the real danger into their cities, but with the arrival of the United Federation, the conspiracy to turn Suville into an overpriced piece of land that quagmires whoever holds the deed off was forced to expose itself to defend their interests. It was high time for Jodent to take direct control of the whole duchy and become the Duke of Suville by force. The Sephid Liad's role on this was the sabotage of the old Suvelli lighthouse stationed at the harbour which the captain oversaw the investigation of once the storm formed by the other elves were cleared off. The overall plan was to create a diversion for the adventurers to storm into the castle and arrest or kill Duke the Bolt whilst his congregation eyes were turned away. They will then use Eth Island support to help legitimize Jodent's claim to the throne on the grounds of mental instability on the Bolt. To finally seal the deal, the newly appointed Duke Gresky would make amends to permanently usurp the growing centralized law enforcement group the knights errant for the bureaucratic and mercenary-like Grey Order. Essentially, they are going to replace what is essentially a precursor to a formalized police force to the Acquisitive Adventurers Guild. But most damning of all was a Grey Order wax seal written right at the bottom right of the note, 
It detailed a promissory compensation for participation with promotions of rank or the covetous knighthood which the Duke will promise to give once he has been set up in power. A coup by Jodent, that's preposterous, the guard captain couldn't believe what his eyes read. Think about it. You told me that this Jodent person has all of Suviel at the palm of his hands with the control of money. The way I did the deal was going to shatter his monopoly on all businesses here when I move in with my own banking system. I wanted to work with him, come up with something that would benefit us both but he shows his true colors. Byung-Chin reasoned. Funny enough, the corpo knew he was lying off the benefiting us both part with that Jodent fellow. He never had any plans to let Jodent's business dealings see the light of day once he moved in. The illusion of prosperity in Suviel was just that, an illusion made by him when he strangled so many businesses with debt. Like any mega corporation, there was only two things that remained sure, death and taxes. If someone was going to eat up all the wonderful assets in Suviel it would be a paro corp. Debt is just a liability that needs to be quashed for its stifles potential, and stunted growth is synonymous with the luxury of time that a para corporation has little off. Their lobbying within their contacts in the government and head start in Gleesia won't last forever. Byung-Chin did have to admit, though he never played too close attention to it that the prices in Suviel were significantly more spiked than Tyrian but he shot it off at first as just supply and demand. But now that he thought of it, the extortionist taxes on so many merchants looking to use one of the most strategically important ports in Zanigrad, the contrasting economic disparity between old Suviel filled with commoners and barely middle class to new Suviel where all the affluent live is a recipe for a house of cards to collapse. It reminded him of the curious case of the fall of similar prosperous semi-independent port cities such as Hong Kong, Singapore and Monaco. He got to admit, just studying Jodent's avaricious control of Suviel's economy reminded him of home back at Kesselheim. Unlike Apara Corporation's rivals, he had the disadvantage of low technology and the inexperience of classical survival of the fittest competition. Bobby had dealt or participated in several corporate takedowns and hostile takeovers and know just what to do to ruin him. He almost felt bad for him. But then again, now Apara Corporation knows what kind of territory they are moving into. With a few briefcase diplomacy with the Common State Party and the Terrence Central Bank, Byung-Chin should be confident in getting Suviel out of the California housing trap before its jaws could bite everyone in it. I knew the tax collector was ambitious in seeing Suviel becoming the richest duchy in all of the empire but I never knew he would resort to treason to the man who gave him the duty of collecting the taxes of all of the trade that comes and goes. The captain said, it's not just treason, but economic, I mean, attempted, economic sabotage. This man was making everything more expensive, don't you realize it? The bread you eat, the wine you drink. The parties you throw, Byung-Chin reminded. I, I, this, this is, my, home, and, he made me lose, my old estate, the guard captain lamented. Byung-Chin heard of the story that from the duke during his foray in the palace, the guard captain used to own a large estate but Jodent Bank foreclosed it. He had to crawl his knighthood status to the position of guard captain to re-establish his old position pre-estate foreclosure. Bobby can see in the gnashing of the captain's teeth that it was now personal to him. I must inform the duke of this treachery at once. The captain huffed. No don't. We can't cause a panic. We'll cause more problems. Byung-Chin stopped the captain from moving. I provide solutions. I really do. Now listen here. I will need the help of some guards for this to work. The coup plotters will likely storm the palace when everyone is distracted. You know any idea when it can happen? Byung-Chin asked. The show. They will strike during the show. The captain exclaimed. What show? Byung-Chin asked. I hired an illusionist and pyromancer to perform a show as the final act of the night. They're quite a parade. Twins they are and came all the way from the east to perform here. The duke said. Focus. So. This show. It's some sort of lights show, am I hearing it right? Bobby asked grabbing the captain and turning his gaze back to him. Yes, we need to have the lanterns in the western gate to be dimmed so we can magnify the, 
the western gate. The captain's cogs ignited upon the realization. Damn. Now I see what they are up to. Byung Chin placed his hands on his hips. The thread has been spotted but now there is little time to stop the spark from reaching the dynamite. Where are most of the guards right now? Byung Chin asked. The sentries are at their stations by the walls as they should be. But the rest of the guards are all at the show protecting all of the guests during the performance. There's only me and ten other knights here to protect the duke personally. The captain said. All right. Here is the plan. The Duke must not be at the show or at least not directly to it. Take him somewhere safe and lock the place down until I give you the coast is clear. You can take some of my men with you, Byung Chin said. The birthing chamber. It hasn't been in use for years and there is only one way in. The captain said. All right, Bernard, Santa Maria, Donovan, and Cape Walkin. Follow him. Byung Chin ordered four of his mercenaries. The captain nodded. With a few gestures, the captain was assigned a small unit of four mercenaries to accompany him and the duke to the safe place. We need to alert the western gate guards immediately. The captain added, don't bother, Byung Chin said as he cocked his pistol that he keeps for self-defense. Your men are already dead or in on it, he forewarned. The duke grabbed the letter from his captain's hand, still not yet fully believing one of his own trustees betrayed him. But as he and several of his loyal officials read through the incriminating letter, their disbelief turned into absolute revulsion that had gradually grew every character and word the letter states of the chief tax collector's treachery. Jodent, may the gods damn you for all of your life. I thought you are my friend. How could you? How could he? The Duke wailed. Guards, seize him and, seize the embassy and the Grey Order office immediately. I will report this matter to the Emperor. The duke ordered. I am afraid you can't do that. Byung Chin stopped the duke. You're just going to get your soldiers killed. The adventurers outnumber your men and not to mention the elves are powerful magic users too. So let us handle this. Byung Chin asked. You have blessing then Sir Byung Chin. Get rid of these traitors. Destroy them all. The duke furiously shouted. His face red and his overbearing feet stomped lightly on the palace's marble floor. I will. I assure you, Byung Chin vowed. The plan now unraveled, the contracted gunmen were now itching for a fight as they were caroused to a vigilant frenzy as they made their way west of the palace. To the march of their feet they jogged with hurried pace, careful to avoid the crowds of party goers hurrying west with them to the show. After a few minutes that had felt longer than it should, the mercenaries arrived. The western gate area of the ducal palace was another garden for the duke containing tall and thick fauna which if one doesn't refer to a map and at the time of our alight, one can be easily lost in the garden. It was like a labyrinth, and with the light dimmed, it would require a torch to lead the way through and through. Quietly inserting themselves into the maze the combined PMC and Jufifunk forces through an echolocation scanner linked up to Isaac to give the earthlings an accurate depiction of the whole area. Some pulled down from their heads googles that allowed them to see through the dark. Whilst other groups used flashlights, it was now a search and destroy mission. Meanwhile, the captain had quickly alerted his subordinates of the possible threat but also to not cause a panic. They must cancel the post-show reception and have everyone that does not belong in the palace to show into the door and be bid a good night. He also informed his messengers to alert all knights errant in the duchy to be on immediate alarm for any insurrections within key areas of the duchy. He knew that he can still trust them all due to working with them all for years highly loyal to their homelands and centralized through his command. They had worked together to keep Suville safe for years with a sense of justice, upholding the law and protecting the innocent from all sorts of catastrophes that wished to do harm. It was a proposal that he had made that was approved by the Duke to make an independent body, fueled not through the miserly fees of adventurers from the Grey Order but through the ducal taxes of hard-working Suvelli a force of the finest men to become the shield that protects their homes. Although the performance could be easily heard from atop the palatial castle, neither the duke nor the captain and the rest of the bodyguards were in no mood to enjoy it. For all of that, all that the duke could do as he looked onto his palace from the window of the dusty, rustic and cobwebbed birthing chamber was to pray that he may live to see the next sunrise. Even the captain, 
loyal beyond compare to the ducal family, too shared in with his disposition as the Apara mercenaries and Yafif marines began to sweep into the western gardens of the palace. Be advised all personnel, all signatures within the western guard area are considered hostile, fire at will, Isaac said. Isaac, how many tangos do we got? One of the marines asked. Scanning. Complete. I detected 253 unknowns coming into the western gate. More of them are coming inside by the minute. Isaac respond. It confirmed their worst fears. The gate was open and now intruders are infiltrating the palace premises. But not only that, but more are coming in by every moment that gate continues to stay accessible to the Edacious Grey Order. I see, me and the mercs will get up to the wall and see to it that we can close the gate that should stop them. While we do that, your marines will sweep up anything on the ground. Try to keep this quiet as much as possible. Not all of us have silences, Byung-Chin said. The soldiers nodded. Meanwhile, the ducal court watched in amazement the spectacle of lights shown to them. The pyromancer and the illusionist, a respective duo of twin brother and sister, razzled and dazzled the crowd with mythical beasts flying to the visual and audio rhythm of properly timed fireworks and bardic melodies that reverberated on the amphitheatre that it could easily cloud any other sounds within the near vicinity. Watching over them is the vigilant captain of the guard himself and a contingent of his most trustworthy knights surrounding the perimeter. Augmenting them was a rear guard of several PMCs hired by a para corporation that Byung-Chin ordered to be the fallback group in case more of the coup plotters come in another direction that they couldn't uncover. Contact, 12 hostiles. Small arms, nothing special. A marine quietly said on his radio. Affirmative stiletto 3 to 1, neutralize immediately. Isaac nodded in his robotic voice. Shots were fired. From both the magical hands of the pyromancer exploding a wall of flame that enraptured the ears of the amazed Suvali noble court and the firing of 5.56 mm rounds onto the bodies of the Grey Order adventurers. They never had the time to even notice what had happened. They were all so confident of their nightly infiltration that they never foresaw the possibility that they these hunters becoming the prey. Yet as soon as the marines' laser sights met their bodies, they were doomed. Targets neutralize, the marine said. I see more, I got about twenty or thirty of them standing there. A mercenary added, he saw several more of the adventurers doing a final check of their gear. Weapons were sharpened. Armor was fastened and arcane preparations were being ready for the adventurers who sat idly by the grassy and stone walkway. Under the cover of darkness, the mercenaries got into firing positions. Their guns' tack light hovered over them menacingly as they took aim. One of the adventurers noticed the strange light on his companion's body and turned around to its source. He only caught a glimpse of the dark shadows of the youth soldiers before they squeezed the triggers. Firing, firing. The Merc ordered. Their guns ignited as the unready adventurers were caught defenseless from the PMC ambush. Some tried to unsheath their blades with the rattling of scabbards. Others tried to scream, but all were masked by the timely intervention of rifle fire and the great rapid striking of a large orchestral drum. Climbing up the wall now. Damn. They didn't even see what's coming. Byung-Chin gagged. Bodies of palace guards littered the hallway as several Grey Order adventurers kept watch of both sides of the wall to see their colleagues pouring through the opening. Their deduction was on point. They are all coming from the western gate. Byung-Chin ordered the dispatching of these tangos who were quickly knifed down quietly by his accompanying mercs as they tried to maintain the element of subtlety. They made their way towards the gatehouse passing by more palace corpses before they saw the gate's portcullis. We are closing in on them. Damn, there's a lot of them. They're just pouring in on the place. A marine commented. Before the ground team's eyes was a mass gathering of Grey Order adventurers. They were lined up being inspected by several professional-looking soldiers. No doubt also participating in this conspiracy too. The large courtyard by the gate housed several dozens or even close to more than a hundred of people, to some people's humor. It was like they just stumbled upon a medieval fantasy convention. 
they saw several warriors, mages, rangers and all other sorts of folks of many races and cultures gathered together in this very spot as their paymasters rallied them for their assault. Elves, humans, dwarves, beast people for example were all quietly anxiously waiting for their strength to reach the critical mass needed to penetrate the ducal palace by their sheer numbers. They easily outnumber both them and the palace guards combined. I am not taking another step until I see another piece of coin. One adventure said he began to form a makeshift union of his own colleagues that surrounded one of Jodent's cronies. Once the scouting parties have finished clearing out the rest of the gardens, we can proceed, one of Jodent's personal guards who is helping to oversee the takeover said. His orders were simple, ensure the main bulk of their army. The adventurers are organized into an effective fighting force that will pierce through the duke's palatial guards. Once the duke has been either taken in chains or his corpse laying on the floor, he will immediately message his master Greski Joden to move in and make his announcement to the duchy who by then would start to get hints that something wasn't right with the sudden change of guard uniforms from the golden glint of the knights errant to the grey, black, and red of the Slay Aegean Legion. Just one coin or I will go back, the avaricious adventurer demanded. His arms crossed and following suit, other indigent adventurers crossed their arms too. By the Jodent underling's intuition, they will not take another step in committing such a perilous undertaking lest they receive more hopes for compensation. They had just barely gotten through the loyalists to the Duke with the ones in the tower who put up a fight but weren't able to alert the entire palace of the attack. But even then, monsters and bandits were one thing, a political coup was an entirely different matter altogether for the average Grey Order guildsman. With a unified action stacked against him, the underling relented and opened his bag. There were several high-valued ducat denominations ranging from copper, silver, gold, and platinum. He dug through as many of the silver and gold coins as he could from his little coverage bag and dropped a single gold coin to each of the unionized adventurers in front of him. Now properly motivated again, the adventurers began to calm down and were now casually talking to each other on what their plans after they finish this quest whilst they prepare their weapons. After this quest is done, I can't wait to finally retire in luxury. No more struggling for my next meal and risking my life out there shooting out monsters. A human ranger smiled as he observed the coin, he received knowing full well there's more where that came from. A dwarven knight? I wonder how that will work. Back home, the closest I know is a huskarl. A dwarven fighter asked one of his colleagues, I guess so, but knights have their own land too. Besides, when I get my own home and drank, I can't wait to see the look at all of my tribe's faces when I come back with my own horse and title, a Dawson Wolf warrior boastfully said. Oh, oh, oh. How I will sing that we all slew the demons in Suville today, perhaps with the ducats I have, I can finally sweep that cute lass from the tavern off her feet and onto my lap. A human bard playfully and melodically worded. But as they conversed each other their plans afterwards, a voice was heard from above them. Well, well, quite a fine day for a masquerade, but aren't you a bit too much on the heavy side with those little props of yours? Bianchin chided. The Grey Order looked up to see the corpo, in his corpulent two-piece suit standing pompously above the gate tower with his hands on his hips. Who are you? One of the adventurers catechized in a demanding voice. You may not have met me. But you already know me I assume, Bobby smiled. I am the one you call, Byung-chin. He introduced himself. The corpo's voice was amplified thanks to a drone with a loudspeaker connected to a small microphone attached to his mouth. He had used the said drone as a sort of novelty demonstration to the Duke's court earlier to showcase the many products a Para Corporation could produce that they could enjoy. He never knew he would use it however in such a confrontational way right now. The adventurers, meanwhile panicked, their hairs were raised by the earshot entrance of their quarry revealing himself. Many of them drew their swords while some shook their knees with fear. Their element of surprise, now dashed away like the cool summer night winds breezing by for their quarry now stood before them. It's the demon, he. They know we are here, one adventurer cried, 
those of the more experienced of their pack steal themselves after the initial shock. They correctly realize they may not need to go through the trouble of finding their quarry amongst the rubble they will throw in the palace for the demon Alpha himself presented himself before them. Calm down yourself demons. So, we smite you off of our world forever. A cleric challenged. Oh, you caught me. Byung-Chin playfully leaned back in an act of stupor. I am not truly a fighting kind of demon. He teased. Ha, huh? you are a coward. All you do is lie. But when cornered you will try to run. An adventurer pointed out mockingly. You're just another greedy demon looking for an easy meal. The cleric raised his fist. Liar? No, for I admit I am greedy. That is my job. Byung Chin confessed. Bobby saw the shadows of his men take position quietly behind all of the adventurers as their gaze was all directed towards him. It made the corpus smile softly with devious amusement. For the adventurers many of them were beginning to feel unnerved by the corpus' continued presence before them. From the legends, demons were powerful abominations who can wipe out dozens of warriors with a swipe of their claws. Yet the demon, Biankin before them wasn't trying to initiate any form of attack. I have to admit, I commend you for your willingness for this job. I have that fire do you know? I fight for profit. You fight for profit, the difference being of methods. Byung Chin poured out his heart. The money is meaningless for the sight of your foul kind being purged. I will gladly fight and die knowing I made a difference against you. The cleric said, a martyr, my complete opposite. Byung Chin laughed before he started clapping his hands. Congratulations. Finally, someone different. And I thought everyone here is just in it for the money. Silence demon. If you won't come down then we will climb up there and cut your head off. A brave swordsman yelled defiantly. Oh, I am sorry. But this Armani won't look great with blood. Well, not mine. Yours actually. Byung Chin verbally shot them down before he nodded to one of his men for the signal. Suddenly. The darkness of the courtyard burst with illumination, as the adventurers saw their shadows bearing down in front of them. To their horror, there was light behind them, but as they turned around, they were blinded by the marines and the mercenaries' tactical lights being shone onto them. You know, one of the perks of my trade is that you can afford to have other people do the dirty work for you, Byung Chin smugly announced. The adventurers could barely see let alone take a stance against these newcomers who held these unusually luminous torches before them. To some of the more devout members of that congregation of Grey Order guildsmen, it reminded them of the tailor-made holy spells that clerics and priests of the light could wield against demons. Which is strange, given that the demon is using such an exclusive spell against them. So, let me ask you this question. Byung Chin took a deep breath. Is the money offered to you right now? really worth it? The gate is open before you. I'm being very generous here so choose. 10.9.8 He began to count down. Several of the adventurers realizing that the odds were now dramatically stacked against them decided to run towards the gate and not look back. Their eyes, now lastingly widened in horror at Bobby's intimidating aura. Yet the rest stood firm, or at least they could despite the fact the bright lights lazed on them means they couldn't even see their enemy. 1. Byung Chin gestured his hand down as the portcullis lowered down the gate, sealing it from the outside world. If we die here then we die as martyrs while you will be known as a coward. The cleric cursed. Oh, I am sorry, but in my experience, the opposite of a martyr, one who is willing to die for his beliefs is not a coward. Byung Chin lectured. The gunmen began to cock their guns and their fingers ready to squeeze their triggers. Cold sweat dripped down many of the Grey Order as they heard the soft sound of bullets being armed and loaded. Yet to them, it sounded like their magic was about to be unleashed. It's a zealot. One willing to kill for his beliefs. Byung Chin finished. And I believe you are bad for business. Dispose of them. He ordered. In the distance, he can hear the aforementioned show that the Duke was hosting now reaching its final act, the grand finale, where all of the spectacle roars out to the captivated crowd, a perfect mask for the most perfect murder, or in the world of corporate slang, this would be called a write-off. Open fire. One of the soldiers yelled. Their guns fired down upon the adventurers with lightning fury. Some tried to twitch their muscle to form a coherent means of attack or defense ranging from a valiant charge, 
a shield wall, a magical spell or a protective ward. Yet all of their efforts were no match for the velocity of a bullet as their bodies riddled, twitched and cut them into pieces. They tried to scream, but the loud fireworks, the thunderous applause and the rumbling of music blanketed their terror as their hopes, dreams, and aspirations of grandeur died with them. A macabre scene lay before Byongchen. Bodies of adventurers lay dead, their faces frozen in unbelieving horror as their bodies and every orifice natural or otherwise leaked their blood onto the floor, tainting the beautiful grounds with grotesque crimson that permeates the ground in an evidencing the great act of calamity beset by the leisurely indulgent people of Souville. As the soldiers walked towards the now blood-tarnished courtyard, finishing off anyone who somehow managed to survive the barrage of bullets. Byongchen sighed before he picked up a cigar. He carefully was saving it for a celebratory moment but originally meant for the time the Duke would sign all the binding and cooperative papers he will receive once he manages to have him accept Aparo's and the youth's hand of friendship through him. But right now, he needed a smoke. Lighting up the cigar with his lighter he observed the soldiers below him sweep through the dead bodies of the adventurers, finishing off anyone who so even twitched. It was a mercy for them for what little mercy they would give if they hadn't stopped them. Sir, all targets neutralized one of his mercs radioed Bobby. Tell our rear guard and the captain that all threats are neutralized. Send in some of his men too, Bobby answered. Affirmative sir. But what about the bodies? The merc asked. Make a call. We need some trucks, a shitload of shovels and a large clearing. Don't start until the Duke sees this first I want this place spotless by sunrise. Dismiss, Byongchen ordered. The Merc saluted again before he left for his assignments. The Corpo lowered his burning cigar while reached into his pocket for his phone. He needed to make some calls now that he did his part. Raven Company, Citrep, Byongchen called. All youth citizens have been either evacuated or under our total protection sir. The commander of Raven Company, one of the PMC groups hired by Aparo Corp to take into a tour of duty in Gleesia. They were one of the soldiers assigned to either evacuate or if impossible, lock down and protect any youth civilians in attendance of the Corsi ad. The civilians were spread into pockets throughout hotspots in the city, thanks to the warnings courtesy of Colonel Polonsky's emergency broadcast systems into their smartphones. The civilians were well informed of the dire situation that they were in. Any incidents? Byongchen asked. Got reports of several attacks but no casualties. For us of course. Local guards dealt with the rest. The command reassured. Perfect. Await extraction and then be ready for a debrief. Your payroll should be wired to your accounts by the morning. Byongchen informed. Thank you for being here in such short notice. He dropped the call and then immediately afterward, Byongchen dialed another number. Major, it is done. I think we will need a cleanup crew by the palace now. Sends some engineers, especially the ones with a strong stomach. He informed Major Holyfield. Excellent work. Holyfield replied, I will clean up this mess and then debrief with the Duke and his captain afterward. I can take care of everything here. You will have your men back before sunset. I see. Good. Well, as for the rest of my men, they are moving into the Jodent estate outside of town. He won't last long. Holyfield said. Good. Bobby out. Byongchen dropped the call. Yet there was one more person he needed to contact tonight. He screened through his library of contacts until he found the last person he needed to call. It was Diaz. Hey, what is it now? Change of plans? Diaz answered as he picked up his phone. His voice was in a whispered convulsion of one who was originally in. No, everything is according to plan, but the mess is gonna be a shit show to work with. You? Byongchen replied. About to get into the embassy. Aliathra. You got that lock? Right? A moment beat off from the phone's audio of muffled audio could be heard from the background. Remember Diaz, you are just there to talk. Let the elf do all the talking. Make sure she doesn't get killed. He reminded him. I know. Hey, Ailey. Yes. Finally, Bobby, gotta go dark now. I am about to commit diplomatic impunity. Diaz cheerfully smiled as he dropped the call. Chapter 34, The Counter Coup Part 2. Cocking Ruiner. 
Diaz gestured his accompanying cortege of PMCs under a paro payroll into the front door of the embassy. The door was enchanted with a protective force field that only elves could pass through. Anyone else, and the force field would as it would often be programmed to be, repulse any intrusion attempts back with a non-lethal but very discouraging bolt of shock to the trespasser. This was a normal security measure for elves when they want to restrict access to certain areas back in Alphalnora. Thankfully Aliathra, who had experience creating such locks knows how to reverse it. It took several tense minutes of blending within plain sight of the crowds of festival goers for Diaz and the rest of his allies to await the elf's unlocking process. The embassy itself sat in contrast with the rest of the architecture of Old Souville. While the surrounding buildings were of unpainted wood and plastered brick, the elven embassy, about two stories high with immaculate architecture and aestheticism, it had no creases nor any gaps in between the fine details of the building as if the building erupted from the ground in its splendid form during construction. The embassy was also sporting a palette of gold, white, green and blue shades of the ethylene entente's colors that meshed together in strokes that invited inspiration with delicate flora, fearsome elven weaponry and majestic elven artistic refinement for all the rest form up. Diaz commanded. Piling up behind Aliathra, Diaz and the rest of the mercenaries checked their weapons and did a last-minute examination of their target. Judging by the sounds of the party, they know where the all-important ambassador, Thelanil by his name as given by Aliathra. After undoing the magical force field, Aliathra could only freeze in thought as she stared blankly at the embassy's doorknob with her hand out of reach except if she stretched out a few inches further. She began to think again of what brought her here in the first place. She turned the knob of the embassy door and pushed through. Yet her nerves tensed around her and her heart skipped a beat every step she took in the embassy alongside her companions. For the Apara Mercs, their first time seeing the cultural enclave of elven representations was quite a rejuvenating experience when they passed by the embassy's interior. Based on Diaz's experience in walking around Kesselheim, a melting pot in its own right, he can distinguish of style liberty, the Italian variant of At Nouveau, a popular style dating back to the early 20th century and has still been one for artsy hipsters and his trifiles born in the wrong century. He can observe two key distinctions, the structural and floral patterns on the furnishings upon first glance and along the frescoes that covered the walls. The second figure was far more subtle and it takes a keen eye to notice that all of these items found were of artisanal quality, made by hand yet also each furnishing is anatomically one of a kind from each other, as if the whole building doubled not only as a diplomatic outpost but also an art gallery. Hey, Ailey, what's that over there? Diaz asked. He pointed to a fresco with an azure view of an elven city across a great blue bay. A silvery sun could be seen rising upwards to heaven from the sky, its illumination beamed downwards on the city. My home, Ethylon, Sir Diaz. Aliathra answered. If my people don't take heed, then I am afraid you and I won't be able to see it. The elf whimpered. Alongside Diaz and their accompanying mercenaries, they walked quietly towards the celebratory cheers of Elven Regale. By Elven Law. She is a criminal entering the mouth of a beast. Word of her corruption should be known by now by all of the royal family and the Sephid Liad. Her heart and her legs, that she had covered in a thick pair of jeans and shoes provided by the youth to disguise her obvious sign of corruption were of unnatural design. Yet deep down, she knew she was still the same elven princess. Aliathra third and the youngest child of King Arslan and Queen Elisun known to be selfless and attentive of the royal children. Being raised by her mother in the manners of proper elven maidenhood, trained by the best teachers across the world and patronizing through the tenet scriptures of the maternal goddess of life's words and her spell craft. All of her memories were intact and she still held on to those years of her cultivation into the maiden she is today. Yet deep down, she held an inner apprehension about how will the rest of her kind would say? She hadn't dare show her face in front of another elf since the time she was chased off of Vercourt. There would be many prominent elves appearing inside that embassy that night. 
some of whom she likely had known during her years. She had before in her days of youth, presented herself as the quintessential elven maiden only rivaling her sister Ithiel in values of grace, duty, and filial piety. Aliathra needed to speak to them, tell them, that their fears that they let themselves be taken over by, shouldn't be the case. The youth. These people weren't the demons of the old legends. She needed to clear her name and hope they see what she sees. But yet, she feared the one thing that could happen, if they still believe she is only trying to corrupt them into the service of these demons. She partly hated what she had become, yet despite her mechanical heart, she had a contradictory high opinion on the state of medicine craft that the earthling have, not using magic but creating life from objects that do not. Aliathra, we ready, Diaz said. I, I. The elf hesitated, her hand once again frozen as she reached for the door. Hey, look Ailey, if you're not comfortable doing this, let me do the talking and just sit back behind one of us. Diaz reassured her. No, it's not that Sir Vincent. I need to do this. Aliathra rebooted herself from her self-loathing state. Mkai, but if things go south, I will protect you. Diaz smiled. Pray that it does not come to that. Aliathra requested. But hold back please. My people will likely react violently if they see you. Let me talk to them. Alone. Sure. Diaz said as he picked up an object from his pocket. When shit does go bad, I will toss this in. When you see it, close your eyes you got that? Diaz instructed as he held an explosive device on his hand. Judging by the sun-like symbol and decorative on its surface, Aliathra discerned it was what they call a flashbang. The elf nodded as she reached her hand forward to the door with Diaz and the rest of the Apara mercenaries holding back beside each of the door's left and right sides readying themselves for entry. With no turning back now, Aliathra opened the last door that lead to her final judgment. Ambassador Thelanil Aliathra said as she walked into the elven celebration, the party's opulent atmosphere of gossip, light snacking and music abruptly stopped as their eyes turned to the unexpected guests. At first, the ambassador thought it was a latecomer, but as he swims his way across to examine the graceful Ethylene accent worthy of a noble woman, his welcoming demeanor turned into shocked horror as what lay before him is the fugitive princess Aliathra Lytha, the youngest of the royal family standing in front of her. He recognized the elven maiden from his years mingling and touching the shoulders of the elven elites and catching glimpses and official ceremonial gazes of her back at the capital. He never knew he would be able to see her face to face and eye to eye. Under normal circumstances, everyone in the room would have bowed down to honor her presence but now is not. The elves began to whisper to each other in malicious slander over her circumstances, ranging from kidnapping, her corruption and double agency. Guards, the ambassador alarmed. Several of the embassy's detachment of elven swordsmen emerged and drew their weapons. Please, my lord, sir ambassador, I can explain everything about what had happened to me. Aliathra said, how can I trust you? Maybe you are just a shapeshifter demon taking to place of our beloved princess. Or perhaps you are indeed princess Aliathra but you have been corrupted to betray your people, your family and your nation? The ambassador accused. There is no need to fight ambassador. I can prove to you I am the real Aliathra if it means to reassure you. Aliathra pleaded. The crowd took pause, mostly haughtily awaiting what proof this Aliathra had to authenticate herself in front of them. You are Thalanil, ambassador of Suvil for fifty years. You once gave my father a rare 100 years vintage Hoop wine from this province on his 560th birthday. You danced with my sister on her 180th birthday there are at least 60 Ethelon spies within the Black Tree territories and Prince Clovich was our spy that helps us gather information about troop movements of the Stla Aegean Empire's Eastern Legions. Aliathra said, impressive, but that does not convince me still. Name one thing I have told you about, the ambassador challenged, not me, but my father told me this. Aliathra grinned. You actually hate your wife's singing you're too afraid to tell her that and you collect other animals' teeth for fun. She answered, the king actually told you that? 
the ambassador jumped out of his bodyguard's protective lines to walk towards the princess confrontationally. Yes, I was there in the send-off party for newly appointed ambassadors after my father announced that new trading policy about lifting some tariffs of our wine and bread. Aliathra said, you really are the princess but, how, what happened? The ambassador asked. All of the elven onlookers stared at her, in disbelief with their guards lowered, and their minds slowly being at ease as Ambassador Thelanil walked closer and tried to grab Aliathra's hand lightly. The elven princess hopes grew upwards as she had prayed for, don't touch her, a voice erupted from the crowd, Ledui Eriand, the princess turned to her direction, that is impossible. The reports from the Cephid Liad say that your heart was corrupted into metal, Eriand announced, pointing her sword at the princess. The whole party gasped in shock at the accusation. A metal heart? No one can create life from something without it. It was absolutely heretical and absurd to even think of something that Nenith handcrafted herself to make be made and copied from something that had no life. It may beat like one but it's not a true living heart, Eriand added. I can explain a Dewey Eriand, these people you call demons, they saved me, they don't even have any magic to begin with. Aliathra said, that is preposterous, how can they take down those land sharks so easily with their metal flying beasts, have only a single one of them defeat our very own warriors with his bare hands and killed Cephid Liad agents with their metal ones without much of the sweat in which all of that can be done without the help of extremely powerful magic. Not even the best boar girl can do all of that, Eriand argued. They don't need to. They have technology to match even the greatest of our sorceries. Aliathra answered. Technology? Ambassador Thelanil asked. Let me explain what they told me. These UFAE people from this world called IF, they can use technology to a the ability to create things to improve themselves in every aspect of one's lives. Your sword, this house and our clothes is made from technology. Aliathro explained, another pathetically blatant lie. You state that this otherworldly magic that they call technology is based on pure craftsmanship. No amount of pure craftsmanship can outperform elven magic. Eriand haughtily refused to consider. The guards and some of the more martial of the guests became even more tense, gripping their hands readying to unsheathe their weapons and spells soured the festive atmosphere. Aliathra was starting to crack under the pressure as she mustered whatever will she had left to appeal to try and attempt to get through her people's fears of the unknown. Please, everyone, what I am saying is true, the princess begged. Princess, if you are truly her, how can you say all of that? Where is the pride the most powerful and arcane race in all of Gleesia? Didn't your mother and further taught you about how we were blessed by the creator gods to guide the world? The ambassador contended. They are not of our world, they wish to only live in peace. I. I dot h hate to confess this to all of you. It but they showed me, technology, theirs, can do so many amazing things that not even magic can hope to achieve, my replacement heart and legs. They were made by them, Aliathra said, her noble high elven accent cracked as tears fell on her cheeks and her voice became hoarse with grief as everything. Her plan of a peaceful dialogue with her imprudent kin was falling apart all going wrong in the worst possible way for her as her naivete cracked under the pressure of the contemptuous scrutiny that elves are known for when it comes to the lower races. What? They even replaced your legs? The ambassador asked. His face dumbstruck. The elven princess sighed. She needed to tell her people of this now about what had happened to her. I lost my heart and legs due to some accidents I had before coming here and they saved my life when they could have easily left me for dead. They saved me by using their metal hearts and legs they created to make me whole again. She explained. Please, you have to believe me. The room fell quiet after they heard Aliathra's side of the story. For a moment, Aliathra thought she had finally managed to get through with her kinsmen as they all brought themselves into the expression of deep thought, reserving their emotions back. No, Thelanil said. Pardon? Aliathra asked. You hear me demon? No, Thelanil frowned. What do you mean no? Aliathra asked. 
What you just said is blasphemy to both your fellow elves and Nenith herself that you had vowed to serve. How dare you allow them, those? Those things do that to you. You just show that you have been corrupted beyond salvation. Thelanil cursed. Aliathra felt her heart crash down to the depths of forlornness as if her heart was pierced with the cold blade of betrayal as the embassy guards closed to apprehend her. Nothing made by hand can compare to the flesh and blood gifted to us by Nenith. I am sorry princess. No. Apostate, you are too far gone now. May Nanith purify his tryout soul when you pass on. Your family will understand. The ambassador coldly proclaimed. Clear. Yelled Diaz as he threw his flashbang into the middle of the room. Breaking out of her tears, Aliathra realizing what is going to happen next, she quickly closed. Dear wet A's as the grenade illuminated the room in a blinding light. The other elves in the room were discombobulated with them reflexively covering their eyes and flailing about mindlessly across the room. Sometimes hitting each other, the party preparations or valuable pieces of art. Before the ambassador and the rest of the party goers realized it, Diaz and the rest of his men swarmed into the room with their guns drawn out as they spread themselves across the party room making sure their eyes and weapons pointed unwaveringly towards the elves. They were surrounded. Don't even flinch, one of the Apara mercenaries shouted. Just as Aliathra opened her eyes, she felt a strong force grab her. It was Diaz's red jacket. Stay behind me sweetie. Diaz smirked. He was pointing Ruina in front of the ambassador while he stood between Aliathra and himself. No, don't hurt him please. Aliathra pleaded to Diaz. SHH. Vincent hushed her. He then turned to address the ambassador with his gun held high. All right, Ailey just say everything that we did to her yet still. You want to kill her? You're even thicker than Arianne's thick butt over there. Diaz threw a flirty cheap shot at the elf woman who was his rival in the race. The speed demon? I should have known. You are her patron. Are you not? Arianne accused. Patron? Her? No. It's actually the other way around. I am her patron. He joked. But I digress, less about the princess and more of why she is here. I will say this once. We know. And you lost. Diaz said. Lost? Thelanil asked. His voice trembled upon Diaz's words. Make a move on the palace while a show is happening. Read that a mile away. Diaz said. Well. Go kill us all. You surround us but I will not give you the satisfaction of me dying in agony. The ambassador defiantly stood up. Oh, kill you know, me and Daliathra really think we come all this way to kill you? You elves, despite saying you are really smart, are actually pretty stupid. I would have killed you all and turned you into fish food before you could sing God bless the king. Diaz intimidated. Then why are you here? The ambassador asked. At first, I wanted this for my dear friend here Aliathra to just catch up with her friends here in this wonderful place you call an embassy. Have a snack, drink some wine, chit chat with you guys. But unfortunately, it seems you are being the party pooper here. So, we have to do this the hard way as we like to call it. Diaz explained. Aliathra is just your way through here I presume? No one could ever break through our protective wards unless it is another elf or an elven mage to break through it, the ambassador asked. Correct, Diaz admitted. You are using the princess to talk to us? Yet there is one thing I do not understand. Why are you here? Thelanil pushed. I am just paid to do this. Rough up some people who think they can try to punch us around but should know better such as you haughty pieces of shit. I mean... We did it save her life for crying out loud. The legs and the heart. Can't you see it that we don't want to be your enemy? Diaz argued. You are being paid? Is it just about the money for you? All of you? Eriand intervened. Not all the time. Sometimes it's about the sex. Diaz winked. Other times it is for the money. But other times it's about all the sexy money. Which is why I'm here to tell you that Suville will become territory for the Aparo Corporation. Which is really, really, big merchant guild for everyone here listening. Diaz said. Quit your lies demon. Arianne threateningly pointed her sword. Quit being such idiots. Aliathra is fine in every possible way. 
There's only two ways we can end this and I don't like where this one going at this rate. Diaz warned. You will not corrupt this land any further while I still stand. The ambassador spat, says the one who wants to have Jodent turn this whole place into a debt slave camp masking as some artsy uptown. Diaz replied sarcastically, Ambassador, I read the letter. Is that, are all of that true? Aliathra stood up and emerged from Diaz's back to confront Thelanil. When she read the letter of the Ethylent scheme to have Jodent bleed out every coffer of the humans off of their ducats to be given to the Empire and the Elves, she couldn't believe it, denying every aspect that her nation, the Ethylan Entente would be so venal and exploitative. She had always thought that the Entente was the leader of the Gleesia, the dominant nation who was given the heavenly degree to guide the younger races forward. Yet this plot of draining money off of the hands of the humans contradicted everything she had believed. When you have a neighbor, who wants to usurp your father, Princess you need to be as tenacious as them. Thelanil argued but his cocky poise cowered as Diaz and Aliathra walked closely to him. My father said that we must be better than our aberrant kin, that he said we must inspire the younger races forward, not force them to bend against their own individual wills. Aliathra pointed out. And you believe your father on that one speech please, my dear? That is only just honeyed words when he addressed to those envoys when they visited the capital that day. The ambassador scoffed. No, that can't be. My father would never lie to me. Aliathra grieved. Oh, it is true princess. Your father and mother may not be like the despotic black tree pact but even then, we need to maintain our dominance over the other races through more subtle means. Thelanil coyly answered. Diaz noticed that Aliathra's as your eyes began to tremble tears alongside her weakening knees collapsing on the revelation that her noble and benevolent nation was anything but noble nor benevolent. The rest of the mercs became tense the more that Thelanil denounced them and Aliathra. Hearing that their most peaceful means of pacifying the situation had been miscarried before them, their senses ringing, adrenaline pumping, their guns priming, this standoff was going to escalate into an unfruitful escalation of violence. Superfluous violence that Aliathra wailed to not see come true. Their guns sliced through the room, passing by all the possible threats close and far from them as the party goers beamed at them with equally gawking contempt. Diaz looked on at the congregation with disgust. These elves were willing to jaw this innocent little port city into eternal debt servitude in the name of maintaining their grip on the world. He may be a materialistic capitalist working for a larger materialistic capitalist, but they prefer to not milk their customers to bankruptcy. It was more productive that way. Solving problems is what they do not creating them. Yet another concern for Diaz is everything that had happened to Aliathra up to this point. Her heart and legs were replaced with the least of her first wave of cultural shock. Then the next hit was her, a cleric dedicated to a healing goddess realizing that yes, life can be created through non-living things in the form of her said heart beating like any other. Her recent assignment as a cultural consultant which is essentially and she knows it too. Glorified enslavement to the youth was already harsh enough for her as it must have felt bad to be indirectly helping the people she conceived as demons beforehand, but now, true cold betrayal happened before her eyes. He could only imagine the anguishing thoughts the elven princess must be feeling right now. Her own people, being hypocrites to their own ideals of altruism, harmonic solidarity and enlightened prosperity under the Earth Island vision. Yet they do the exact opposite of achieving said goals for the sake of gains and the maintenance of their influence. All at the cost of robbing the people of their pursuit of happiness must have stuck a deep and baleful wound on Aliathra's core beliefs as a priestess of Nanith and as the daughter of the royal family being raised all her life to believe such values. In his years of reading people's motives, emotions, goals and fears in the cyberpunk Ekumenopolis of Kesaheim, Aliathra was dangerous reaching an emotional rock's bottom. For Diaz, seeing Aliathra in such a precarious position made the artificial blood and hormones within him fume to boiling hot temperatures. It wasn't about the sexy money anymore on what he is planning to do next. 
the elf, who in the United Federations, Aparo Corporations, Strider Groups and his own eyes did nothing wrong and held altruistic beliefs of charity, wellness and compassion for all life be broken down by these avaricious, imperialistic, and amoral politicos or in his ancestral tongue for Aya, he concluded without a second thought, that Aliathral Ether is the true exemplar of the Earth Island vision and not the ambassador and his Cephid Liad cronies. Aliathra, please take of my jacket for me. Diaz asked. What? Why? Aliathra sniffed fighting back the tears. I want to show them something. Diaz softly smiled before nodding at the elf. For Aliathra, she could sense the violent intent of Diaz when she noticed him cracking his fists during Ambassador Thelaniel's confession of the corrupt practices the Cephid Liad has been doing in Suville. Although she never wanted to see violence being enacted in such sacred grounds, Diaz and even her own innate thoughts knew that what will happen next is justified. She carefully unsheathed Diaz's jacket careful that the corpo agent continues to aim his gun towards the ambassador. What? Are you? One of the elven party goers questioned when Aliathra finally revealed what Diaz hid behind his genteel jacket. It revealed his entire augmented body, covered from his neck down to his torso, in obsidian metal flesh that detailed his muscles complete with corporate product placement courtesy of Aparo Corporation. Diaz then glow red as his cybernetic augmentations activated to life. Aliathra, little miss princess Aliathra, she thought she can save the world as the little princess. She thought she can bring the world of Glee easier forward in with acts and preaches of love kindness and generosity with the rest of her kind following suit, but now, look at you, look at all of you. You are more corrupt than me, Aliathra and my friends here combined. Diaz spoke, the elves, in all of their pride recoiled in disgust at this hubristic demon calling telling them who they truly are. Hypocrites, what do you know of morals? You are just a demon warrior doing what he is told to do, the ambassador argued. What do you know of morals? Diaz shot back, for all I see, Aliathra would have died after saving that poor kid if it weren't for me, he said. You? Aliathra said. My own money, I paid for your surgery. I, couldn't bear to see you go out like that. Someone who's so selfless yet. So young. We need more people in this world like you. Diaz confessed. You, saved a child? One of the elves asked. I did. I rescued him but then one of their bandits struck me with a lightning spell. It was so powerful that it destroyed my heart. Yet now, here I am with a new heart, made of metal, Aliathra said. Ambassador? Maybe the princess is indeed speaking the truth. That one elf appealed. No, he is lying to you. This dot Aliathra is trying to lull you into her side, the ambassador said isn't healing to repair and make better of a body part? Diaz asked, nudging his head to Aliathra. The princess nodded. The doctors who had operated on her, Strider Group and the kindly April and Dr. Lee Hainanol did indeed hold her hand through all of this. When she questioned herself when she found out about her heart to time, they saved her from a life of crippling handicap. They were there to help her stand up again. Stop lying. You are just like them. The demons. You are just the same like them. Irian said. Demon? Again, with the demon. What the heck is your problem? Diaz asked. All you live to do is corrupt, offend, destroy and deceive wherever you go. Irian said. Ever since you first come forth here in our land you already disrupt the world order with your power and boons to those who bend the knee to you. The ambassador said. Oh? Is that what you think? Diaz twitched his eyebrow up. I rebut that statement. Or more like, Aliathra should. He turned to his elf friend. He nudged quietly at elven princess who stood behind him by his right hand, urging her to assist him. Her words, a presently disowned, daughter of a king arguably drawing more weight than the foreigner. Swallowing her fear, she exhaled as she begins her account. Prince Clovich, you know him being our informant in Tyrian, we give him potions for his sister, Arya. Aliathra answered, and what does that have to do with them? The ambassador asked. As a sign of our goodwill, we offered Arya to be fully healed from being bedridden for the rest of her life and made her walk again. Your medicine, 
although effective in its own right was only a temporary cure. She will go back straight to sitting down all the while the rest of girls go to Galway now. Diaz added with his additional hint of snark. Enough of the lies. Your means of healing is perverse. The ambassador angrily refused Diaz's consideration. Ambassador? How could you say that? One of the elven guests turned to the ambassador. No one else. Man. Orc. Handan can heal the crippled at birth. No amount of restoration magics can accomplish such a grievous affliction. Thelanil Gasconade. Oh, now I know what you are playing. Diaz smiled. Vincent couldn't honestly believe what this elf was saying. Even the other Apara mercenaries would say the same for themselves too. He could barely contain his amusement at this elf's hubris. In his years navigating and fighting his way through the anarchic streets of Kesselheim, this Thelanil's arrogance was the downfall of so many corpos, cyberpunks and any other myriad folks living in the Ecumenopolis. The way he spoke every little heinous word would be a death sentence for anyone pointing the gun towards when one finds themselves cornered by a trigger. The way, the ambassador above all of his and Aliathra's statements despite the latter allowing herself to be disadvantaged by the absence of her protection in the form of the Apara mercs was appalling at best, cartoonishly dumb at worst. Diaz knew from experience, just how to knock him down from his high horse. Superbia, Diaz said. Pardon, demon? The ambassador agitated. It means pride. You are so prideful that you and you couldn't accept someone better than you. I have to admit, we are superior to you in some ways, yet you are also better than us in others too. Diaz said, what do you mean, we are superior to the new demons? Thelanil asked, taken aback by the other worlder's words. You're good with magic, superb actually, no denying that. I myself am, as you would say from my dear friend Clark, a mage. Yet I am not as skilled as Aliathra here who was trained in the arts of healing and stuff, is that true? Diaz turned to the elven princess. Aliathra nodded in turn. Where are you going with this demon? Asked the ambassador. I believe. Me, my masters, you, your friends and Aliathra here got off. I rather leave this place unscathed yet kicked out for the trouble than succeed but made to shed your blood in this really nice house here. Splashes of red everywhere doesn't go well with it. Diaz slowly moved away his pistol. I am going to order my friends to lower their weapons but you need to lower yours too. Diaz said. Vinny? What are you doing? One of the Apara mercs says. Trust me on this. Lower it slowly in the count of three. Diaz grinned earnestly at the scrutinizer. Ha, huh, the demon wishes to parley. Surely you jest. Arian pestered. I can kill everyone in this room faster than you can blink. But I have to clean up this mess all night and it's way past my bedtime. Count of three. Diaz fired back. Don't make this end badly for you sir. Three. The corpo began the countdown. The reputation of demons of being merciless, relentless and cunning monsters precedes the embassy staff and the rest of the elven guests, the legends of being few in numbers but superior in every way forcing the races of the Gleesia to unite against them, many people of every race died in droves, martyring themselves so that the tomorrow that is today could happen, the guards and the elves knows this all well for they recorded all the battles, the sagas, the epics and songs that happened during the Great Demon War. Only through Kul Delstla Ajax Unison of the scattered human tribes of Zanagrad was what brought an end to the war. Now here on this day and hour, another great war looms in the horizon as the ambassador came face to face with the demons of the old legends, too. Yet, he was deep down, afraid, if a martyr dies, yet nobody is there to know it. Is he truly a martyr? This. Diaz's character boasts he can end them all in snap of his fingers and none of his superiors back home would realize it. He knew every one of his staff that he had worked with in the embassy, alongside the guests. They had families and livelihoods to return to after all is said and done. They would be devastated if such cantankerousness became their undoing. This demon has been, he had to admit, was surprisingly generous in his offers of parley. He could sense it all within them, 
The way the demon and his ebony armored followers with their black rods flutter as much as the way his own embassy guards tensed along the tune of the guests. Many of them would rather get out of this alive above all else. The answer was now clear. 1. Diaz finished. He lowered his gun, placing it softly back at its holster as he gestured the rest of his men to lower the holster down their rifles too. Following suit, much to Diaz's and Daliathra's delight, the ambassador himself gestured his men to lower their arms too. Ambassador? Le Dewey and eyes swell at the downturn. Be quiet or this will become pointless. The ambassador interjected. Good, good. Diaz sighed as he raised his hands up. I wish not to harm you or anyone here. If it makes you feel better, I will let all of your guests leave this room right now. The staff has to stay though, Diaz said. The ambassador nodded and his eyes darted towards every elven guest in the room. One by one, they all left the room quietly, leaving the ambassador, Le Dewey and and around nine more elves inside the room. Wonderful, wonderful, very wonderful. Diaz smiled. We are getting somewhere now? If so, let me ask something to Aliathra. Diaz turned to the princess. If I am a guest in this elven place, what do I expect for any hospitalities? He asked. Offered a drink, a sweet psyllid mead. Aliathra said. May I have any if you still have any? Diaz asked. The ambassador gestured one of his servants who quickly poured on a silver gleaming chalice before passing the drink to Diaz. Vincent promptly tasted the wine for a full minute savoring its tastes. He took care to keep his hands up in his earnest form of conciliatory courtesy. The senses on taste's buds rose into excitement as the drink bathed his tongue. Upon swallowing the wine, the liquid brushes down through his throat rehydrating his body and putting his mind at ease. It was indeed a great giveaway to receive when welcomed in. Delicious. Very much Ambassador. Diaz smiled. I want to inform you that I we are speaking as two nations in one room together. Like the Vermilion Rock Concordant of old and I demand the respect of that. Thelanil changed his condescending accent into his typical elven diplomats. His tense stance, relaxed to a stoic yet magisterial aura. Understand I am not taking your word for it just yet. Until we come into terms with ourselves then I trust this. Vermilion Rock. Aliathra? Diaz asked. The old alliance between men, elves, orcs and be asked folks. Or in my tongue the Handine. The fought against all bone together. Aliathra explained. Diaz nodded in affirmation to the elf's information. It was an interesting historical tidbit within the context of Gleesian geopolitics. Understand this of what I understand you, from the reports I heard from Le Dewey and, several of my spies and even the loose chatter of the town, that I know you and your kind are very skilled in the ways of violence. How you slew that bandit Lord in Tyrian, how you slew the Eastern Legionnaire garrisons near the deserts, and how you annihilated those obsequious bullets here in Souville. The ambassador said, it is true, where we come from. Peace is just a lack of conflict, Diaz answered. You are all born warriors, born from a harsh land I see. Yet, to my own admission, you showed surprising restraint coming here to my embassy so boldly. I wish to thank you that you and all your men accompanying you that blood is shed. Thelanil gratuitously acknowledged. We would be no better than animals if that is the case. Diaz nodded. You are quite well informed about our exploits. Indeed. Ever since you eliminated all of the Cephid Liad that I had overseen their passing from the docks all the way to Vercourt, it was only a matter of time before your masters sent someone to find me. Please, have a seat. The ambassador gestured to a couple of the nouveau art chairs in the room. I am not here for a social visit ambassador. I am here because I have questions for you and it's about the Cephiliad. Diaz said. Thelanil sighed and turned around behind him. Before him is the Ethylan Elves' royal crest. Our mandate, is the continuation the true elven sphere's domination across all of the known world. Create the opening of dialogue, discussion of said dialogue and above all, the protection of all Ethylan interests around Gleesia. The ambassador explained, we are a cordial organization. He added, then this should be easy, answer my questions and you can forget I was ever here. Diaz pushed, I am no Gwalaman. Knowing you, once and if I ever do tell you what you ask to know, 
you will just use it against us. Thielano declined. Make no mistake, you have their eyes, the Black Tree Pacts. I will not make the mistake King Serden, Aliathre's grandfather had made. My people and I will resist you. Who? Diaz asked, the Black Tree Pact. Arkin who abandoned my kingdom and have become the Entonced rivals. Aliathre briefly explained. I thought you're just a diplomat? Diaz asked. Diplomats are not just lofty desk clerks who sign papers and smiles to everyone all day. We carry knives in our backs when words fail to evoke the tides we wish to sail upon. Like the thorns of the beautiful Rosin. Our interests above all else must see fruition. Thielanil established. That is why your masters wish to see me eliminated from the picture. Our interests conflict. The ambassador defended his dutiful statement. All I want is some answers. If I wanted to just extract it out of it from you violently, everyone else would be dead in this room right now, you and the guests you wisely sent away. I will ensure you that if you tell me everything honestly about what I will ask you now and you will be treated fairly by my masters. A. Protection, Diaz said. If he could turn around this ambassador into someone much more cooperative, then no oh, so the better for everything can it be? Thanks to Diaz's cybernetic eye. He can read the elf's body movements, signals and beats like a book. He is patriotic, he can admire him for that thanks to his dutifulness as a diplomat and as a director for Cephid Liad operations. Yet beneath that, the elf conceals the fatal flaw of all elves, their pride. And judging by the way he and Aliathra poised themselves, it had cracked. He knew deep down that the other worlders possess power that his country could not compare in prowess to and he was raised just like Aelia throw herself, that elves were and are meant to be dominant. The elf's resolve is slipping, desperate to cling on to his pride as he maintained the facade of high elven braggadocio. Do not speak to me of honesty and fairness not when your masters live on their high towers, seducing coercing and manipulating all that is around them without the courage to proclaim their full intentions for them to the rest of the world. To all of Gleesia, Thielanil argued. Oh, it's not like you are any different Mr. Ambassador, didn't you just say the same thing yourself with your masters? Diaz turned the question around. Oh, my country country speaks of prosperity and peace from your height towers, he mocked. But when I have you cornered, you are just likely to shit it all the way. Diaz ended with a refute. The other worlder speaks the truth. You are a hypocrite ambassador. The Cephid Liad are all hypocrites. Aliathra commented. No, let me. Let me. I can. I can explain. The ambassador cracked, just as Diaz hoped. He can see the elf size contract his irises widely at the piercing assault of his own words being used against him. The younger races, human, dwarf, handine, even orcs are still in their cerebral infancy. Only our Seth Island elves, have the strength, the insight and the ascendancy to see through the children remain safe from those who would see to their harm and danger. Thielanil rephrased. Children? You always call them all like if they were children. Diaz waved. Are you trying to lecture me about parenthood? Because that's how I am hearing it. Paternal-like diplomacy. That is what we do. If the children deviate to a path that will not end well for them, we intervene. Thielanil added. You. No we get the same looks too. You and I. Diaz grinned. My masters want best for Tyrian. They had banditry, bad harvests, squalor and all other sorts of nasties. I suppose you do that to help too when you can? So, I ask you, why fight us when our goals align? From what you are doing, you are already making things worse. My masters are already hawking to see the whole continent burning for every time you try to thwart our next moves. People are dying for a cause that shouldn't be here in the first place. The ambassador nodded. Ambassador? Do not tell me you are actually agreeing with him? Eriand frowned. I said silence. He brushed her off. I agree. It pains me to see my people died. Most of them were people I had known in the academy. We have been trying every day, to think of something. Anything finds a way to stem the tide you introduced. But so far, nothing. 
just failure and more of my people dying. Then tell me this question. Where are the rest of the Cephid Liad or at least the ones you know of? Since you are one of them you can tell them that war with us will only end badly for you in the long run. Tell your king, tell the Slaeijan Emperor, tell everyone you can that war with me and my masters will be a mistake. Diaz requested. If I return to my masters without anything to show for it, they will either tell me to use violence anyways or send someone else who isn't as dot polite as me, and I can see myself on those sides too, Scythral, he remarked, but understand this, when I do this task for you, understand that you will be not just responsible for my renouncement of the Entente's interests and the Slaeijan sovereignty, but also, the collapse of the Ethylan hegemony and the disruption of Gleesia's equilibrium. His point remains ambassador, please for my family, for our people, do the right thing. He is giving you a choice. Aliathra pleaded. Choose to fold now with only dishonor as your only forfeit, or choose to see Ethylan, Herring Point, and Suville, plus all the work you and your colleagues did be gone in a poof. Diaz proposed, pooping his mouth to resonate poof in his sentence. I dot I will not stay idle while more people die pointlessly. You offered me a choice to trust you. Open a discourse between you and my superiors and our allies. I will, the ambassador said. That is treason ambassador. Treason. Eerie and wailed. Calm down. We can settle this another day. Thelanil said. Demon. What did you do to the ambassador? You corrupted him, don't you? Eerie and accused Diaz. No. It's called being a rational individual. You thick girl. Diaz denied. I will not stand idly while these demons make of mockery of us, die. Eriand roared, the elf knight lady conjured her hands encompassing magical energy into her hand as she primed herself to unleash it, le dieu Eriand, no. Aliathra dashed past Diaz to attempt to restrain the elf knight's foolhardy acrimony. Yet Eriand was too impassioned in her blinding rage to see reason. She unleashed from her hands a singing wave of fire bursting from her hands. Aliathra, still blinded herself in naive idealism of peace couldn't react fast enough to reflexively close to blink as the burning embers met her as Eurarises. The elf screamed as she recoiled back covering her broiled eyes in pain. Le Dieu sees this foolishness at once. The ambassador tried to grab the knight. I will seize, your treachery. The rainbow helm rallied herself. She raised her sword and cut down Thelanil, killing the ambassador instantly. The elven princess wanted to cry, not in pain, but of dolorous grief over her people's steadfast ignorance, yet she couldn't, the burnt flesh on her eyelids infused itself to her eyes delicate expanse causing her to cry but never shed a tear. At the same time, the burning particles of magic found their way around the spreading to all sorts of surfaces made of flesh fabric or hardware alike. The more combustible materials like the dry carpets and curtains ignited. Fire. One of the elven embassy staff alarmed. Shit. Someone get some water quick. An Apara mercenary ordered. Shit. There's some on me. Diaz screamed as he found his body erupting at several places with embers smoldering such as his left arm and the pair of pants he is currently wearing. Despite his augmentations and cybernetics being fire-resistant or straight-up fireproof, his head is still vulnerable to getting burned alongside the fact that he still has the instincts of avoiding having himself be lit on fire. Everyone in the room panic as people struggle to keep the growing flames from turning into an engulfing inferno. Some tried to choke the fire out by dumping heavy objects under the flames whilst others use the water or whatever liquids they can throw to douse the flames. For Eriand, it was the diversion she needs, looking down on the traitor princess trying to heal herself from the pain of her eyes being charred. Seething with self-righteous fury she pointed her sword at Aliathra. You will die here and now demon. The rainbow helm avouched. Why didn't you listen to us? Aliathra asked her. You are not the princess. Rainbow helms only take orders from the royal court. Arian spat. This time, she will have the glory of slaying this corrupted being in the shape of her beloved princess with her own hands. Raising her sword overhand. She charged forth ready to cut down Aliathra in half with one mighty smite. 
If Aliathro had failed in trying to get her people to be convinced about the non-violent ways of the United Federation from the start, she would have allowed herself to be swallowed by her despair and be frozen still as she let the knight plunge her blade at her heart. Crush by the boot of her people's finest would be both a dishonorable way to die but the most befitting for one who allowed herself to be consumed by the other worlders' blasphemous devices. Yet, when Diaz came in and almost persuade the ambassador to rethink his hostilities, she was renewed with a sense of hope. A hope for peace. A hope that she can still have a home to return to. A hope that life can still live on in harmony as Nenny or whatever omniscient being created all of creation. This hope renewed the same fire she had when she first left the lofty towers of Earth Island into the adventure she found herself into. The aspiration of being something more than just the youngest child of the elven royal family. She is to become the bridge between Gleesia and the other world above. She will fight to not die today. Pulling out her ranger's danger from its small sheath. Aliathra, listening to the battle cries of Eriand, began to wildly slash the at the rainbow helm's perceived direction. Without her sight she was like a fish out of water, trying to flop itself blindly back to the water. In her panicked slashes, Aliathra shuffled herself backwards knocking over several of the valuable party or office decor the embassy had in display. At a glance, the elf's wild cuts were similar to two kinds of things, a storm for its sheer unpredictability, and a hostel where you can go in but will never come out. In her blind sauntering, she felt her back hit a solid wall, stopping her in place. Stay back. Stay back. Aliathra warned with her stormy carving meeting nothing boo. Aliathra, relax. It's over. The elf could hear Dias's reassuring voice as it moved towards her. Sir. Vincent. Vincent. I. I can't see. Aliathra told him as she grasped the other worlder's body. It's okay. It's okay. Dias comforted her. It's over. Dias said. Vinny. Fire is out. We're safe. One of the Apara mercs says. Good. Dias sighed in relief. He turned around and was left appalled at the chaos that had entailed thanks to one elf's blind rage. Several priceless pieces of nouveau art were destroyed or damaged with an ugly char burn and the ambassador's lifeless body laying on the floor. I, tried not to, stop, her. Aliathra snorted, her ability to shed tears hampered by her stinging burns. It's okay, you tried, you tried to. That's what matters, he reassured her. He gently pushed her away to see the resulting damage of Aliathra's eyes. To say it reminded him of her old flesh heart back in Kesselheim would be a traumatizing statement, to say the least. He couldn't tell where the eye begins when the fused flesh united together. Her as your eyes, forever taken away cruelly by the hands of benighted patriots. There was also freshly spilled blood on the elf's cheek. With his thumb, Diaz slowly rubbed it off. Is something on me? Aliathra asked. Diaz remained silent. He knew where the freshly spilled blood came from and it was definitely not hers. I smell it. On your hand. Blood. Am I bleeding? Aliathra asked. Again, Diaz remained silent, not daring to tell her of what she had just did. No, no. I am. I am. A. Nenith. No, no. I. 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 Am. Eerie and. I am. So. Sorry. Aliathra realized. Aliathra couldn't bother to heal the smoldering burns on her eyes. Her vision not only darkened but her own self as well. Without herself at optimum focus, she was paralyzed and left emotionally broken. Nenith. Her teachings abhor most forms of murder. Teaching a non-confrontational way of life that valued the utilitarian ideal that all life within creation deserves to live in systematic harmony with one another. Eerie and the Rainbow Helm was one of the most decorated soldiers of the Earth Island nation outside of her competitive spirit in horse racing. She was the ideal soldier in regards to her duty, bravery and loyalty. She couldn't blame her for her consistent rebuttal yet only if she knew what Aliathro had seen what their youth were capable of. Her oath to protect the true kingdom of the elves would flow alongside Aliathro's ideals that Gleesia and the earthlings could leave in peace. But now, she lay dead. Her soul forever vengeful of the betrayal Aliathro inflicted upon her kingdom now bared witnessed by dozens of her peers. The thought of seeing her dead body at that moment. 
spasming for breath, as the rod pierced her throat with her unsettling green eyes rattling to death sickened her. There was the point of no return for her. She did not only commit a great schism, but she had just committed a royal offense with the Rainbow Helm's murder. Aliathra wanted to cry, but couldn't shed a tear. All she could discharge was hoggish snorts, rasping puffs and mournful wails with her nose and mouth as she tightened her embrace with Diaz. The only person who guided her hand through her journey. For all intents and circumstances, Aliathra could no longer call herself a princess of Eth Island no longer. All she is now. I am a monster. Aliathra sobbed. No. You are not. Look at you. Look at you. Deep down. It took guts for you to be here now. Diaz said. I am a monster. She repeated. Don't say that. Diaz repeated again. I am a monster. Just like you. Aliathra wailed louder. All that Diaz could do now for her was to hold her tightly. He rocked the elf softly as the elf's sorrow. The more he sways as he cradles her body, the quieter the elven princess agony felt. He may be mostly machine and wires, but he still had empathy encoded within his heart. He could only imagine what kind of vicious thoughts are now besieging Aliathra's head right now as she was lulled to sleep. Sleep now, dear princess. It was all just a dream. The corpo quietly lay Aliathra on a chair allowing the elven maiden to be taken away from this horrid nightmare. After laying the persecuted and mentally damaged elf on the chair, Diaz turned to the beleaguered embassy staff who shuddered at the sight of the other worlders their fanciful clothes not stained with sweat, ash and splotches of unknown matter. You, who among you is willing to send a message for me? Diaz asked them. One of the staff, a frail clerk raised his hand. Here is the Federation's message. Tell your kings, tell your lords, tell your armies that all we ask is for you to come to speak to us in peace at Tyrian. We will be waiting. Fight us and you will only lose. We may not want war. But we will finish it, Diaz said. Every sentence he finished he thrust his finger forward pointing to the clerk. The elf clerk nodded. Get Dot out, Diaz ordered, his voice dripping with displeasure. The mercs behind him looked at the surviving elven embassy staff members, their guns still holstered but still ready to intervene violently. With no cards left to play, the elves silently left the room, descending down to the streets of Suviel alone and away to wherever the closest sanctuary their kind in Sainagrad could be. Their memories forever imprinted with what happened that night and never forgetting the corpo's ultimatum, parley or war, dash. Meanwhile, as the night reached its darkest point before the rising of the dawn, Greski Jodent can be found at his estate. He had slammed the desk of his office denting its wooden surface and causing several loose coins of ducats to jump slightly upwards before falling back down. He couldn't believe the words of the last Sapphide Liad said. When he first arrived at his home, his clothes were tattered with dirt, wear and tear soaked with sweat and feet threatening to crumble into collapse. At first, Joden thought that his couplot needed more reinforcements from more of his private guards whom he kept a few dozen of in reserve, or perhaps he was such in a rush to inform him to now set forth to the palace as planned when the adventurers have finished clearing the building, but it was neither, for it was the results he did not want. Marxian's role in the plot was to ensure the guards were supplied sufficiently with the coin to amply compensate the Grey Order adventurers down payment before he personally, oversees the breaching the perimeter of the palace. After that, he is to return to the Jodent estate and report to the chief tax collector of what happened before being sent off to Herring Point where he will rendezvous with the rest of his colleagues in Herring Point. The coup has failed. The demons ambushed and slaughtered all the adventurers and your men at the palace. Marxian dejectedly said. Jodent turned pale upon his ears listening to the elf's words. All of their hirelings from the Grey Order perished by the hands of demons. Their endeavors evaporated before him. You dot we. We need to leave. Jodent stuttered. His hands shuddered as he reached into a drawer behind his desk. It was key. Several of the people I hired have a letter that indicates me and your ambassador in this plot. Have you told Ambassador Thelanil about this? I sent away a tweet to Bird right after I witnessed the adventurers getting massacred. Marxian answered, Why not send one to me too? Why run all the way here? Forgive me, 
I was in hurry to your estate for I saw the guards and more of the other worlders doubling their patrols so I was forced to flee less I risk capture. Marxian defended himself, besides you agreed to extract me out of this duchy regardless of success. I take your point for this one elf. Jodent placed his hand on his face. His decrepit heart traced his anxiety and fear of being forced to answer for himself before the duke that he had spent decades earning and maintaining his trust would entail. A punishment for treachery was a long torturous death and the complete seizure of all of his possessions and property. Just like the elven spy, he too needs to escape, I know. It looks like our hopes must lie on that chosen one now. Marxian said. Chosen ones. Jodent emphasizes on the plurality. What is your opinion about what happened in the cathedral? For me, I am not someone who leaves everything to fate. But then again, I see the wee lad as a tool. A very powerful tool. Marxian gave his comments. Faith Len is his name. Then there's also two more of them. So far there's a search for the missing ones. The Emperor is probably investing heavily in this one boy. I just hope he will succeed where many of us failed. Jodent assesses. Well, my reports here will be of some use to the Chosen One. His powers and the symbolism his brand gave would rally many of the people to his cause. We will need to raise an army and we need to raise it fast. We can count on several of the Dwarven clans to assist us in material and people whilst the Grey Order can help us with a whole assortment of talents. Jodent added, Do not forget the College of Magi in Herring Point and also my homeland's equivalent, the Arcana and its academy for anything related to magic, Marxian said. Indeed, they may have won this battle but this only the beginning. Take one of my horses and gallop out of here. Jodent stood up and gestured Marxian to the door. What about you Jodent? Marxian asked. The chief. No former chief tax collector? He condescended. Go on ahead. I need to collect my belongings before I depart. I will meet you in Herring Point to discuss what we can do next. Jodent says. He remained confident that he can still return to Suville sooner than later. He has several supporters and henchmen whom he knows will likely have to lay low for a while after the failure of the coup. As Greski salvages what he can from this setback, he will appeal to the Emperor to recognize that the current Duke, Thibault is illegitimate and accept the Jodent family name of claiming the Dukedom of Suville. He was always propping the tax revenue files to indicate that Suville was a very prosperous region even though the acquisition of said revenue is less than wholesome. With imperial support he can return to Suville and seize the region for himself and no longer stand idle at the sidelines under Thibault's shadow. But right now, he needs to salvage as much of his resources as he can, money, titles, and henchmen to do his bidding. He held onto his key and descended down a flight of stairs. One of the perks of being a banker is that you can afford your estate to be turned into a small fortress with locked doors, patrolling guards and vigilant watchtowers. Another perk is that he can legally safe keep a large sum of treasury tied to his bank under his home. The crooked tax collector knows all well that an impoverished nobleman is as potent as desert farmland, which is none at all. The Duke will likely seize all of his bank's collected treasury as by the law and now Greski must work to rescue as much as he could carry before departing. All of you, get as much money into that carriage immediately, he ordered. His servants toiled at the ducats scattered throughout the treasury room, being able to fill chests after chests of ducats. Jodent meanwhile heads down to the accounting room of the underground treasury and used his key to unlock a chest within it. It contained not only ducats of the more, larger denominations but several deeds and titles personal to him like his estates, the land being occupied where his bank is and also a balance book which indicates all of his allies and dealings within his long career in Suville. But as Jodent frantically packed all of the chest's contents into his money sack, a loud explosion could be heard from above him that shook the ground below, stunning everyone for one moment. What was that? One of the servants asked. For that moment, nobody knows what had happened up above them. But then one of the estate guards descended downstairs, his sword drawn and his helmet missing. We are under attack, the guard said. They are here. Get out there and hold them off, Jodent ordered. But sir, 
They are slaughtering us. We need to flee now, the guard argued, not without the ducats. That is an order, he yelled as he returned to gathering his gold. The guard, not wanting to argue at such a dire time like this, returned upstairs to hold of the intruders as Jodent continued rescuing as much of his wealth as possible. By the time he cleared the contents of the chest, his sack was as rotund as his stout self and cumbersome as that he could barely lift the sack all by himself. He struggled to reach back to the underground carriage room, but just as he was about to reach the glimpse of hope that is the large door, several of his guards burst out of the door, pushing away its wooden frames before immediately turning around and barricading it with their bodies. My lord, they reached the carriage. It is not safe, one of the guards warned. But my ducats is there, Jodent argued. I told you, it is not safe behind there, the guard repeated. The door the guards obstructed began to shake violently, unbalancing the guards who jostled to remain in their forestalling position. Greski had to swallow his loss now. The ducats in the carriage room were lost. The stables. There should be a horse there. Follow me. One of the guards told Jodent, escorting the nobleman out of the few still unpenetrated areas of the underground left. The two emerged in the surface where the greeting of thunderous explosions and the cacophonic madness of a battle ensued. A fire occurred at his home and he could see the bodies of several of his servants and guards laying on the street. These demons, and their eldritch powers, they had overrun his home like a plague spreading from its origin of Tyrian and now expanding its tentacles into Suvil herself. His home and the pearl of the Dragatoi Eyes coast has fallen. Joden could also see, through the darkness of the night, four of what he can only construe as oddly shaped but great sized birds whose wings beat like the sound of charging war horses. On their noses, he could see orbs of light whose rays descended down to the ground like the gaze of Laisel's morning light. To him, these giant birds reminded him of fireflies and sprites that seasonally come out during the spring and summer seasons at the more temperamental or magically more attuned areas of Zanegrad. Beaming down to the ground before in its blinding luminousness, looked upon Jodent and his escorting guard. Hold still, the giant bird spoke. Hurry to the stable's master. The estate guard pushed him, staggering forward with the weight of his most prized possession at hand. Jodent ran across the yard of his estate onto the inviolable shed of the stables. His confidence arose when he could still hear the neighing of horses still confined within its walls. Entering the stables quickly, the guard readied the closest horse that they first came across when they searched the pens. It was a venerable yet agitated white horse whose breed was to be a beast of burden for whatever arduous work its master wants it to do. Normally it would work quietly as it told, but the sounds of thunders and the screams of rapacious strife made it restless. Get that horse ready so I can flee, Jodent ordered. The guard took time to comfort the horse with a few careful head pats. Yet for the nobleman it took many of his precious time and judging by the way the giant bird had spotted them. The demons are descending upon his position as he sees the horse finally revert back to a more amenable state. The estate guard guided the horse away from its pen and into the saddling area of the stables. Quickly, the guard instructed. He grabbed a nearby saddle and fitted it on the horse's back. Yet Jodent was such in a hurry to hop onto his horse that he got in between its back whilst carrying the hefty carryall of his possessions. Thanks to the way Jodent disrupted the rushed estate guard's flow of fastening the saddle properly onto the steed, he wasn't able to fully secure its grip between the beast and apparel. You two, get down on the ground, a voice yelled. The doors of the stables opened to reveal over a dozen shadows appear before him with the same light emitting from the giant birds hovering above the exposed door, revealing and catching Jodent and the lone estate guard in their attempt to escape. To herring point with you, the guard yelled to the horses it slapped its flank causing Jodent to launch forward abruptly towards the stable door where the demons stood before him. A couple of the demons, seeing the horse wildly charging forward to them dodged away allowing the former chief tax collector to escape to the open gate leading north out of his now conquered estate and north out of Suville. Diuda, the guard raised his sword to prepare one final stand but the demon's magical bolts from their black rods pierced his body before he can even lunge out for a charge.
The initial path north of his estate with eclipsing hills and feathery vineyards that Jodent's horse could easily pass through surreptitiously much to the former chief tax collector's coy idea. It was a perfect screen for his escape with the darkest part of the night masking him further with the late night clouds blinding Mayari in its Stygian folds. He could hear the raping of his estate from the distance behind him, but as he progresses through the shrubbery and shadowy hillsides of northern Suville, its despoiled cries abated more and more for every hoof before ultimately, the sweet hymn of the night's silence was all the ambient sounds Jodent could hear. In his head, he vowed that he will return to Suville one day and exact his vengeance, for now, he needs to get himself to Herring Point as soon as possible and make his case to the Emperor himself of the complications in his previous appointment, preventing him and the Empire from extracting its due on the Pearl of the Dragatoy Eyes Coast, knowing war needed not only money but supply. The Empire will gladly push for his reappointment not as a desk bounded chief tax collector but as the Duke of Suville himself. Carrying the last of his possession on his sack tightly, Jodent fled through the Suville open wilderness. The crooked nobleman smiled as his steed advanced at every pace, the rhythmic crackle of the last vestiges of his ill gotten gains disturbing the peaceful night's path. There was nobody who would be up scouring about at this hour, let alone at such an occasion back at the city during the course he had. It was all him, his steed, his money and the strengthening sea breeze from the Dragatoy Eyes coast that headed him forward. He could even feel Laisol's dead breaking light shine closer to him as he made his sunrise escape. Gresky Jodent You are under arrest by other of the United Federation and the Duchy of Souville. A voice echoed behind him. His heartbeat raced upwards while his woolly hair straightened with cold sweat as he pried his eyes back, however, he saw nothing, just the sunrise starting to illuminate the skies with its apricot glow, he sighed as he turned forward to return his eyes to the path, perhaps it was just his anxiety getting the better of him in a moment of weakness. Freeze. The giant metal birds that swarmed his estate asserted. The monster hovered in front of him. Its great body blocking his pack and its radiant gaze. Oh its radiant gaze that he could never forget blinded him and his steed. His steed recoiled backward, stricken with overwhelming shock. In addition to the imbalance of posture, Jodent's saddle, thanks to its earlier improper fastening loosened, allowing Jodent, his heavy sack of ducats and the horse to fall crashing down to the hard ground respectively. The soft and bloated body of Jodent's overweight, desk-adjusted body was too unfit and unpracticed to hold its form against the crashing of his wealth onto his person. The burdensome tote crushed his weak and malnourished bones, most especially his rib cage, its splintering causing his internal organs to rupture violently. Years of unhealthy life choices such as meat and wine with no desire to lift his foot off of his office, simply using the power of his money to enforce his will on the destitute denizens of Suville now coming him to take its due. The contents were also loosened its tie on the bag causing a considerable amount of mammon to smother the tax collector in his own hubristic greed. If the money poetically killing him wasn't harsh enough, the horse he rode upon, an expensive crossbreed of Elvngda and Zanagradic purebreds fell on him, adding its weight onto his crushed body, further disintegrating him into a pile of his own blood, bile and bones. Jodent faded away as the very thing he wanted to desire to collect at all costs the most became his downfall. Dying with a whimper in a lonesome dirt road with his home, riches, status, and name to be forever dashed away from history, just as the tax collector expired. His pursuers, the otherworldly figures descended onto his body like vultures. They quickly shot down the bewildered horse for their own safety as the beast wildly flailed its legs at anything it sensed coming closer to him. They examined the body and its material damage it came with a sense of disappointment. Spearhead, this is Strider Lead, the HVT is dead. A man walked up to Jodent's corpse said his arms were protruding metal appendages above his limbs like a spider's claws. Compared to his fellows his black rod was the most intimidating of sizes. He listened to his little device attached to his ear earnestly. His voice sowing a breath of hesitant displeasure. 
There's a bag and a horse here, filled with papers, ducks and a book. Accounting I believe, the man said. Another moment passed with the voice in his ear. Affirmative spearhead, sending coordinates for the military police as we speak. The man nodded. Yes, I think the Duke would need to see this. He added. Hey, Crocker, the sun's up. Iris, you got your sunblock. A dark-skinned otherworlder, similar in shade to the knight earlier informed the attendant otherworlder. He was followed by a pale-skinned woman with runic tattoos on her face, who was frantically slathering her exposed skin with a potion. The otherworlders turned around to watch the sun star lay so rise above the hills of Souville, glinting the land in its golden rays as a new day had started. Mark my words squad. This is only the beginning. The otherworlder asseverate, dash. The new morning was met with blessed reverence and equal amounts of observance for faith Lengarm Hayek, the chosen one deemed Gweninager, the anathema. He was dressed in adornments such as a blue and silver ceremonial armor adorned with the Empire's symbolics being, a greater dragon holding a the sword can rifle on its right paw symbolizing the Empire's united order brought by Kul Dulstla a Ejak's masterful confederation of the human tribes of Zanigrad. Upon his left paw is a cornucopia filled with bountiful harvests symbolizing the continent's age of prosperity brought by the said confederation into the empire it is today. Such an armor being worn by Faith Len can only be worthy for the venerable March Og, the knightly lords of the empire, high status warriors known for their skill, minute ability to independently lead brigades of men to their banners for their campaigns and also for their prized valor in the face of incredible odds. The way he was abruptly awakened from the College of Magi and rushed from its scholarly halls to the Imperial Palace and the way his opulent plates presented themselves, he could deduce that indeed, in that moment and at that hour, he will be knighted by none other than Emperor Olden himself alongside the even more so esteemed than the knights, the Cadfredogeny Leng, the Slae Aegean Empire's legionary generals to think, days ago. He was just a lonesome lad from the countryside looking for his place in the world and now his destiny has been thrust to him by blessings and the act of the gods. He now sees himself on his lifetime goal being achieved sooner, a poem, a record in his name in the great books of heroes that his mother and teachers read to him. Not just a hero but a hero only sub but to the founder hero called Elstla A. Ejak himself. The trumpets blared signaling the beginning of the knighting ceremony as Faith Len was led to the great door separating him and the imperial throne room. Stand upright and proud chosen one. You are about to be a marchog of the empire. So act like one, an attendant instructed. So did Faith Len proudly taught his chest up, the armor's breastplate facing forward like a vanguard through the matching colors of the empire's embroidery below his feet that is the royal carpet. As the doors opened, he put his best foot forward, marching proudly down the hall with his head held high as worthy as the knights who precede him, whom were the first people he recognizes attending the ceremony from the throne room door's immediate vicinity wearing a similar ceremonial wardrobe for the occasion. After the knights, came the noble houses, descendants of Caldell's closest followers, dressed in their opulent robes and fanning themselves with their own prestige. Next followed were the magisters from the college, they held their staffs by their hands like sentinels stoically looking on with studious eyes at Faith Len as he passes by. Also, across the hall, he made pass more peculiar folks that he had never seen before in his life, some of which only heard in stories and gossip that passed through his childhood town of Clervuite, non-humans. He saw delegations of the Empire's peers standing closest to the Emperor's thrones with their heraldry in full display. He saw the Ethylan elves in their graceful auras wearing their translucent and colorful robes or wearing their resplendent armors. He saw Husky the dwarves of Clan Kerfoldur in their master-crafted armors. Races close to the Empire's heart for their partnerships. There are also other delegates from lesser known or more exotic areas that the young boy heard whispers about. He saw the Tavisi elves, dressed in a scantier version of Earth Island's own designs which emphasized their well-toned bodies. A contingent of Dawson shamans silently prayed to their guardian spirits of each of the Voli Udi, Kote Udi, Baikali Udi. 
the major tribes of the northern barbarians. Faith Len even noticed one of their own, a hulking biker Liudi or Bull person as it's commonly called around the empire clasp in a letter at his person. Perhaps another plea for peace or another of the tribe's diplomatic gestures with courtesy to the more civilized neighbors as he thinks. With their bizarre runic marks scattered on their bodies, these shamans were the shabbiest dressed people in the room causing most folks to keep a diplomatic distance from them, not helping their case that Dos never clean themselves. Then there was a baggy dressed man from the eastern suzerainities, adorned with finest jewels and pelts from the monsters known to roam the savannas there. The next two groups of unusual guests were from the continent of Saihan, he never heard many stories of them other than the elves being in contact with this isolative continent east of Sainagrad beyond the coasts of the suzerainties. He saw a furry eared but less bestial compared to the Dosna humanoid who wore a flowing red and gold lined robe that kept hidden his hands. A tall cap shaped like a branch reaching upwards making him look taller than his barely five foot stature could compensate. He was a Yaozian or a fox man with a remarkable amalgamation between humans and a fox, with the human side being more profound than the latter. The only remarkably alien feature was his narrow slit A's, but only when you look at him face to face up close could you notice them being shaped like a castle's arrow slit. He was attended by four other figures who bowed their heads down with humility before the tall capped Yao Zion. This one was an envoy from the declining Rogyo dynasty of the Yejgung Empire, his land declining due to the violent takeover of the robust Black Tree Pact. The other envoy from Saihan is, in contrast, an imposing to rival the Baikali Udi Shaman, Snake Kin or Nahana as they prefer to call themselves from the tropical jungle kingdom of Nahadaya. He was the most unsettling of the people in attendance, almost giving off the same disdainful aura the Dosn are giving. He lacked legs, except that he carries himself with a strong and flexible appendage below his torso that allows him to glide through any surface with ease. He was acting as both an envoy to his people and as a peculiar bodyguard choice for the Yaozian due to the fact that the last free remnants of the dynasty bordered where Nahadaya begins. All of them looked at Faith Len as he made his way towards the throne with a mixed reception with hope from the dwarves and elves, uncertainty from the Naha and the Yaozian, apathy for the Dosan and the Tavai. The dwarves and the elves came were in attendance for their mutual interests with the Empire despite the two's differences. The Naha and the Yaozian had a concern of what this could mean for the Empire and their peoples whilst the Dosan and the Tavai couldn't care less of the Chosen One. They had their own reasons why they are in the Emperor's presence. They began to whisper quietly to each other of their subjective thoughts on Faith Len. This boy, so young, but can he? Does he know what will happen to him after this is all over? One of the knights asked another that is his senior. The Chosen One is blessed with magic just like us. Such is the tilt of the human's crystal heart. An elf scoffed. He was envious of such an individual magically significant but subprace can be suddenly blessed with a huge assortment of magical inclination to all forms of magic compared to the elves natural arcane talents and carefully crafted lineage started by their founders who originally created the elven kingdom of Alphalnora before the dissension war causing the elves to be split between the Black Tree Pact and the Entente with a posthumous break off of their island colonies south creating the Tavai Sea Elf Nation. I just hope this agreement we have with the Empire will work out well for us in the long run. I have to tell the drudge cast to double their quotas to meet the conditions. The Dwarven envoy commented with concern. He knew the Empire will ask of his people to produce more minerals in exchange for more vital materials unavailable in the Asterix. You are a Tavai am I correct? The Voli Yudi Shaman asked the Sea Elf. Indeed. What brings you to me Handine? The Tavai asked. Don't call me that first, the shaman said. I'm here with a warning. I have little to no reason that we can trust this chosen one nor this crying of the college. Tell me something I don't know. The Tavai waved off. You and I both know that the Empire is only going to push harder against us now that the powers that be are emboldened with this chosen one's arrival. Who's to say that they may use him against us eventually? The shaman argued which caught the sea elf and gave him pause. 
Could this chosen one really be more than just a glorified armament? Could it be used against his people and also the Dawson Zone? What about everyone else that is neither man nor elf? The Empire, the Entente and arguably the Black Tree Pact are the greatest powers in the world right now. This crisis of the demon invasion and the rumor-mongering of the Chosen One's exceptional abilities will surely disrupt the status quo. I hope this Chosen One can help us too. My Emperor would pay any price for his help. The Yaozian envoy wondered. Many more held their reasonable doubts on Faithlen ranging from his unusually young age of being knighted with all the skipping of Squirrelhood with a sponsoring knight though many argued back that the Emperor is not barred in handling the apprenticeship and sponsoring of neophytes. In addition to the newly emergent demon crisis being a state of emergency that certain customs and laws will have to be bypassed. Passing by all of his onlookers he made his steps up the elevated platform where Emperor Alden and the Cadfredogen Elang leaders stood by looking at him ominously with their dignified gaze. Some filled with doubt, others filled with hope for this young boy given such a prestigious status at such a young age, yet the Emperor briefed them earlier, that the ceremony and their attendance was a formality. He wanted to show the Empire how seriously he is dealing with the new threat of these otherworlders and how much he is willing to go for investing in their protection. Once he has shown his hand, the rest of the nobility, the army and the commoners will show their support. Neil, Faith Lengarm Hayek, my child, Emperor Alden fatherly said as he drew the ceremonial sword, a replica of can rifle used for the knighting ceremony. The young boy knelt forward his knees landing on a soft pillow to cushion him as he awaited the rite's completion with his eyes fixated with fire looking up to the August Emperor Alden. To several of the closer onlookers, it was rather peculiar of an up-and-coming young knight to not humbly lower his head before the one knighting him. Some debated quietly behind the scenes whether the boy was showing arrogance before the Emperor or a passionate desire to look into his liege lord's eyes as he is being knighted by him. Do you? Faith Langarm Hayek solemnly swear to defend the Empire until your final breath from all of its enemies? The Emperor asked. I do. Faith Len responded. Do you? Faith Langarm Hayek uphold the honor and prestige worthy of the esteemed Knights of the Empire? The March Og? I do. And lastly, do you? Faith Langarm Hayek to uphold by the powers of the Dwarf Tulu, I Emperor Alden with the powers given to me by the gods W. Faith Lengarm Hayek, to be consigned with honors and titles to the knighthood of the Order of the Soaring Dragon. Alden dubbed as he tapped the replica sword on Faith Len's two shoulders with a ceremonial weapon's flat side. Despite his face remaining motionless, Faith Len internally could barely hold his excitement. His dreams coming true before his very eyes, he had to pinch himself dozens of times whenever he met any of his heroes and idols from the upper echelons of the Empire's elites to see he wasn't just dreaming of his hopes for the future, yet indeed, the future he wanted to have heard now. Arise March of Garm Haik. Alden told him now with his new title. Faith Len followed, and with a smile on his face. The trumpets blared as the slay agents within the crowd sang a joyous chorus. It was the song Tale of the Hearts a song detailing the saga of Kaldel Slae e Jack and often sang whenever the Sacred Heart bless a new chosen one or few. Often the song is sung during the jubilation day when the Empire was founded. Let us gift the chosen one with the boons he will need for his journey. Emperor declared, with a quick motion of his hands. Several people from the crowds marched forward and knelt down to the Emperor before eagerly looking on to Faithlen. He can recognize from among them, Petra the Faithful Rechdorf, Carlia Silverdane, Mita the Crow and Findrim the Monster Hunter. There were however also several other people of unfamiliarity as Faith Len examined from scholarly folks, industrious craftsmen to knightly soldiers. My child, these men and women will be your followers in your journey, the finest the Empire has to offer. The Emperor bestowed you may have already met several of them already. I am March of Grashiness Fawn. Stately and heavily armored knight saluted. I will be your mentor on your chivalric duties as a March Og, he said. Sir Fawn is one of the most respected knights who served at my side and my lineage for years faithfully. Although he may be past his prime, this man mentored Petra when he was newly dubbed too. Alden added. Indeed. Grashiness bowed. 
The next one the chosen one walked towards, was a bubbly looking young woman with dark hair but rosy cheeks jumped in front of Faith Len with excitement. She wore a virginal white robe adorned with leather belts holding scholarly implements like quill pens, ink wells, measuring tools and examination apparatuses. An air of prodigious femininity can be scented by Faith Len as he passed by her. Hello, I am Olayra Eckroth, the girl said. I can speak eight languages, read ten languages, can tell the difference between a wyvern and a dragon, my fruits to my vegetables, my herbs to my spices. The scholarly girl spoke rapidly. Forgive me, but she is quite a fast speaker. But Ledui Ekroth is one of the college's best scholars. She may not be a mage by any sense, but she is a prodigy in alchemy and languages. In addition, she is also from Clairvuite and is around your age. The emperor smiled with a suggestive tone. To not cause offence, Faith Len honestly couldn't recognize this Olayra Ekroth. He couldn't recall anyone from his childhood years with that name or perhaps it's just the fact that the town had only one schoolhouse and there were over fifty other children other than him coddled up inside it for the first ten years of their lives. The last person was a burly man. Perhaps the tallest in the room by his giant size almost akin to an ogre thanks to the light shade of lilac on his skin. He was wearing several medals over his white apron. His chin however was his most protruding part or in the sense it's most glaring. It was elongated with an oversized lower lip. Essentially this Goliath was somewhat deformed. This is Morthwill. He is a half-ogre blacksmith who was under the tutelage of the great blacksmith Gwilliam Keelan. Alden said. The Keelans, the ones who made many legendary weapons and armors like Ken Rifle? Morthwill nodded with a clack from his mouth. I forgot to also say that he can't talk very well, the Emperor awkwardly mentioned, but he is quite vigorous in the smithy and he is talented enough to use Scandinite and Actocolite ingots to make whatever you and your army of followers need. Army? Faith Len twitched his eyebrow. I shall explain. The Emperor said as he stepped forward with his hands raised to call out the attention of the crowd gathered in his throne room. My subjects, my attendants and envoys, I, Emperor Alden of the lineage of the Slae Jack, do declare my annotation for the first time after we were attacked by the steel cloud that rained thunder and fire from the sky on our fair city, he said. It was over about less than a fortnight ago when Herring Point was attacked and the Emperor was making his first public appearance since then. The areas still devastated by the attacks were already being cleared off of rubble. Many of the affected citizens were looking towards any authority for guidance yet the chaos that ensued during the attack caused a bureaucratic standstill in the Imperial Senate due to several important figures. Buildings and even injuries caused miscommunication amongst the authorities and the citizenry. Some even began to speculate beforehand that the Emperor was killed during the attacks, but the rumors were shot down when the invitations were given out for delegates and the nobility to attend this event. There were however several unexpected complications such as the arrival of the Dawson Shamans, the arrival of the two envoys from Saiyan who were part of a mercantile fleet and the delay and deuce in bringing in Faith Len's followers into Herring Point in such a short notice hence a rather precarious yet intriguing environment of a diverse set of vested groups within Sainagrad and beyond. I must apologize for my silence these past few moons but I assure you, my silence was necessary for I was taking great heed to ensure the Empire's response to this catastrophe brought before us. Alden humbly bowed. The nobility in the marcher gave an ovation to the Emperor now that their concerns were finally being answered after days of grueling ambiguity from the throne. I may be old and aging, but rest assured I have not doddered off yet, the Emperor said. For you are my people and I am your emperor. I take your safety and the continuation of your well-being seriously. We must find the other two chosen ones and bring them to our fold so we may bring a decisive end to the demonic invasion. To prove that what I say is the truth, I am investing heavily into our triumph against this emanating crisis. The emperor snapped his fingers. He signaled several servants coming forth bearing gifts for the chosen one. One gift was a chest filled with ducats, another was a finely adorned and polished saddle that indicates the gifting of an exalted steed for which he can ride on and the last gift was a badge containing the imperial dragon insignia. Confused, 
The Chosen One tapped Emperor Rulun. What is that you are giving me? He asked pointing to the badge. Ah, that is the Imperial Crest used by diplomats and officials to show their status. Wearing it will allow you to travel freely within the Imperial roads and not be compelled to pay the tolls for you and your followers and granting you audiences with virtually anyone in the Empire whom you may need at your disposal. In addition to all of those privileges, you will also have the authority and the responsibility to levy soldiers unto your army of up to 5,000 men or a whole legion. It also gives you a degree of protection from the law, the emperor said. And about this army, what will it contain? Faith Len asked. You are free to choose who joins your army. But if you are to ask for my input, March Ogfawn's old legion. The 14th Legion are willing to let go several of their men to your banner. Mages from the college can also be coerced into joining your army as long as you can keep their needs in check. Mercenaries, however, will be needing payment but if you evoke the seal onto their contracts, they can attain their due at any imperial banks in our major cities, the Emperor explained. This all more than enough that I can work with. Faithland smiled. Your words are truth, my child. Do you have anything to say? The Emperor asked. Yes, Faithlen said. He stepped forward into the audience's view as he inhaled his breath. People of the Empire, I Faithlen Garmhaik, latest in the line of the Marchogs do solemnly swear to vanquish the demons from our lands and purge down everything that they have corrupted. Not only, that I will for as long as I breathe, will take the fight those who seek the Empire's destruction. He addressed the crowds. A standing ovation followed for the Chosen One, except for the Dawson Shamans, the Tavai and the Sahai envoys who lay there quietly, uncertain what this Slay Aegean's ascension would mean for their people. Dash. From the window, Prince Clovich Rian marveled past the great bastions of the Federation's mastery of the Great Void or Space Station as his guide. A one Isabel San Mathias described. Isabel. Dowager who worked for the Federation's government as a cultural historian of Old Earth as she described herself. She was attached with courtesy to Chairwoman Di Popo to be Clovich's guide to the planet Earth. These space stations being the defensive barriers that protect the Federation's capital of Earth from all sides. He also marveled at the spherical celestial bodies of the Sol system before him. He saw Saturn's rings crowning the world in an auspicious circlet. The discombobulating palette of green earth, blue veins and orange deserts being lit up by the off-planet view of the starlight skylines of Mars' nightly side. The planet system's sun whose golden glow reminded him of Lathol back home, before finally he saw the great shipyard of the youth's navy based in Seoul, Starfleet Seoul. Tell me, La Dewey San Martias? What is Earth like? Prince Clovich asked his companion. Like your homeland green grass, blue waters and bright skies. Only the difference being of our advanced technologies in contrast, Isabel said, tell me, what do you know of our technology? I know of windmills that you also have just like ours that produces this mystical power of electricity. The prince says, energy, yes, very important to us too and very important to you too, just like your mana crystals. Isabel said, Indeed, if I may ask, what other wondrous technologies of yours do you have? Clovich asked, So many to think about. Where can I begin? Isabel flustered. Where did King Meiji begin when he was like me? Clovich asked. Isabel was surprised and amused by the other worlders' semi inaccurate historical insight. She recovered with a sincere smile as she shuffled the cards in her head in response. You mean Emperor Meiji of Japan? Yes. I do say you have his fire for progress in your eyes, Isabel said. This, Japan, what is it like? He asked. Used to be just farmlands and rough mountains before the emperor brought technology into his realm turning the island nation into one of the most powerful nations in my history, she said. Can I visit it? Clovich asked. Maybe, after your appearance before our parliament. We can arrange that. You are here to see what we the United Federation of Earth are capable of, Isabel said, and how we can work together. Clovich nodded. Of course, she praised. Attention all personnel, prepare for landing to the Basel spaceport. 
the captain of the ship announced in the PA's speakers. After placing himself at a seat and fastening his seatbelt, Clovich observed the descent from the black void of space to the Federation's home world of Earth. Passing by the Aurora Borealis above its atmosphere, Clovich marveled at the rainbow palette of lights it produced when their rays clashed with the monitor in white clouds of the beginning of Earth's aerospace. He could feel the clinging sensation of gravity take root within his bones as the ship further descent closer to the planet's surface. The clouds grew thicker with every altitude drop before finally from beneath the bottom of his glass window, he saw a glimpse of green and solid land followed by the dotting presence of civilization in contrast to the natural surroundings. The ship landed safely at Basel. Switzerland the closest spaceport to the youth's central political heart of Geneva in the Western European prefecture. From outside the window, the prince and his entourage saw a great expanse of concrete ground where the spaceport placed their ships and gizmo-filled tools related to the docking, launching, and maintenance of these great flying boats. As the ship glided its way onto a carousel attached to its bottom, Clovich could see the industrious tools of the youths might be transitioned away with the ground suddenly turning to a bright royal red with a walkway and barriers that followed along the red-colored path towards an awaiting carriage. Behind the barriers scores of people in brightened clothes, leathery vests aiming their eyes at him. He could feel thousands of eyes fall upon the prince as the wheeled boarding ramp adjoined itself to the ship's supply bay, its stairs also too covered in red carpet as earlier, Prince Clovich held on both a fear and an optimistic drive within when he first made his journey from Tyrian to Earth. What would these greater beings think of him? What will he be able to see on Earth? How could this visit affect what will happen back home? All of those thoughts ran through his head as he and his entourage were escorted to the boarding ramp. A sharply dressed man, Similar to the way Governor White dressed but with a blue sash of the youth's many ringed emblem attached by his shoulder with his grey two-piece suit. Prince Clovich, welcome, welcome. I am Prime Minister Francis Bowsk, the head of state of the United Federation. I, we welcome you to Earth. Chapter 35, The Tyranny Mission. The Palais du Parlement, was perhaps the earthiest building in Clovich has seen so far in Geneva. The city surrounded an entire pristine lake whose crystalline waters matched with the shimmering spires and neon lights that glittered the skyline. Once called the Palais des Nations by the youth's predecessor, the United Nations, the building remained untouched outside of the occasional restorative works every so often by the youth government. The palace is a white stone building situated in the middle of a park that oversees Lake Geneva with a clear view of the French Alps. Littering the grounds, the Tyranny mission saw dozens upon dozens of flags flying highly above their flagpole horizontally. He made several passing comments about so many of the quirks the earthlings had that he observed based on his experience dealing with the folks of New Albany to Prime Minister Bowski who has been escorting them on foot to the palace ever since his arrival. The Prince of Tyrian talked about how they were so religiously obsessed with cleanliness, oftentimes refusing several articles of material unless sterilized based on his observations with earthling merchants interacting with his own. The Prime Minister's response is that health is important to the earthlings as it was one of their insights that allows them to remain physically and aesthetically superior compared to the more disheveled Sainagrad natives since elves also have a similar albeit less refined conceptualization of personal hygiene. No wonder the earthlings, even most surprisingly, their wary Tadden or commoners, who are just as fair as their affluent noble Sidon. When Clovich asked about all the strange contraptions and gizmos that litter Geneva's streets like metal carriages, their titanic spires and glimmering cloaks of iridescent light, Basket says that it was all the byproducts of years upon years of development. Not even the elves or the dwarves could match such technological might as Clovich recounts. He is a bit shaken by the incessant pelts of flashing lights that followed his every step. According to the Prime Minister, those are recording devices called cameras. After walking down the green fields in front of the Palais du Parlement's grounds, Clovich saw at the end of a walkway a blue draped stage with a speaker's stand laying at the center of it. Behind the stage are flags. Dozens of them all unfurled equally as they are mighty. 
To think such a nation could command the allegiance of so much more was fantastical and justly terrifying to behold. Hearing and seeing the roaring and gazing crowds fixed to the strange man in the most wondrous interpretation of a medieval noble did make him quite flattered to be the center of attention for once. Tyrian was always overlooked for the more glamorous cities of the empire like Herring Point and Souville who attracted the more affluent merchants and travelers. Now that he did question several of these marvels and is now currying to win these other worlders' favors, he will, he must learn what they know to his advantage. Please sit here Prince Clovich. The Prime Minister needs to make a speech before he introduces you to the entire world. Isabel gestured her arm to an unoccupied chair. Clovich and two of his trusted bodyguards complied and took their seats as his guide instructed. The Prime Minister meanwhile broke off from the Prince's vicinity and approached the stand, making one final check on his tie for maximum presentation for a high-profile individual such as himself. In the long history of mankind, when we first ascended towards the cosmos centuries ago, there was one question that enamored artists, scientists and every child alike. Bazke began to speak. The cheering crowd silence as their gaze was fixed towards the youth's prime minister. Are we alone in the universe? He phrased the ground-shattering question that heralds across all of the lands will mark as the beginning of a new age in interstellar exploration. With one final swallow of courage after a brief pause of gasped onlookers, the prime minister continued his speech on June 12, on the year of our Lord and Anno Domini 2218. The colony ship the Eodem landed on Benham 3 to a planet we have first thought was to be an uninhabited continental planet with Earth-like qualities that were more than perfect to support human life. However, it was perhaps too perfect. Upon touchdown under Benham 3, the colonists have discovered the most astonishing sight. An entire new world, the Prime Minister said. The journalists with their cameras, audio recorders and microphones roar in clamor with questions, the most common denomination being along the lines of the phrase, what is the meaning of this? Bazke gestured his hands down to silence the journalists again, we have discovered a brand new world, the likes of which we could only dream of seeing. Magic, dragons, knights, and castles as far as the eyes can see, the colonists of the Eodem were shocked at first but it dissipated quickly after because, for the first time we have discovered the world with intelligent alien life forms, however, instead of aliens with hyper-advanced or similar technology to ours the likes of Star Wars or even Mass Effect, we have discovered that a world of fantastical beasts, people and creatures where not science, but magic is the way of life amongst them, he said. The journalistic crowds uproar with questions as they ask. How is this world possible? I know it is difficult to believe and I admit that meeting with an advanced alien race is more believable than what I have said but now we must press onwards to the fact that, yes, our wildest fantasies has become a reality and fairy tale has come to life. Benham 3 has proved that our wildest imagination has come true. Again, the onlookers roared with more questions than what the Prime Minister had answered. Why is this possible? Our journey and exploration in Benham 3 so far have bear great fruit. We have learned more of these people, who are just like us in appearance yet somehow deviated beyond our current understandings of creation. We learned how they live, how they conduct their lives without such a need of what we of the Federation too for granted, but most important of all, we learned how they conduct their special abilities to perform magic, but don't just take my words for it. I know that in every new discovery needs hard evidence to prove its claim so I had invited a special guest who is a native of Benham 3 to introduce his magical homeworld to all the United Federation. May I formally welcome, Prince Clovich Rian of the Principality of Tyrian. The Prime Minister offered his hand to his guest of honor to step forward atop the centerpiece of the stage. The vassal Prince Clovich is extremely nervous about the scenario of having to speak in front of so many people. He knew from the accounts of Colonel Polonsky and Governor White that the United Federation is but multitudes of billions of people and all the Empire was but only a small fraction to the larger Earth human's population. 
The prince himself has no problem of public speaking but only used to speak in front of a dozen people at best but speaking in front of billions of people is utterly overwhelming. To make matters of his fear of public speech worse was the fact that virtually all of the earth humans, every single one of them from the lowliest peasant to the richest kings and to the youngest of children to the eldest of sages know how to read and write in their own language. He wasn't talking to a mass of peasant looking to hear what the prince's next edict will be, but a universal gathering of scholars all united to gaze upon the prince. Clovis can imagine what question they all had in mind, who is this mystical man in our image, he who comes from his frontier home to our innermost sanctums to curry our favor? It was now the moment of truth, all of his tension now at the balance as he slowly walked towards the stand as his eyes were bombarded by the flashes of light from the strange men in their handheld gizmos, his face painted to an image of tensed stage fright, his mouth pouted as in his own mind. He is now addressing personally to what are essentially gods to a Gleesian like him, for the fate of his homeland, he must speak on their behalf and vouch for their blessing. They want to ask you some questions. Choose a person among them and entertain them. Bazka smiled. A sea of palms was presented to Clovich, all the eager journalists hoping to have their multitude of questions be answered by the other worlder. Clovich chose at random and picked a young woman who had the same shade of hair his sister had among them. The young woman stood up, her spectacles reflecting the other journalist flashing lights. What language did you speak in your world? She asked. How are you able to talk and understand us? In English? I, I speak a language called Vigory. Clovich answered with an accent. To the reporters his speech was similar to an Italic Hispanic sounding accent. I learn English through the help of a mage that uses a magical spell that allows me to understand and even learn how to speak your language, this English, though, it does leave me with an awful headache right after the enchantment. Clovich added, the journalists looked down at their notebooks and electronic devices and clicked away to record the other worlders' words. Next question, pick a new one. Bazki pushed. The sea of palms re-emerged in front of Clovich again. This time, the prince of Tyrian chose a grey-haired old man carrying him a small camera drone hovering above his left shoulder. The Prime Minister states that you are the first group of natives they have encountered in Benham III. Describe honestly, what do you think about our civilization compared to your... this... Slagian Empire? The journalist asked with an awkward choke on the butchering of the lead lord that Prince Clovich bends his knee upon. When I first met Colonel Polonsky and Lieutenant Rose, I was at first dismissive of their capabilities. I had my fair share of many people where I come from who are all talk and nothing to back it up with. I thought they were just a bunch of exotic mercenaries with a few gimmicks here and there. But now, after what they have done to my realm, giving water, better roads and providing better safety throughout my people. I have to say that you, Earth humans have been nothing but invaluable to the Principality's continued enterprise. Clovich answered, it is my hope that with this visit to your home plane of, Earth that I may be able to learn more ways of developing Tyrian and to strengthen Empire and Federation ties with one another. He added, choose one more. Baz urged the prince again. Clovich was starting to like the attention he was getting by these gods. He doesn't know if it was the opulent setting the youth has provided for him or the flash of the camera's attention hungry gazes to his person that made him smile from his initial seat of unease. With a proactive finger, he pointed towards a young man sitting far away from the chairs of seated journalists whose hand was nearly blanketed by the sea of palms that his peers gave. Do me. Ah. Yes. I am from Gaia's Crier. The man stood up. Many of us in Gaia's Criers and perhaps all throughout the Ethernet doubt the authenticity of the video spreading about. I beg your pardon? Clovich asked. We believe that this magic that the Unusa office is reporting is a fabrication, a lie to justify an increase for their budget. The man said. I do not understand this inquiry. Clovich twitched his eyebrow. Just then, the prince felt Prime Minister Bowski's hand touch his shoulder. He thinks magic in your world is not real. The head of state bluntly explained, but it is. Clovich exclaimed, did you bring any mages with you? 
the Prime Minister asked. Sweat fell down from his wrinkled brow as his eyes widened to the Prince. The politician could even feel his aging heart skip a few beats. I see. Indeed. I did bring a mage. Clovich nodded, now understanding the question's substance. He looked at his entourage, sitting on his right side silently but knowingly cheering him on with their thoughts, prayers, and smiles. Clovich scanned the aisles until his eyes met a purple-topped old sage that he had known from his childhood that had served both his father and him ever since. Ed Merle. I request your presence up here now, he ordered. The wizened old man bowed his head and complied. He stood up from his seat and with the escort of one of the youth's security personnel, he was guided to his lord's side. If one was the camera or simply observing this auspicious event live through one's own naked eyes or through a screen, Ed Merle would look like your stereotypical old wizard. He wore a dark-colored robe, loose and baggy in a fashion sense with a matching conical hat. Complementing his look was his withering face and long white and bushy beard. He carried along with him several articles native to his Gleesia specifically Tyrian, some smelling herbs attached to a spherical hearted necklace with holes that allow the herbs to protrude upward to his decaying nose. Ed Merle's belt contained an assortment of quill pens, scrolls and even a small notebook which gave the man a rather sage-like appearance upon first sight. He carried with him a tall staff that he uses both as his magical conduit thanks to the noticeable mana crystal attached to the staff's head and as a walking cane. For such an old man born into the life of a medieval commoner, he was left in a state of awe at the sights of Geneva and Earth's many other technological marvels just as what Clovich and the rest of the mission had seen. It was as if the gates of heaven opened for all of them. This is Edmolm Velel, my advisor in everything that involves the arcane and, as you asked, a practitioner into the magical arts. Clovich introduced, explain for all of us to hear. What is this magic that your world is so proud of? The Gaius Cry journalist asked. Clovich touched the old man's shoulder to shake off the wizened one's wanderlust. Ah yes, magic where to begin? Where to begin? The wizened one pondered. His old mind was rusty to say the least. Talk about how magic works. Clovich whispered. Ah, yes, magic. In our world, magic or in our tongue girl is sourced from the power of mana crystals like the one attached to my staff. Ed Merle gestured his staff hand with a slight wave, emphasizing the blue glowing crystal at its top. Mana crystals. The new element that we discovered by our people in Benham 3. The 120th one if I read the reports. Prime Minister Bowes Physic commented, his hands grasping together like a student eager to learn from the teacher in front of him. What do you mean by mana crystals being element? There's only five. Not one hundred. Ed Merle corrected but he was cut off by a slight nudge of Clovich's elbow to press on with his demonstration. Ah! So, mana crystals power our magic. Some spells require certain ways to be able to cast them. Verbally, somatically, the need for a specific material for some examples. Ed Merle lectured, can you show us some spells? Bazkir requested with a euphorically suggestive smile. Certainly. Both Prince Clovich and Ed Merle said in unison, the wizen one step back a few meters from his master and the host of this ceremony discreetly, upon obtaining a good distance between himself and the center stage, Ed Merle folded his floppy sleeves to reveal his withering hands that had tattoos of ancient arcane runes imprinted on the surface of his skin. He waved his left hands clockwise with a ring finger tucked by his thumb as the runes flashed to light. Even his magical staff glowed just as brilliantly as a flare of bright blue energy erupted from the magical crystal atop of the staff and whisked away towards the speaker's stand. To the bewilderment of the crowd, the speaker's stand began to suddenly quake from its feet. To their additional or the stand was lifted several feet up into the air. At the same time Ed Merle was flowing upon the rhythm of his body's direction in match with the floating stand. This is Mage Hand. I release a tuft of the gui within my staff's mana crystal to allow me to manipulate objects such as moving them around floating them and even other more delicate procedures like knitting and kneading. Ed Merle explained, a significant portion of the first-hand observing crowd bearing witness to this show clapped in applause, however, 
there were still just as many doubters upon such sorcery. Anyone on earth can do something similar to that. Show us more, the Gaia's cry journalist stipulated. Carefully, Edmo lead the speakers stand down to its original position before he huffed. His pride, practice and a legacy being challenged, the sagely figure took a deep breath. Step back, and behold all of you. Especially you. He exhaling with emphasis to the skeptical journalist. Inhaling again before concentrating his innate powers, the tattoos on his marks glow once again as Ed Merle's chest slowly grew upwards with a rumbling sensation and a warm orange flow exposing the tinge of his lungs. He tilted his head back, stretching his throat skywards as he shouted. Nor an or. Ed Merle's voice reached to the heavens above as his breath ignited forth from his gorge. Exhaling the channeled magic within, a burst of fire released ten feet into the air, glowing the azure scenery of the youth's colors. The crowd's eyes were enraptured by the wizened one's flames. Going on over a minute, Ed Merle continuously kept the flame alive to the impression of the onlookers. He held no fuel to help quench the flames nor had an obvious means of ignition outside of his person. Indeed, it was as if he was truly breathing out fire. The crowd cheered after Ed Merle dissipated the flames, harmlessly emitting an after smoke as above and so within the old man whose mouth steamed with the wake of the flames. That is fire breath. Not many people back in Gleesia can accomplish this without horribly scaring themselves. Ed Merle bowed. Impressive. Prime Minister Bowski clapped. Indeed. For something even street performers can do. The Gaia's Gryer condescended. Still not convinced? Bowski looked at the sensationalistic skeptic. He knew his kind too well. Always looking for an angle, a crack to destroy, diminish, and disrupt. But even then, this was already starting to push it. As I said, some people can do that too with some lighter fluid and a torch. Even some exotic orgs can do that, the journalist explained. Oh, Sir Ed Merle. Bazke twirled his head back to the old mage. One more trick. Something that not even a charlatan like him would have to believe. Something nobody could fake. He requested. Something that nobody could fake? That's a challenge. Ed Merle became lost in thought, but his master, Prince Klovich tucked his robe. Remember that trick you did on Arya's seventh birthday? Clovich reminded him. Oh yes, my lord. I do remember that one. The smile on your sister's face. Ed Merle smiled. He promptly excused himself from the stage and went down. The cameras of thousands of news channels across all of the youth's space followed him regardless. Ed Merle walked towards Ariana Park outside of the Palais du Parlement until he stopped on a patch of green grass resting upon some soil in the middle of field of green. With his bare hands, the wizen one clawed out half a dozen handfuls of dirt from the ground. What are you doing? Baz asked his demeanor shaking by Ed Merle's coarse act. Be quiet. Allow me to concentrate. The old maid shushed. He then spat at the collected pile of dirt he had accumulated several times, much to the Prime Minister and the other witnesses disgust. Inciting more of their nausea was the mage's immediate action of sculpting by hand, mixed with his dirt, grass, and spit. Ed Merle then began to chant repeatedly as he began to articulate his modest materials. Talnakil, he evoked repeatedly. It was a rather rhythmic display of his art in contrast to his ramshackle arrangements. He formed an ovoid body at first. He then proceeded to form five appendages around its clay-like body. One thick appendage with a slight bend over forming a bill-shaped head and four thinner appendages with a circular bottom at its feet. Two appendages on the same side as the thicker appendage, while the other two appendages rested across with upon the side without. Clovich and the Prime Minister knew from the wizened one's handicraft that he was forming a horse out of the muddied soil out of Ariana Park. It was barely considered one in their eyes and it lacked its waving mane and trembling tail but it was rather impressive for one to form in a span of five minutes for Ed Merle. Talnakil, Roch, he powerfully worded as his tattoos glow to life again. The magic crystal flare another emission of its energy towards the clay figurine Ed Merle forged with his two hands. The figurine ascended to live as its four legs articulated. The earthen horse galloped upwards and ran wildly across the green fields of Ariana Park. 
The cameras gave chase as the animated yet pint-sized horse galloped majestically on the palais front yard. There was no more room for doubt anymore. All were left captivated at Edmel's 1-2-3 demonstration, from the youngest of children to the most antique elders. Their wonder was captured more of this newly easier that this Prince Clovich talks so eminently of. Already the word had spread across all media of this never-before-seen phenomena. Even then, journalists swarmed Prime Minister Bowski and Prince Clovich with a barrage of questions as they erupted with their inquiries. Do elves? Dragons and fairies exist. What are mages capable of? What is life like in Gleesia with the existence of magic? The Prime Minister and Prince Clovich answered as much as they could of their commentary and insights to the fantastical world of Gleesia as the former lead the latter and his entourage deep into the chambers of the Palais du Parlement. There was much more work to be done outside of entertaining the masses, much to Bowski's acute plan. This is only just the releasing of the floodgates, and now he has to make his move fast, lest other more unscrupulous folks beat him to it. Dash. That was surprisingly smooth. Major Holyfield's nightly eyes widened. Is it not too late that I knew he could do it? Governor White said to the Major. I honestly also thought he would have to lean on the Prime Minister for most of everything. Colonel Polonsky commented. The two youth beef generals sat together again with Governor Jeremy White at his office, overlooking the live broadcast of Clovich's public introduction to the whole Federation, but it was more of just simple pleasantries for the welcoming of a special individual. That moment will be bookmarked into the annals of the history books as a new age in space exploration. But with Gleesia's true nature lay bare for all the public to see. This brings out the possibility of a whole new cocktail of potential problems, hazards, and factors coming into play. Well, then gentlemen, our doubts of the prince's capabilities with courting the Whigs back home have dissipated. Already I am seeing hashtags popping up about that old wizard geese magic in social media. The governor chuckled as he looked at his smartphone. Already hashtags ranging from hashtag real magic. Hashtag Fantasy World and Hashtag Gleesia were now trending upwards across all platforms. People simply couldn't believe their eyes. All of their thoughts, all of their imaginations were indeed real in another world. But as word spreads, so does people's intentions for what they wish to do upon this new revelation. You know, the Whigs can't delay this any further soon. Holyfield turned his cold gaze at the governor. I know Major. That is why we need to make as much ground as possible. Governor White acknowledged. But what about the Empire? You have seen what they can do and our actions could result in an equal response from them. They are not going to take what is essentially our intrusion. If worse comes to worst, he may be already mobilizing his armies as we speak. I mean, you have seen what they were about to do in Suville Holyfield. Colonel Polonsky gave his opinion. And you have seen what just happened to Dr. Malona and Lieutenant Rose? They have been branded with this. This. Whatever those brands on their bodies are and already my political officer and I are already breathing down both of their necks for even the slightest hint of them going rogue. Or worse. What is it that I personally oversaw Operation Bakumatsu Colonel? Holyfield shot back. The capital is where the Emperor is and the seat of government of the Empire. Your little stunt could have actually turned this little territorial misappropriation into a possible war. Polonsky argued. Which is all the better we return to Herring Point and seize it. We have all the reasons in the world to take it. Plus, according to our local assets, there has an artifact called the Sacred Heart that can allow us to further study these brands that Malona and Rose have gotten. We just need to cut the head off of the snake first. This prince just propping up some brownie points with the press and the locals. But even then, he is limited to just his place. Maybe his cousin and the dwarves. Holyfield said, he will learn our ways major, one way or the other. Inevitably, the empire capitulate to us. It's how they will lose is what we have to worry about. Fortunately, we have the cards to control that. The governor reminded. The prince is our best and only shot and making this war less bloody than it needs to be. They think we are demons yet to him we are angels. These natives will only ever accept him as their ruler and none of us, 
if we have to make the least likely man in all of the empire into the next emperor then so be it. He is one of their own after all by their blood. Are you sure this plan with Clovich will work? Holyfield asked. I have seen folks like these before white. There is no reasoning with them. They are like a spark that eventually becomes an inferno. They will stick to whatever words their masters would say and gladly march down to Tyrion en masse to kill us all. Holyfield argued. I have to agree on you on the master's part major for this one. Polonsky nodded. Gentlemen, all you think of is war and the next battle. That is your jobs is it not? White asked the two of them. The major and the colonel nodded quietly. My job is to win this Benham III for the Federation and ultimately this war. My plan remains that Clovich will learn of our society, our power and technology and when he returns, he will be our foundation to expand outwards to the rest of this planet. The governor pushed, the legions are after us, the mage college are going to try and blast us. The Adventurers Guild is finding ways to harass us and their church is breaching against us, pray tell, governor but the odds are stacked against us even if we will win. Polonsky argued. All three men in the room sulked down, they care for their reputations within the political bureaucracy of the Federation. Polonsky and Governor White cannot stomach the idea of being slaughterers of an entire primitive civilization as it would taint their reputation and the common state parties throughout the Federation and undo the reformation that got them into their positions in the first place. Holyfield was far more pragmatic as his reputation as of being the CSP's cover man of being the vanguard of the party's military might would be put into a negative light if he butchers defenseless people called adventurers that by the youth's standards standards of the rules of war would be considered in between the lines of a civilian and an irregular unit, with the scale tipped next to the former. The party's reputation among the dissident folks of the entire nation are now resting on the hands of all three of them now that they are in the forefront of this new world and now their names will be scrutinizing with the little luxury of a convenient cleaning job by the censors. They also knew that history will judge them for their actions on what their next course of action is next. With all that you said Polonsky, Holyfield broke the silence. This is why we should march on them before they march on us. Holyfield gaveled governor's desk. I already have a plan in mind for a quick and the decisive capitulation of the empire. I call it Operation Haymaker. You do? Go on then Major. Explain this Operation Haymaker of yours. Governor White clasped his two hands together forward, now intrigued. A multi-pronged assault across the border of the Principality. I studied the maps and dug some intel on the core settlements of the Empire. Holyfield said, the good news is that thanks to the mountains the Empire will only have one way of getting to Tyrion which is a fortress after Vercourt on the road. I hear that is fondly called Little Hill. It is a sizable fortress and the strongest point that the Empire can use to defend itself before we can touch their territory proper. If an entire army is to march down on Tyrion then it is to be there. A mechanized assault will be the answer, Holyfield said. So, knock the fort and move on? Polonsky asked. Not exactly Colonel. Let me explain, Holyfield answered. Speed is key, the longer this war happens the greater the heat the party and us will have. We have the advantage of firepower and maneuverability and the luxury with, admittedly dot help from a paro corporation. The theory is to create a new vulnerability to catch the enemy off balance and then with one blow strike its heart before it has the time to react. Holyfield said, then what happens to Little Hill? Governor White said, we double envelope trap as many slay each and legions inside the fort and then just continue onwards to the reality of this operation. Here takes a look. Holyfield placed his tablet on the ground. It was a satellite map of the entire empire, with settlements and major road networks highlighted out. After Vercourt and Little Hill is a quaint little place near the center of the empire's heartland called Nugonia by the locals, it's a transition point where goods, people and other stuff pass by and go to reach wherever they are needed to be. What Polonsky and White noticed is that the location based on the map was the most interconnected area in all of the Empire's core. Not even Tyrion can compare to this place. It's also not a town nor a settlement per se, but a very interconnected province of the Empire with nothing more three major road networks, one heading north to south and another west to east, 
and the other diagonally slashing north and the eastern ends. My reports say that outside of a few walled farming estates, this place is essentially open country, Holyfield said. Indeed. We get boots on the ground and all this blah each an empire is ours to march on. Polonsky nodded, but how will this force a quick surrender? Medieval folks would barely notice this until we are already knocking on their front door, the colonel questioned. New Gonia's capture is just the rope for the empire's noose, a tactical and operational goal essentially speaking. For the full weight to have everything crash down on them we need a strategic objective. We need to decapitate their leadership, Herring Point itself, Holyfield coldly said. That's the second part of your plan? Governor White asked in pursuit of the Major's line of thinking. Indeed, Holyfield confirmed, thanks to our little friendship with the Duke of Souville. I can easily sneak in a battalion or two of my marines into Souville and blitz it for the capital on the ground whilst the Aurora will support them from the skies. Their task is to seize the capital of the Empire whilst most of their army's attention is in Little Hill. We need to make them think our main attack is by the border of Tyrian when actuality our killing blow is straight to their nerve center. Herring Point herself, Holyfield said, Hang on, I think I know what you are trying to pull off. A, deep battle doctrine do they call it? Polonsky raised his hand. Yes. A Soviet battle doctrine of creating and then driving the knife deep out on breakthroughs. Key word, create. Holyfield oscillated. Sounds like a plan major. A great plan, but we will have to wait for Klovich to return from Earth. My biggest concern is the transition. I have no idea how the Empire react when one of their vassals takes up the Imperial throne. White pondered, it's best to allay any uncontrolled considerations with more planning. I say we redouble our efforts with my studies and observation groups. We got the Dwarven Mountains, the Easter Deserts and Zartrek with us. Let's push the envelope further and see where they can take us, Polonsky said, agreed. White nodded. Hold on a moment, Colonel, you actually reminded me something. About the Dwarves. I specifically Luya Amirian. It's about Lieutenant Rose. You read the reports, right? Holyfield raised. Yes, poor girl. Polonsky solemnly lowered his head. He had read that Samantha has been transferred to containment unit deep inside Malona's underground science laboratory for several experiments. He was initially suspended in disbelief when one of his own team leaders of the SOGS he is in charge of displayed magical powers similar to Aliathra and Iris abilities. However, a report by the doctor's observations says that if she is to take too much of the mana energy inherent from the unbinilium crystals, she could disperse copious amounts of harmful radiation if her energy reserves are left unchecked. Yeah, Dr. Malona too, but besides that, the materials we need to build that special suit to better control her powers are in the Dwarven Mountains. We can send some teams over to retrieve them and bring it all back to New Albany for his special project. The codename is Witchwood. It's a collaborative effort between our scientists and Sheesh. Aparo engineers, Holyfield said with a drop of disdain from him when he mentioned the Mega Corporation. I know our alliance with Aparo Corporation has made things awkward for most of the general staff, but we have made deals with the devil beforehand. If we are to survive, we need to let the monsters inside the house for even just a moment, but even then, even devils can be cheated. Governor White smiled. He has placed his faith on the Prime Minister that the mega corporation influence, Aparo or otherwise can be curbed. Dash Marxian pushed away the firing guards of the Imperial capital in his dirt, sweat and wear and tear of his traveling apparel. In deep contrast to the elegant showmanship the guests the servants and their security in full display, brushing off the brief scoffs of the elf's revolting exhibition, the Cephid Liad agent dove into the sea of party-goers in search of someone, Lindus, he bowed to his superior, the elven spymaster, the Eth Island ambassador attached to Herring Point and none other than Emperor Olden himself, standing opulently in his blue and golden silver lined robes alongside his crown that is domineered by various gems, some decorative, some magical. 
to say the emperor was appalled by Marxian's dilapidated presentation. Sticking out his tongue in front of all the prattling nobles and influential personalities. Sir Marxian, you are in no way in the acceptable conditions to present yourself to esteemed guests or to our honorable host. Lindis reprimanded. My apologies Herda. But I bring the most urgent news. Marxian said. Can you not wait until after the banquet? You are upsetting my guest. Alden conveyed. Suville has fallen. Marxian candidly apprised. The chatter of affluent festivity was instantly spoiled upon the cursed words that fell on the emperors and Lindis's. The militaristic folks were left frozen. Their eyes widened in disbelief while the drunken mercantile family-run guilds spat out their spirits. All the rest simply dropped whatever activity they were doing as the turn to the emperor and the gravely informing elven messenger. Even Faith Len, who was across the hall introducing himself to his sponsors and supporters was left stunned upon the audition of Marxian's news. All aspects of exorbitant appetites, decadent play, and courtly romance disappeared in that instance. What do you mean? Suville has fallen? The Emperor's voice raised to an acrimony. It was horribly my lords and my ladies. The demons. The other worlders. How? How can you let Suville fall? You Sephi Dillard are supposed to be the pinnacle in fighting arcane creatures. Alden roared, not accepting the fact that his plans of keeping this crisis under control in his court has failed in the most unexpectedly damaging way possible. Forgive me your highness and Herda. We tried our best but the Earthworlder's strength was simply too much for us to dispense with. Even with the support of the Grey Order and Chief Tax Collector Gresky Jodand it was simply not enough. I am the only one made it out alive. All Sephi Dillard agents, Grey Order adventurers, Jodand and his men, as well as the people in the embassy back in Suville have all perished. No, you mean all our men, elite warriors. Embassy staffs and even Ambassador Thelanil were all, all, killed? Lindis tore the lapels of her formal dress. How many of my fellow guildsmen were killed? Petra queried about a legion's worth. All gone in one night. During the Corsiad the demons had massacred them all as they drank and danced. The embassy tried to fight back but they fell into the night by red-coated demon. Marxian slyly deceived. In truth. His words were meant to be as provocative and fear-mongering as possible. He knew that these other worlders invaded the port city through far more subversive means. When he had chanced upon the surviving embassy staff who relayed to him. Of how much not only how the demons had unraveled their plans but shockingly the most. How far Princess Aliathro had fallen by the sight of her metal legs and the way her new heart beat still without a kill man a life force and how they managed to escape to his astonishment they were let go by the red demon upon the request of the princess herself. At first, Marxian didn't believe it, but when the survivors allowed their tongues to slip about how the princess did not try to devour their souls that the Sephid Liad agent accused them of being corrupted themselves, like a contagion that spreads amongst carrier to carrier. Marxian cut them all down quietly in their sleep before he departed for Herring Point. Lindis nor the rest of the Institute must know of this sinister turn. How can they defeat so many and so quickly? Lindis asked. It is seen that the demons were able to not only penetrate the Duchy's defense but have even managed to proudly wave their many ringed banners on the same night without as much as a battle. This is terrible news. The demons are acting faster than we thought. The Eth Island ambassador to Herring Point despaired. I hope that Duke Thibault managed to either escape or go down fighting. Owen bowed his head. No, far worse I am afraid. Marxian refuted. The Duke has been seduced and has been corrupted by the demons. The entire room gasped for air upon his revelation. We attempted to fight back, but the demons revealed our attempts to counter this betrayal to remove him from power. With his mandated powers. He expelled many of us out of Suville violently. As I said, I am the only survivor of our attempts. Marxian said, faking his lamentations. This is an outrage. We must fight back immediately. Emperor Elden rallied with a fire in his aging heart. Indeed, I will marshal the men. Commander Huguet said. How large is this demon force that came to Suville? Surely even with powerful magic. They must be large enough to take impregnate the port city with the knight's errant and your troop. Besides, 
Your people should have at least killed some of them thanks to your expertise in holy magics, if my memory serves me right. In actuality, the demons only have no less than thirty of their warriors when they conquered Suvil. Our combined Sephid Ilid, Grey Order, Elite Elven Knights along with the Embassy staff are at least five hundred, they slaughtered everyone and we, W. We, failed to even lay a finger on one. Marxian meekly replied, I can't believe you allowed them to just simply make a fool out of yourselves with your gross hundreds of you cannot kill even a single one of the demons, and yet you have the audacity to report your pathetic failure to everyone here? What a pity. Faith Len mocks Marxian heavily much to the horrified and revulsion of all the witnesses at the party. Careful with your mouth boy. The other worlders are more powerful than you think. Marxian shot back at this young man's insult of his own and institution's reputation in the arts of securing success. One of their most powerful demons was strong enough to take down the rainbow helms armed who were armed to the teeth with nothing but his bare hands. Marxian forewarned, remembering the Herculean strength of that one other worlder who bore a peculiar and expository garment called armor. You surely lie to cover your incompetence. What a bunch of pa, Faithland continued to mock then suddenly experiences a big pain in his cheek which he realizes that Lindis just slapped him. You have no right to mock my men like that. You have no idea what my men and I have faced against the demons. So, shut up and listen. Lindis pointed her finger to express her antipathy. You dare to slap me? I am a chosen one here. Faith Len gathered his wounded newly found pride and glared at the white elf. I do hope to defeat the demons. I demand you to. Ah. Faith Len stops as another slap from his other cheek appears, this time is from me to the crow. Can you for once listen to us? Chosen one Tilda? Mita spoke in a mocking tone. She was honestly starting to get sick and tired of this young boy's hubris. My people and I went through the same ordeal like the Sephidolid back in Tyrian. The demons are too powerful that not even in my long experience as a rogue could prepare me to face them. I lost almost all of my crows without even laying a finger at them. So, behave yourself chosen one Tilda. You must know who you are facing to not suffer like Micros or the Sephiliad. Mita knocked some sense into the brash young boy with her own brand of sly sarcasm directed on his newfound status. In the Crow Master's experience, Faithlen was acting like a bratty noble who let their status and wealth get into their heads. One moment, Lindis. This is him? Marxian's eyes widened as he turned to his spy master who only silently nodded. The young boy in knightly armor was the chosen one of the sacred crystal heart's choosing. This juvenile Hutzpu is going to be the bane of the demons and the savior of the world. Within Marxian and Lindis lurk a disdain for the young boy, they did, however, catch themselves in the moment when all eyes darted towards them and practiced restraint. In fighting will achieve nothing today. I also bring more grave news. Marxian bowed again while clasping his two hands. What could possibly be worse than a city overrun with demons? Alden asked. The princess, young Aliathra of the Lethal Line, was spotted in Suvil. She was leading the demons into the city. Marxian lied. His little rendezvous with the surviving embassy staff of Suvil gave him very horrifying accounts on the princess appearance in the duel of the Dragatoy Eyes Coast. This causes Lindis to turn pale while intriguing the rest of the onlookers. The elven spymaster had learned little of what became of her old classmate. She only prayed that the wilds of the land gave her swift death so she may be returned to the soil as Neneth's words say, from earth, you came. Thus to the earth, you will return. One of the Lyth the line? This is terrible news. Oin desponded. He knew full well that the Lethers were one of the proudest bloodlines of magically adept mages in all of the known world. Their kin produced some of the best mages the Athylan Entente had to offer able to perform the spells of widely differing schools of magics. The family were considered Nikon and a major sponsor of the college from the very beginning. He had heard of stories from his still-seeing days of how Princess Aliath res achievements from the college's sister institution, Pavia's Ivory Tower Academy. I cannot believe it. She has fallen so much. Where did we go wrong? Petcha sulked down. I share your plight Petcha. 
we simply cannot take more of all of this, Lindis expressed her solidarity. These other worlders have made all of their people's recent defeats so so more personal. She silently swore to herself that she will tear down these other worlders by any means that she could and know how to do. How will I tell this to her parents? The elven ambassador mourned. You may allow me. I am a personal friend of the royal family. It's best I relay of her passing. Lindis volunteered. Mativna guide her. The nobility collectively mourned. A moment of silence was given for everyone to mourn for a young woman whose life was dashed away so suddenly. Hearing of the princess' demise and the possession and corruption of her body, made Faithlan boil with rage. He will gladly avenge this princess or if possible, rescue her soul from the moors of these demons so she may rest in peace and of the white elf's eternal gratitude. He could already imagine the immaculate elf maiden, or just an image of the most beautiful woman imaginable. Twisted into a parody of metal and flesh with black eyes and claws seething with heinous intent to spread itself until all that is beautiful in Gleesia is wiped clean. This time, there will be no shortage of volunteers. Now is the day and now is the hour my lord. Owen stepped in. Today Suville. Tomorrow could be a herring point. All around the emperor, from his best and brightest to the most accomplished and influential members of his court and inner circle began to gather around Dulden, encircling him in a council of his entire cabinet. He saw his ministers standing alongside ambassadors and diplomats. We must march down to Suville and retake it from these barbarians at once, Owen said. We must also march down to Terian and put down the traitorous Prince Clovich at once. We should divide our forces into two. One will march down to our fortress near the border which will contain the main bulk of our men while the rest will reclaim Suville before the demons are allowed to gain a foothold. Hubert counseled. Yes, yes, pose a blockade between us and Tyrian. We must accept that our border vessel is lost now. How many of our forces should we allot and how long could it take to get them all? The Emperor asked. If I remember including the garrison already inside Little Hill. I say we can attach about 65,000 troops within or at nearby New Orgonia and Vercourt. I can tap into our existing reserves and with your blessing enforce conscription on several of our provinces, the commander of the legion declared. We can just have the Slavas step up their raids on the southern colonies and the eastern deserts, the emperor coldly said. The mages of the college will stand by your side and await any order, research or for combat, we will provide, we will assist you just as we have always, Lindis stepped in, I can easily dispatch an army of the Entente's best soldiers alongside led by none other than Prince Valorian Lertha, son of King Islan Lertha, as for Clan Kerfalda, you will need weapons, lots of weapons that we can provide, iron, silver, stone. Actocolite and Scandonite too. The dwarven diplomat added, that is more than enough. Alden smiled, and Faithlen. You, you already know what to do. He pointed to the chosen one. Go to Little Hill and beat back the demonic hordes. Of course, I will do. Faithlen jumped quite over enthusiastically for everyone in the room for such a clamorous time like now. After you get you and your party the weapons you need from the dwarves, I will be sending you and the people I have provided to the Estal Rock Mountains and obtain the Atokalite and Scandinite ores which will be forged into weapons. You will need it. Treat the gifts that the Empire has given you with care. The fate of the world rest on you and the other two chosen ones. The Emperor notified. Follow me and Petcha's advice and we will get through this together boy. March of Grashen S4 nodded fatherly. May we provide a say in this? A grumbling voice emerged from the crowd. To everyone's surprise, the source of the voice was from a Dawson shaman of the Lupine Voliudi tribe who had earlier visited the Herring Point alongside his feline Kotia Udi and the Taurus Spikerly Udi colleagues on their self-imposed investigation on the so-called change in the winds. Their crude garments and the smell of animalistic fur permeate the pleasant aroma and atmosphere of the halls of the Imperial Palace. Some of the attendants from the sophisticated elves and slightly less decent folks of the human nobility gagged at their wild visages. The winds flow curiously and the earth bewails every day ever since me and my fellow shamans left our villages. 
The Voliudi said his word. Forget it beastman. Faith Lend ejected. You should just all stay out of our way. Everyone in the college and in Alpha Nora knows that your magic called shamanism is weak. Faith Len belittled. Several of the Slay each and upper classes quietly joined in Faith Len's aspersion of the malodorous beast folk that had dared display themselves in the Herring Point, the very heart center of their hated enemies. It is not weak, distinct, the Voliudi shaman said. Why are you here beast folk? To ask for your ancestral lands back? Emperor Alden asked. No. This is more important than ancestral squabbles. We had heard of the eternal sky screaming and the earth becoming sorrowful. These outsiders, the upset the balance of the world greater than anything this world has seen in its annals of its antiquity, the shaman said. Which is why we are going to Little Hill and destroy them don't you get it on your dim barbaric brain of yours? Alden said. You are like a mountain, tall and imperial. What the winds whisper to us is like a flood a deluge. We will not survive if you proceed like this further. Flow is required, the shaman forbode. What do you know of war? Beast folk? Faith Len asked with his voice raised and seething with discrimination. And what do you know of composure? We heard your reckless gloating moments ago. Showing your affront like a child would brandish a new toy, the shaman said. Pardon me but I am the chosen one here. Faith Len beat his breast upon this aggrievement. How is that a defense? You lack compunction. The shaman bluntly discharged, now with his ego scorned, Faithlen stepped forward leaping his knee towards the shaman and with the conjunction of his index and middle finger of his right hand let loose a lightning bolt at the shaman, he was not going to let this detractor get away with such a misdeed. All such barbarians just never understand the empire and what it stood for, yet the Voliudi shaman smirked, the human's attack was wild with all of its power over sheer strength. No subtlety, just raw power for its own sake. A critical mistake. Calmly, the shaman waved his hand into the air and as the bolt struck his hand harmlessly. In a split second, the beast folk redirected the gui of the chosen one's attack right back at him sending the young boy flying back a couple of feet on his bottoms. Why you? I will. Faith Len recoiled as he prepared another magic spell. But as the energies conjured around his hands, the Gweninager felt a force wrap around his body on every inch and on every limb. He tried to move but the said force stopped him in place. He was paralyzed. This is all pointless, Owen shouted. His hand thrust forward as runic symbols projected on his arm. It was a hold person spell he cast on the chosen one. Grandmaster, what are you doing? Faith Len asked. Shamani, I apologize. I think it is time to take your leave. Owen turned to the Dawson. The three shamans humbly bowed to the Grandmaster, turned tail and left quietly. But before the Voliudi stepped away from the boundaries of the banquet hall's grand doors he looked with his astute slit eyes at Faith Len who was promptly released from the hold person spell that his colleague by practice relieved him of the inconvenience of. The lupine humanoid scoffed at him dismissively as he walked away. The young boy was debarred from pursuing the beast folk shamans further by the timely intervention of the adults whom he had unceremoniously disparaged. I want my cad for Dogen Elang and the Argelwi Decipherath of Herring Point to my study immediately. This is war, the Emperor ordered. All nodded in agreement. The legionary generals and the Argelwi Decipherath or the Law Lords, a group of nobles in charge of the day to day law and order of every duchy in the Empire from the courts to the foot patrols and the firemen. This subclass of nobility is often a place where one can achieve much honor and prestige that is equally meritocratic between noblemen and commoners alike. One such Marchog Jifraith, a law knight, was a reputable young woman of unkept allure blonde hair and green eyes with a silvery yet slightly stained armor by the name of Helene Lusnol. A former orphan who grew up with a first-hand account of many great injustices brought forth by the abused, the lost and the mutilated of her city Herring Point's slums. This gave Helene oil by her friends and little siblings back at the orphanage situated near the Grand Cathedral a notable sense and desire of justice and parity to cleanse the streets of moral filth and decay in the cobblestone streets of the city and if she played her cards correctly, she believed she can make a difference beyond the capital's walls. 
She was tutored by the nuns who administered the orphanage on the belief of the feudalistic harmony and austere social leagues especially the bottom-down foundations of commoners in upholding the sovereignty of the empire alongside the nobility. A society just and cordial is what she dreamed, and these other worlders seek to tear down everything that she holds dear as the most important people needed for the Emperor's emergency war council was for at least one person, dragged literally to the table. Both and Faith Len held on to the mutual belief that they must protect their nation from those who seek to do it harm, for, it is likely she will patrol in between the cathedral and slum district of Herring Point again as per her usual orders. Yet she doesn't mind, she was familiar with the people and in turn, the people are familiar with her and they all adore her with well wishes, favors and smiles from her. She was even courted occasionally by some of the handsome young sailors and foot soldiers who live by the slums. As for Faith Len, the Gwenanager will have to embark on the perilous journey to the Astaroks to obtain the materials he needs to forge his bequeathed band of the Empire's best and brightest to the ultimate demon slaying corp the likes of which the world had ever seen, but still. He can't help but keep his bitter bit eyes from the beast folk shamans who had humiliated him of his god's given gifts. He continued to dart his eyes towards them as the three shamans exited the banquet hall. Let me go Grand Master, I must teach this barbarian a lesson. Faith Len kicked and screamed. There are more important things right now than beast folks today chosen one. Owen argued as he dragged Faith Len away from public view in order to prevent him from further embarrassing himself. The Dawson departed quietly, with disappointment sketched into their faces over this childish sight. You desire to fight, to oppose, to defy, but you do not know how to truly fight. If you wish to do, then come to the northern lands and find the skyward throne. The Voliudi shaman turned round and said unto Faith Len and gave his parting words, We will be waiting, dash. Clovich and his entourage's bellies were being treated like pigs, in the sense that they gorged themselves silly with all the selection of foods that Prime Minister Bowskit exposed him to. From the French, beef begignan, the American mac and cheese and quite requested, Japanese sashimi of the quality of Michelin-starred meals provided by Earth's best chefs, their tables, that they shared with the mild-mannered Prime Minister and his flabbergasted fellow party members was if a tornado had assaulted the fine china and silverware within the Palais du Parlement's banquet hall. Clovich and his followers skipped the utensils entirely all eating their fill like famished children. If it were up to the chefs for this feudalistic's behavior, they would have kicked them out into the streets if they had done this in their own restaurants. But the Prime Minister stayed their hands. He simply ate his five-course meal with his reservations. He is allowing them to be seduced by their world's gifts and if that means turning the banquet hall into a pigsty to achieve this goal, then so be it. Thankfully this affair is closed behind guarded doors. This is divine. Clovich smiled as he gorged himself on a bowl of steaming mac and cheese. It was like edible gold that melts in his mouth to his eyes as he dug in with his naked paws which reddened with every grasp he took. Ouch! It's quite hot though. He complained, shaking off the meal's heat. You are supposed to eat that with a spoon. Bazki bluntly said. This is a soup. Clovich eyes widened, blinking his eyes and looking down on the table again. He noticed to his horror that the shiny objects laid before him in thin silvery finery were in fact not decorations for the table but actually the utensils that were cast aside to make room for their glutinous platter's ways. I, forgive me, Prime Minister, I am so used to eating with a wooden spoon and my bare hands. I didn't recognize all of these, he apologized, his face pink in his chagrin, his entourage too, it is okay. I can never be mad at you. You are a very curious one, aren't you? Am I right? Bazka leaned forward. Indeed. Your food is delicious. How often do you nobles feast like this? Clovich asked. Oh, I am no noble. I am merely a servant for I come from a family of merchants. The Prime Minister smiled humbly. And the food you see is eaten quite often by both the rich and poor alike. You eat meats often? Clovich asked holding the earthenware platter of beef begignan, 
Meats were rarely eaten in the on the average diet of the medieval Gleasons. Livestock were valued for their productive capacities of providing fresh milk, eggs and wool. When an animal is to be slaughtered, the effort, the preparation and the knowledge to cook a meat dish was tedious and expensive and only reserved for special occasions or at the very least at the end of the day, but even then, choices were limited to poultry and dried cuts of mystery meats. But here on earth, it was all a land of plenty. Of course, our lands are very prosperous. Bazka nodded. And the fish. Look at this fish. I have never seen fish so chewy, so fat. Klovich commented on the cut's raw fish called sashimi that he ungracefully grabbed from the serving plate onto his own that lay haphazardly on the tomato-based stew of the beef begignan, tainting its cold flesh in blood-red sauce. Fish at least the only one found in Tiriani is a small creature and come in schools that jump around in their migratory paths along the Principality's river. Fondly called the Gerin, it is served raw with the bones and head removed leaving its body and tail behind, then marinated in vinegar or brine. It is then served with chopped aromatic vegetables alongside some bread to mop of the sour taste. Upon occasion, Klovich would often eat the fish freshly caught by his cousin when he is invited to go to Suville again, but even that, there came in so many shapes and sizes when served on his plate since they were often served whole that he got scared of eating any other piscine creature except good old Jerin, yet this sashimi as the earth human called it, tasted just like that little fish back home yet in a much thicker cut and peculiarly different colors of flesh like red slightly golden and pink. Ah, the sushi. I had the chef and the fish fly in all the way from Japan to serve it to you. I didn't want to risk something too complicated so I stuck with French, American and Japanese food. Bazka gave his thoughtful words. Japan? I have heard of this. Japan before. By your friend, Governor White. Klovich said. His ears twitched with excitement when the Prime Minister mentioned that land where King Meiji came from. Ah. The land of the rising sun, one of the best places to go to in our world. Bazki proudly declared, what is it like there, in Japan? I want, I want to know, what became of King Meiji. Klovich pushed aside his pig pen of a plate to firmly place his elbows forward. As he inquired of his oh so similar ditto, Meiji? Well, quite a lot, I can say that his country took with the current time of his day. 10 to 20 years that took his country ahead of his neighbors in what took his teachers a century to obtain. He was very smart, curious, loves to see new things, just like you. I can see it in your eye, you have his fire. Bazka gave his flatteries. You're too kind dear host. Klovich waved. I wish to ascend the way he has ascended. The governor and my guide friend told me that you are to give me some sort of contract like the one I had signed to show peace and coevality with your people between my Tyrian and your new Albany. He asked. You're quite too eager for your own good. But then again, Meiji was the same when he was in your footsteps. Bazka wiggled his finger as he leaned back on his chair. It is best first you understand what you are truly getting yourself into first. So tell me. Prince Klovich, why do you pursue us? The Prime Minister asked. This primitive native in their likeness was indeed too eager. Too eager for his own good. Basket weighed the benefits against the possible drawbacks of giving this prince, a vassal no less. What if, the primitives use their technology wrong and get themselves hurt or worse by its improper usage? What if, the primitives turn their weapons and the knowledge they learned from them against them. Or perhaps what if youth technology fell onto the hands of various unscrupulous individuals? He can already imagine goose stepping skeleton armies armed with assault rifles. It had started with my sister Arya. Klovich confessed. This one sentence awakened Bowski from the amoral chaotic and cutthroat realm a youth prime minister experiences in the all too cruel dance of earthling macro politics, he may be hardened by such experiences throughout his career but he never forgot the party's roots founded upon the principles for what they believe is a united and harmonious society for all of Gaia's children. Klovich's concern for his sister's previous plight, that was what made him join the party and rose to be its vanguard, decades ago. I know. 
Born crippled correct but our doctors made her walk again. Bazka said but he phrased his response in a vein for confirmation. She is. The one thing that makes me wake up at night. Every day. Her smiling or just being by my side every day. Ever since my father died and I have become the Prince of Tyrian. It was all just. How would I say? You, Klovich stuttered. His face showed weakness as his eyes reddened into the state of emotional delicacy. Hard to keep things together, like make everything work? Baz asked. Indeed, Klovich nodded. Being a vassal, most of the tariffs that go in and out of my citadel ends in the coffers of the Empire. I barely have enough money to outlay the costs of my army, the walls and the well system. When your people showed up to my door, I thought you were just charlatans, seeking to drain me another chip of my ducats. But when you asked for almost little in return for making my sister finally be able to walk, I was. I thought I was dreaming, Klovich said. Go on. Basket followed. He nodded quite excessively, as if this leader that Klovich sees as if he was trying to play him as a stooge. This offended the prince, but he knew that Alash now will have him crawling back to Tyrian empty-handed or in a platter. Then I saw you built these towers. Of power. Oh that rhymes. Klovich lightly chuckled, recomposing himself back to his in-between tone of cursory language with a bit of beseeching diplomatic forethought to his next words. Allowing the people, young, old, rich and poor, a respite from their plight of famine, banditry, and other likes. You know what I see right now? Klovich leaned forward as if directly vying for the Prime Minister's undivided attention. See what your Majesty. Bazka steepled his hands while leaning back on his lofty chair. I see your world of earth free of famine, banditry and all other forms of discord. You prove yourself that you wield incredible power like gods yet you hold back. Why? Klovich asked. Bazka laughed. I am as human as you. And those ills that you speak of, famine, banditry and all the rest? We still have them every now and then, the prince sulks down in shame. These beings weren't as godly as he had thought, yet you see here, there is a difference between you and I. Dot is that we learned from them. Bazk explained, learned from them? Klovich asked, you came here to learn right? Bazk inquired for confirmation. Sweet your words are about us. But we are not gods, yet you wish to learn of our ways, how we build our people, how we build from nothing so quickly, is it not the reason why you travel from your humble abode to my palace? Yes, Klovich nodded, for a start, all those problems with your medieval folk experience on a daily basis, as I said we are not immune to them just like you, yet the difference here is that we learn from them, we learned what causes famine, banditry and all that stuff. We rose to the challenge and today whenever they rear its ugly head, we know how to alleviate them. To work around them, Klovich said. So, you are not gods, but you have the wisdom of one. That is most unusual. May I also ask, you keep using that word. Me deval, Klovich pointed out. Basket gulped. Looks like he needs to twist his words slightly next. In the end of the day prince, you are here because you are benighted, unlearned. WWE, I mean frail and you come to me seeking knowledge, wisdom, and strength whether you want to admit it or not. You expect perfection, we are more than imperfect you see, but then again, if we are all perfect there can never be any room or desire for growth or to go beyond that boundary. The thing is, your first lesson is being taught right now here in this very room. Bask informed him. You are teaching me. Us right now? Klovich stuttered, almost forgetting his personal conversation was overheard by his entourage of sages, knights and other noblemen he had brought alongside him. Yes. And if I may warn you, if you don't get this lesson now then don't even bother asking for my patronage. Bazka sternly said. What is this lesson you are teaching me this moment? Klovich asked his voice in the tone of a demand. This extravagant fellow who allowed himself the time to have audience with him was speaking in riddles and half answers. Klovich was not the type of individual to have his patience tested nor someone who would give up so easily. He wanted. 
He needed this power that these earthlings possessed. He could no longer bear the sights of such ills that he hears, sees and touches about as he administered his state. These earthlings were the key yet they hesitate. Not a good sign. Bazkus nickered, but allow me to cut to the chase. He smiled. The Prime Minister stood up from his chair and with stout strength, he shoved aside the elegantly clothed table that separated him and Clovich from each other. Much to the piqued curiosity of everyone in the room, he stretched his arms out and waved them around, releasing the tension that his body endured previously when he enjoyed his Michelin-starred feast with the other worlders. You see all of this? My palace, New Albany, the spaceships. Or boats as you would call it? He asked to the prince. Clovich silently nodded. It took years, decades and centuries to get here on this moment. The Prime Minister orated. I don't understand. You built New Albany within a month. How can you say that it took years? Clovich scratched his head. Innovation. Change. It takes time. Lots of time. Many people before me took decades. Five to be exact for Ozai Corporacy to figure out how to build a fully functioning settlement with the likes of New Albany. The progenitors of this momentous goal. To build a city in an instant was a dream that they weren't able to see for five decades, for they all died before its completion. Bazka said, That is tragic to hear. Clovich frowned. Yet, the progenitors of Project Second Eden laid the foundation for our vast reaches to the stars, none of our interstellar empire could be possible for their sacrifices and the groundwork they left behind for their successors for without that initial first step, we won't have a Kesselheim, a Mars or a New Albany. Do you understand what I am saying? Baz kinched close to Clovich, that, I must humble myself? Are you teaching me humility? Clovich answered. You're getting there but the point is this. Bazka tailed his finger as he smiled knowing now that he and the prince have a mutual understanding of one another. You will likely not see the world you want to see within your lifespan. Your world needs time. Time to accept us, to understand us, to aspire like us. In a fair bit of warning, you may too not like what you will learn after we are done tutoring you, or worse may not yet understand it fully until much later. There will be times where even your best men would revile you. Other times you will see your once enemies become your sworn ally. There will be times when your people stumble and fall. But in time, they will join you as you cross the bridge to the next stage. Take in fact your friend King Meiji. He had to actually fight his own countrymen at best destroy some of the very core traditions of his nation at worst. Basket explains his lesson. I, I see. Clovich humbly moped. The more he learns of this King Meiji the more depth his character becomes. Perhaps he will visit his country within the duration of his mission. The Terayani prince needs to know more about him. I believe that not even my liege lord, Emperor Alden would take so kindly at first to your presence. He probably already knows of your arrival right now. I did give him a letter explaining what is happening and I hope he will come to an understanding. Well that would be good if he did. I would be glad to show him what I will show you. But tell me Prince Clovich Ryan, are you willing to plant the seeds of the first step for your people to brighter tomorrow? Even if you may not live to see its fruits? Baz asked. Clovich paused. He knew that deep down. Going down this path with the United Federation would be a point of no return for him. He saw their awesome strength, their overwhelming wisdom of eldritch knowledge, and the fortitude of steel these earthlings possessed. Yet as the Prime Minister says, this will take time and the transition to the future he dreams of a new Tyrian. A new empire. A new Xenograd. A new Gleesia will only happen if he took the first step for them. He even knew that many of them would try to worm their seductive voices of riches in exchange for pieces of his honor and soul for example the Uber Merchant Guild Apar Ro Corp. He knew that beneath the smiles of one B. Yankin was the glibora of a very ruthless venture capitalist. They may be an independent third party, but even then, their influences within the trade routes gossips have been creeping and upsetting to behold. Their blessings, alongside the rightful authority of the youth's common state party have their prices. Land, titles, authority, 
sacrifices than many of a weak will would wince upon a second thought or foolhardily jump into its more only to be turned into a puppet in the very end living in a gilded cage. It is how would Clovich turn whatever blessings he receives to something to hope and believe for tomorrow that matters for him. The future is inevitable. It's just that what will he do next to shape it? I accept, Clovich decided. Then let the lesson begin. Bazka snapped his fingers. Chapter 36, Open Your Eyes Aliathra. She has a heart of stone. The Nenith Oath Taker condemned with an equally denunciatory finger that pierces her soul. No. My heart remains pure. Did they promise you with power, money, immortality? Her old friend Lindis beseeched in disbelief. Her sorrowful overture shared with everyone else in that cold Vercourt barracks on that fateful day. They showed me another world, another way. You will die here demon. Eriand convicted her for the abyss. With her sword raised in her dutiful act of purgation of all threats to the Eth Island people as sworn by a rainbow helm. Stop this madness. I am still Aliathra Lethe, royal princess of House Lethe. Our daughter? She can hear the collected voice of her parents, King Islan and Queen Illusun. Dear sister of mine. Then followed by her older brother and sister, Valorian and Ithiel who spoke in unison. For shame, for shame on you. Oh, woeful travesty of the esteemed Lethe lineage. You, Aliathra Lethe. Supposed pew maiden of our sacred bloodline, now corrupted, tainted beyond redemption in your mind, body and soul. Her entire family renounced her. No, this cannot be. I remain Ecclesiastes Neneth, goddess of life. I did not wish nor desire to. You are not good enough. Please. Our Eliathra is dead. You are never a warrior nor a cleric. You will never be good enough. She can hear her family banish her. No, Aliathra opened her eyes, and let out a great shriek. A loud crash from a metal tray unbalanced Dr. Lee Hainal causing the elf seers to reverberate violently as Aliathra's breathing quickened. Oh dear, please calm down, Dr. Lee Hainal consoled her whilst she picked up her tray of medical tools, but hey, at least you are awake. She smiled sweetly. What happened to me? I remember a fire. Blood and Aliathra rasped, but she felt the soft warmth of Dr. Lee Hainanol's hand placed behind her. Examining closely her surroundings, Aliathra noticed that the same monotonous white walls and the scent of chemical medicine bubbling around her that she was again inside New Albany's military hospital under the tender care of Dr. Lee Hainwell, a physician of repute that the elven princess has come to deeply respect for her healing abilities without the aid of magic or arcane instruments. You are back in New Albany now Miss Lethe. You are safe heard with me. The doctor's lithe voice comforted the elf's But, I remember. The fire. My eyes. They were seared by Irian's fire magics. W -wa, am I dot all right? Aliathra sobbed. About that, Dr. Lee Hainanol stammered. Is. It. Aliathra equally stumbled in her speech. Her heart feared the very worst. Yet a part of her wishes the pain she saw, felt and inflicted upon herself. Her people and her family were all just a dream. But it was for naught, as the baby-faced doctor of Korean descent presented to the elf a transparent container, a glass jar filled with a transparent preservative liquid. Retained securely within a bare pinkish white jellies with a crimson rope linked to the said blobs. By the end of the crimson rope, was faint stains of blood coating the colorless preservation liquid in rows. It wasn't rope, to Aliathra's horror. They were blood veins. Even her arcane sensitive elven physiology can detect the faint traces of magic left behind in that macabre model. She felt the gui of both Irian's fire magics and her own restoration magic still left innate by those two slime blobs that were once her immaculate as your eyes. You suffered an ocular chemical burn to your eyes which unfortunately permanently blinded you. Dr. Lee Hainanul gravely informed her. That is. Impossible. I. Can still see right? Aliathra stared at the doctor's hazelnut eyes in disbelief. My surgeons had to replace your two burnt eyes with new ones. The doctor informed her. Eyes. Cybernetic eyes. Aliathra wailed. In her heart, 
she is beginning to feel she is straying further and further away from her goddess's light. She wanted Morn, to lay bare to Neneth in her darkest hour to show her a sign, anything that could alleviate the stigmata on the elf's soul. But to her appended dread as she clawed her face with her lithe hands in a bid to forcefully expel her anguish but all she could only shed was one doleful tear. Not nearly enough to extirpate all the repressed cogitation within her mind and soul. In such an emergency, her body exhausted her burden through her delicate nurse's malachite sinus fluid escaped from her nose. Dr. Lee Hainwell, seeing the elf's grief, grabbed three pulls of tissue paper from a box and offered the cloths to Aliathra. Blow, she said. Grabbing the napkin, Aliathra released the frustrated agitation onto those pieces of cloth with a half a dozen of stern mutation with the help of her breath. After her expulsion of air, Aliathra looked away from the good doctor who stood beside her with a serene smile as the elf faced herself in the mirror. Gazing on her reflection, the elven princess can see her hair lay loose and the skin on her face abnormally paler than she could remember. She was marginally encouraged when she noticed that her ocean blue eyes were still maintained despite the artificial nature of her new pairs. Tracing her head with her finger, Aliathra shivered in cold fear as she felt her lustrous skin was smoothly being glided over, but as she traced her face towards her cheeks, the elf's sensitive nerves felt an anomalous fluctuation painted on the surface, as if there was a noticeable gap end in between a certain point on her face. Standing up from the bedside with her two prosthetic legs, Aliathra examined herself on the mirror closer. Still holding her finger over the anomalous area, the elf zoomed in closely to her horror. There were two subtle borderlines, barely visible at a closely efforted glance, on her skin stretched from above her forehead all the way down to her cheeks. What? Did you do to me? Aliathra returned to Dr. Lee Hainwell, the surgeons. They had to perform plastic surgery on your face in addition to installing your new pair of eyes. I am sorry. The doctor apologized. Aliathra's legs collapsed, again attempting to wail mournfully but alas, only one tear was shed on her eyes. Falling again at the same edge of despair when she found out about her previous injuries, the elf and no means to stop her body from being further overrun by these otherworldly devices now working in tandem with her elven body. But now, given her exocommunication from her own people, there was nowhere left to go but forward with these other worlders now as the elf hated to admit, to humble, to lay prostrate to this new power. She even felt like she wanted to worship it. This is it. Aliathra wept. She looked at her palms as the sparse sum of tears she shed fell onto their surfaces. There was no longer an Aliathra anymore just pieces of machinery extracted from lifeless stone to be made for profit, instead of the grace of her goddess's selfless benefaction of her own creation. She had tried to deny the fact that she was being kept alive by these mechanical parodies of her gifts from Neneth, she tried to unleash her anger on Samantha and the rest of the UFAE, she tried so hard at first to purge the otherworldly filth in rapturing her soul fell in the deepest darkest pits of despair and out that crevice. All that was left for her was to accept what she has become. A demon. Just like all of the UFAE. My dear, everything is all right. Dr. Lee Hainanol knelt down and sat down on the ground next to her. She placed her hand atop Haley Aethra's back as she intimately grasped her body closer to hers. In all of her few young years as a physician, the good doctor had never had a patient who was emotionally fragile as Aliathra or Ether. How? Don't you know that those corrupted with demonic power like this heart of mine will use these powers for evil? Aliathra looked at the doctor. You are not evil Miss Lertha. By your own logic, you cannot perform those holy spells that you could do. Go on, try it. On yourself, the doctor challenged. Wiping away her face, Aliathra waved her hands around and without effort, conjured a palm-sized luminous golden ball of holy magic, enough to ward off any creeping corruptions or evil presence, which astounded the elf as she didn't feel its soft glow rent her asunder. But, how? Aliathra asked. You are still good and I know it. Dr. Lee encouraged her, shaking her hand to excite her. Why else did you agree to heal those sick people afflicted with that demon bane poison? I, I, 
didn't want them to suffer no longer. You and the people of Tyrian alike. They all writhed in agony as the poison tore them apart. Aliathra answered, Would an evil person do that? The doctor reasoned, No, I devoted my life, body, and soul to the goddess Neneth to heal the afflicted and allay all the pain and injustice in all of Gleesia. Then you are not being evil or turning into evil at all Aliathra. The doctor advocated, You still tried to help your people back in the embassy, right? You gave them the chance to run away when you could as a demon just cut them down right there and there. You wish to seek peace yet your kind wishes to see all that they do not understand to be destroyed, she reasoned. In fact, for the elf, she did see the hypocrisy hidden beneath her people's lofty statuses when Dias and even she pointed every little dirty secret that the Cephidliad does to maintain their thylan interests in all of Gleesia through such harmfully subversive means to maintain such power. Such against the teachings of Nanith which say to respect and cherish all life, not belittle and stunt. But as Aliathra's heartbeat paced. She still remembers the Oath takers of Nanith's denunciating words, she has a heart of stone, but my body, these. It corrupted my flesh. These augmentations. They turned my body into one like yours. The elf lamented. What proof do you have that cybernetics are evil? Because what other people told you. You never stopped and take a look at why is it evil? Do you know what an augmentation is Miss Lytha? The doctor asked. The elf gave pause for a moment. In her self-loathing and self-righteous despair, this word augmentation was an alien concept just as the United Federation was to Gleesia. She turned back to the doctor and balked. It means to increase in our language. Your heart, your legs, and your eyes they are superior in every way. Better stamina, more durability, faster stronger and better vision. You should be happy that what those injuries have taken didn't kill you but allowed you to come back stronger. Why? Because perhaps maybe the powers that be know that you, Miss Lethe can still do so much good in this world. In my experience, your world of Gleesia needs more people like you. Augmentations help improve the potential in the people that it is installed with. By your own logic as a healing priestess, cybernetics end goals are the same as your restoration magics. To heal. To improve. To strengthen. The doctor lectured. She couldn't believe how wrong she was. She had to say. Her legs and heart alone made her much swifter and more vigorous compared to before. Her magic was still unimpeded despite her recent changes and deep down, Aliathra still held the beliefs to her heart of Neneth's healing grace deserving of all those who seek the shelter of her hearth. You, you are right. Aliathra lightened up. I can still do good. I can still make this right. For me, for my people and all Glee easier. She smiled. Good girl. I am proud of you. The doctor cheered. So, what sort of magical abilities do my eye? Aliathra optimistically inquired about her cybernetics when suddenly, M.A. Ganda 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 Diaz's voice and his own image appeared on the corner of Aliathra's eye. The elf recoiled backwards, her heart skipping a beat, blinking hard. She thought it was an illusion of her own delusion but no matter how much the elf tried to slap herself back to the realm of sanity as she knows, the more Diaz smiled coyly. Le Dewey Hanuel, I can see, I see Sir Vincent. Aliathro exclaimed. Diaz, he is not here. Oh, yeah. About your eyes Miss Lytha. Dr. Lee Hanenol stood up your eye comes equipped with an 8G cellular data communicator. Eh what? Aliathra asked. You can now talk to us from far away Ali. Diaz explained. How are you? How's the surgery? You with Iris now? Diaz asked. Iris is here too? Aliathra asked. No just Iris. I'm at the supermarket right now buying snacks for Samantha. Crocker made me if you ask. Diaz replied. But how? What? I, I don't understand. Aliathra further questioned. Her cheeks flushed with embarrassed confusion. You have installed on your head an Aparo Pharmaceuticals IC Vision Enhancement Package with 8G Ethernet connection. Plus, I managed to find an eye model that matches those blues of yours. Diaz winked. But how can I see, and hear you when you... You are not really here? Aliathra asked. The beauty of 8G Ethernet Haley, 
I just wanted to check out if your video call receptors are working properly. Tell the doc I'm sorry if I am interrupting anything but let me say, with Don Aparo's compliments to your practice. Diaz clicked his mouth. What is he saying? The doctor asked. Compliments to your practice by Don Aparo. Aliathra answered. Thank you. Lee Hainanel half-heartedly acknowledged. Look here, it's about Samantha right now and she really needs your help. Can you do that for her? Go with Iris to Sammy. I'm all holed up here buying some Doritos and spaghetti for the squad right now. Diaz asked. Do what for her? Aliathra asked. Do what for who? Dr. Lee Hainanel asked. I just want to let you know that just because you can see and hear Vinny doesn't mean I can too. What is Vinny asking? He wants me to see Samantha with Iris. Aliathra answered. Oh, I know what that is. Well. For the sake of what I told you that you can still do good Miss Lathra. You should go to her. Hainanol said. Why? Aliathra asked. She has done so much for you. To help you when you were injured and hurt from your legs and your heart. Now it's your turn to heal her. I cannot say all of the details here but it is best you come with Iris to her now. She will appreciate you being there. Hainanol said. Looking at the corner of her eye. Seeing Diaz smile enthusiastically to the same vein as Dr. Lee Hainwell. Aliathra's newfound resolve arose a new determination. She will make this right. There was too much to lose now for her to give up and sulk on her previous failures. Her people and all the easier have to see that these other worlders were nothing of the sorts of what the orators speak of demonic and destructive. She vowed to protect all life from harm. Now it is time to see her vow but into action. Dash. Under an inconspicuous hood to not betray her elven ears, Lindis waited impatiently inside the green cloth inn, a semi-shady establishment that serves the passing by mariners on shore leave and the everyday burkhudum of Herring Point's cosmopolitan systems. The little corner she managed to secure herself for her stay on the dining hall was dimly lit with a singular candle atop her stand which is, in fact, a repurposed CD-aged barrel oak. She had previously shooed off any previous attempts for the wenches to ask for her order, stating that she was expecting company. Eyeing the patrons present, coming and going for a moment's respite of their day-to-day -day lives, the Cephid Liad spymaster can see sailors intermingling with their peers, the rabble of society and even grey order adventurers. Not odd for the type of person she was waiting for since the guild's headquarters was only a block away. But he was waiting for a very specific of their lot in this enterprise. A superciliously erect man who had just entered the hall and asked to a table with a certain Madame Gwaithron. A rather common alias used for Cephid Liad agents when they need to contact anyone within a public setting, and was promptly directed to his destined way. Her eyes, locked with the adventurer's eyes and Lindis knew that it was none other than Radrid, known by his peers as the flagrant. R. Madame Gwaithron I presume? The dapper fellow approached Lindis' empty seat. You could have worn something more. Muted. Lindis commented on Radrid's flamboyant attire. A golden skinned leather Q iris with a complimentary violet gape is what he wore which infuriated Lindis towards the human's lack of subtlety to know the end as several of the inn's patrons gave sideward glances to their direction. Many of the Grey Order, the wait staff and a few of the mariners have heard of this fellow before. You summoned the great, handsome and charming Radrid. What do you expect? The adventurer shrugged. That is not the point sir. What if someone hears of this plan? Lindis pushed forward. We'll let them know. It's not like these days you are planning to do anything, shameful aren't you madam? He asked. It's not that the task is somewhat grey in matters sir. I have looked into your history and I know a thing you know that many others do not. Lindis said. Oh? Radrid leaned forward. His hand inching closer to his dagger as his instincts kicked in. He had done many morally dubious assignments throughout his years but he had always considered the contractual trust between him and his clients, his talents and charisma to keep him on top despite what he has done in the past ranging from personnel obtainment to item acquisition. The Emperor has recently given his blessing to the Chosen One and already this morning he and his retinue of the Empire's finest were dispatched on their quest to save the world, Lindis said. I have seen the procession, flowers, coinage, 
and cheers were given to them near the gates before their departure. From what I hear, their current destination is east. But Madame Guaytheran, I fail to see how that affects me. Petra Kadolf, you have a history together. Lindis took aim and played her card. That name alone awoke an emotion hidden inside the adventurer, an emotion of malicious resentment. How did you know? What is he up to? Is this job about him? Radrid asked. More of something that would get you more motivated for this job if you know what I mean, Lindis said. I do not know what you mean, Radrid bluntly answered. You see, you know that this chosen one is getting the best of the Empire has to offer. Knights, weapons, followers, all of the money of the work can buy? Well one of them includes no one other than Petrick Dorf himself, Lindis intrigued. I see. Radrid releases his tension, his interests now genuinely piqued. But tell me sir, first, why do you hate this Petra so much? Lindis asked, the golden-skinned adventurer sighed. It was a rather sordid affair to talk about his history with one of the Grey Order's diamond-ranked adventurers. You are right I am quite unhappy with what had transpired recently. First of all, why an infant and copper-ranked newbie can be chosen to carry the glorious task of vanquishing the demons and not someone more senior of a warrior like me in Grey Order or Knights in the Empire Knightly Orders. Secondly, why the Emperor didn't offer me and a lot of my fellow adventurers to at least escorting that brat to his quests. At least I can be his real mentor for on how to fight the demons. I am one of the best adventurers in the guilds. I am maybe gold ranked but I did more quests than that fancy faced Petcher and I am more pragmatic than his silly code of chivalry. We used to be squires back on our wee days under March of Grashiness Fawn. However, Petra was the one who managed to attain knighthood while I washed out. I shouldn't have been knighted as I was much more resourceful and zealous as he. Radrid shook his fist. I can see why. Lindis hid her amusement. Maybe because they often call you, Radrid the dishonest. Her research into this man yielded much more interesting bits about him than he would willingly divulge in front of her, essentially a stranger. You shut your tongue wench. The adventurer growled. His ego snapped. Do not tease me with that epithet. People might call me dishonest but I believe in a practical approach in combat because winning is everything in life. Why do people care so much about honor? In battle, it is a matter of glorious victory or shameful defeat. Radrid despite his flamboyant personality was equally in terms of intrinsic scale a charismatic fellow and a venal individual. He has a reputation perhaps a result of his resentment of being passed over for knighthood, to be a very unscrupulous combatant and a shrewd deal-maker, always seeking every possible advantage, honorable or not for himself, there was even a rumor that some of his magical paradoxically, he is popular with the more profit-driven and high-flying members of the Grey Order for his unique brand of generosity for those who follow him such as hosting lavish feasts on his tabs at various taverns across the land overflowing with decadent hedonism that even the Suvali would find excessive. His actions, however, have gotten him and some of his associates into trouble by the guild's administrative bodies but if it weren't for his previous achievements and relative popularity among low to mid-ranking adventurers, they tolerated him unless he gets caught in the act of something openly illegal. No need to hide anything from me Sir Radrid the flagrantly dishonest. I know everything and this mission shares your interests in showing that Pedja fellow whose prowess will reign supreme. Linda's honeyed words pierced the adventurer. She intrinsically gave a pompous smile over her clever usage of the adventurer's two-faced name. Color me intrigued. For now, I am listening. So, what great task shall I accomplish for you? Radrid relaxed his tension before he further inquired. Any mission that could get him to jockey upwards towards his goal of trumping Petra is a welcome opportunity, even if it does mean he has to undertake such dishonorable and clandestine tasks. Now reeled in, Lindis prepared her thoughtfully prepared little gambit. Do in part. This Radrid has no idea that he was being played like a fiddle to the Cephid Liad's machinations. Petrick Dorf is going to be at the vanguard of fighting these other worlders with the Chosen One Faithland but I have reasons to believe that this is not the best course of action, Lindis said. Faithland? 
That is his name? I heard he was pretty buoyant for someone who is about to undertake something so dire. I was there at the cathedral you see. Radrid commented. Indeed. Lindis nodded. I have a friend on the inside that the boy will take his sweet time trying to fulfill all of his quests before he could face the demonic threat. But by then, it could possibly be too late. The hooded elf gestured, spreading her hands open wide. Already the demons played their hand by attacking this fine city herself. Promptly, Lindis dropped on the table a small little ring at the middle of the table that caught Radrid's eyes. Upon closer examination, Radrid's body emitted cold sweat when he recognizes the obsidian and aviary symbolism the ring had engraved. You are with the crows? Radrid asked. Lindis, maintaining the lie, nodded. Meter, the crowmaster and some members of the College of Magi have shared several well-rationalized beliefs on how the Empire can best survive this crisis. It is just that Emperor and the Senate has been too focused on the theatrics of showing the people that their fears are being answered without seeing the bigger picture. Tell me Radrid, do you remember how the story goes of how Kuldelst Laejak defeated the first demonic army? Lindis described. Pardon me, but refresh me on the matter. I only remember Kuldel's duel with Allbone at the Battle of Marnia's Bluff. In the old legends, the demons nearly engulfed all of what will be the Empire today but their powers come at a very steep cost. Think about it for a moment Firen. How much power can these demons muster to summon up that giant cloud that terrorized the capital weeks ago? Allbone had to sell his soul and those of his followers for such powers. It is by the legends go, that if the demons especially their leaders should be exhausted by now and it's only a matter of time before they can regain their strength before they launch their assault into the Empire's heartlands, Lindis chronicled, you are right. Kuldel did slay many of Allbone's lieutenants and bodyguards in order to draw him out, Radrid affirmed, with many of their leaders dead. The demons became a disorganized lot and it was only Allbone himself that had kept them together. Besides, demons needed souls to fuel their powers so they must have nearly exhausted all of Tyrion to accomplish the feats they have done now. Think about it again Radrid. Why did the demons only demand that the Empire come to them to talk instead of barging inside of Herring Point already after decimating the navy and the Griffin Knights? Lindus reasoned because they were too exhausted taking over Tyrion to actually deal the killing blow. Radrid speculated. Exactly. Lindus leaned back and smiled. The demons must be licking their sores right now and the time is nigh to deal a decisive if not a crippling blow against them at Tyrion herself. Lindus says. Wait, you want me to go to Tyrion? Radrid asked. That's suicide. Surely you jest. He exclaimed, would I jest if this ancillary expedition was approved by the Emperor himself? Lindus rolled out a paper and passed it across to the Grey Order adventurer. Seeing the Imperial Seal, a blue wax in the shape of a dragon holding a sword and a cornucopia, the symbol of Imperial power, Radrid carefully locked the adhesive bindings of the parchment and examined the text closely. It had his official seal and also the seal of the Major of College that gave the entrustment of a treacherous mission to infiltrate the vassal principality of Tyrion and kill as many and take as many demonic items that they can manage to steal before the demons can muster a defense. A most handsome reward for those who can pass as much as they can carry of otherworldly materials to the College of Magi for intensive study. The money coming from straight from the Imperial Treasury. A promising initiative outside of waiting for the demons to come and holding the line of defense of the free and civilized world from the barbaric otherworlders with the additional prospect of profit looming on the horizon for those brave or foolhardy alike to venture south, could also help complement well for the preparation of the main defenses of Little Hill too as despite his previous apprehensions with Marchog Fawn, he still has a deep respect of the Slay Aegean Legion heirs. This is a raid and raise sort of assignment then? A smash and grab of sorts to damage and study as much of these demons as we can possibly can? Radrid asked. Lindus nodded. I see. Radrid looked down at the paper again. But this is a dangerous task even for the best of us. Radrid asserted. 
The details of the letter that the Cephid Liad agent gave him was treacherous in a way. Going down to a land beset overwhelmingly by demons to disrupt their recuperation processes and to acquire studying materials in order to research ways how to decisively vanquish the otherworlders once and for all was still quite a feat that even the legionnaires of the Empire could have a difficulty with. The protracted skirmishes with the Dawson and Black Tree, Tavikor saw battles were at a stalemate based on the news he had received. Unlike many enemies before, the demons prefer raw, individual power for all of their peons, warriors, and doyans. If we can overwhelm these barbarians with the sheer number at a time, they are at their weakest we could be able to avenge the display of humiliation and if our guards play correctly, defeat it in one blow. Imagine. You instead of Petra or that bratty copper-ranked adventurer Faithland being hailed as the hero instead of you, Linda's played into Radrid's aspirations for glory. Like for example, what if you so stumble upon the demon lord himself or Bone or whomever is his successor? Are you just going to let some shiny stone in a cathedral dictate everyone's life? Especially if one such opportunity for that big score presents itself? Surely you jest? Radrid questioned. And so surely, you never let fate dictate your destiny? Would you like to prove even the sacred crystal heart is wrong? Not just for you but for your fellow guild members that you can become the greatest of heroes? Linda's challenged. Grey Order adventurers, most especially impressionable and arising young ones or those who remain stagnated at the middle of the hierarchical pyramid of the guild have a sense of entitlement and hot-headedness unseen in other life paths. The promises of high rewards or the thrill of perilous risks can lure and intoxicate many people of all walks of life, fame, ducats, influence and the soothing consciousness of an honorable recollective legacy is what made the Grey Order one of the most fastest growing institutions in the world, with the unfortunate but oftentimes in a very tastelessly macabre sort of way, a high turnover rate, for every two adventurers who come in. One by the end of five years is made physically unable to continue adventuring whether willfully or not. Nonetheless, the hazards of an adventurer are counterbalances of the one elusive big score. It was why Radrid and so many like him offered themselves up for work in the Grey Order. It had its way of attracting some of the more improper of folks. I am still concerned about Tyrion even if I will be paid more than handsomely for research material. How can I be sure that this little invasion that the Emperor and the College concocted under the table could be more trouble than it is worth? Radrid asked. Again, you underestimate the crows. Linda swagged her finger to wave her superior position. Crowmaster Mita has been to Tyrion herself to scout out the demons. She has told me that although the battle was messy, they managed to take down as many of them as possible with only the Crowmaster herself escaping with her life. No way. Radrid's eyes widened. But before he could foolhardily jump into his big break, his cooler head prevailed over his enthusiasm. Hang on, but these are demons you are talking about. I will need some very potent weaponry to even stand a chance against one of them, even if they are weakened. Hold on. How many are there? Did the Crowmaster gave a good count? He asked. That can be provided by the Emperor just as he has generously bequeathed Faithlen and his retinue oh so he will generously bequeath to those who would have the heart to venture into the moors of which the other worlders came, Lindis said. And as for a count? I would say a few thousand, no less than a legion or maybe around that number, but it will grow for every day they are left to suppurate in Tyrian, she added. That's actually not too much if my memory of the legends serves me right, but then again, these are demons we are talking about, so of course, preparation will be key. With the materials, you say the Emperor can provide, but alas, I am but one man and if you add in my little cavalcade of crass champions, you have maybe, five men. Radrid counted. Oh. If only there is someone in the Grey Order that can convince May more of his kind to take in such a daring deed, Linda's fake despondency. Let me guess, that is where I come in, Radrid said. Indeed, you have the skills, the charisma, and the experience to lead such a band of crusaders. You can rally not only those in Herring Point but everywhere you can go until you reach the gates of Tyrion herself. All I just need is one thing, 
Lindis leaned forward to gesture for a whisper. Radrid promptly leaned his head forward as his left ear lay an inch cupped by the disguised elf's delicate hand and soothing voice that tingles the unscrupulous adventurer's ear. Despite all of this involving you and your fellow colleagues, this is not a Grey Order quest. Nobody must find out lest this opportunity of yours gets the unauthorized stamp by some bureaucrat, Lindus whispered. Radrid shuddered. An unauthorized stamp kills off any chances of fair compensation and any sort of growth in the guild's hierarchy and can also be causes for the law lords to intervene and arrest all parties involved. Then how can I gather people to this cause? Six won't be enough, Radrid asked. You have made more than those friends of yours in your travels have you not? Especially other Grey Order guildsmen, independents and all other sorts of rogues, Lindus suggested. Now that he was thinking of it, the hooded woman was correct, he does have some people to refer to that he can trust with a few whispers and promises of discretion within the guild. Additionally, he does have underground contacts throughout Sainagrad that he can whisper a few short words in and at a times like this. The emperor could not afford to be a beggar towards those who would answer the call of duty or in this case money. And the materials? Radrid further inquired. I will need blessed weaponry and maybe a few holy scrolls to make this work. Do not worry about that. All you need to do is to gather your pack, O oh brave wolf. When you have everyone you can muster, ask for the sunsetting earth lies on this dome here in this establishment again. You have a week to spread the word, Lindus said. Little that Radrid knows, is that the owner of the inn was a Cephid Liad informant. Even the demon lord who is leading the invasion will be exhausted too. Wouldn't you two want the opportunity to strike him down? Linda sagged, knowing that Radrid will not resist the chance to triumph over his hated peers. Very well, I will find my friends. Good day Madam Gwarthen. Radrid begged his leave. Leaving the table with an eager but roguish smile on his face, Linda smiled. Her plan works and she played the loathsome adventurer like a fiddle. Indeed. He knows not nor what his networked colleagues and associates know of the Cephid Liad's spy master's true intentions to be pawns, as expendable and as many as it can be for the true raid onto Tyrian. She will see these other worlders first hand of their strange might, and perhaps avenge her losers if she could with Prince Clovich and her little brat of a sister Arya herself. All that Radrid and his merry band have to do was to cause a loud enough ruckus for her to observe these demons and their ways and how they managed to not only rise up so quickly but also how they could defeat so many of her chess pieces in this little game of subterfuge and stratagems. The thrill of placing all of her pieces into place as she creates her grand design will be oh so satisfying. Dash. Crocker swiped down his ID card for Aliathra as she was allowed access into New Albany's underground science lab deep below the military district of the Federation's colony. Alongside the eerily blue-eyed elf was Diaz, who carried on his person a plastic bag of snacks and goodies. She can see his smile facing her as they descended down on the elevator leading them to the facility. So, Ailey how is your rise? Diaz asked. In all honesty. I couldn't tell the difference at first until you appeared before me. Aliathra replied, You stopped by at the hospital? Crocker asked Diaz. Oh no, video call. She got some HG on her head. Diaz explained. Damn it Diaz, you must have scarred the poor girl. Haven't she suffered enough? Crocker reprimanded. I am fine Sir Crocker. Aliathra diffused. I actually find being able to talk to people at long distances to be Good, she said. Hey, do you know that your new eyes can do not just call people? Diaz informed interrogatively. The elf stood silently there with her new cybernetic blue eyes as she lay frozen in curious confusion. Think of the weather Ailey, Diaz said. Think of the weather and I see will listen. What do you mean my new eyes will? What are those? Ailey Aethro inquired. Spotted at the bottom corner of her eye or at least in her perspective was a series of numbers and symbolisms inhabiting that said corner. No matter how she tried to shift her gaze, the images remain at the same place. She can see what could be seen as a vividly reproduced image of the Gleesia's sun. Malinries followed by a tuft of feathery white clouds, 
There was also an earthling number of a double digit size that Aliathra couldn't understand which sat adjacent the earthling alphabetical letter C with a small hollow circle that the elf nearly mistook for a dot on its upper right corner. Your icy blue eyes can tap into a weather satellite and tell you what's the weather like for you at your location. Ha <laughs> ha. Diaz chuckled. I see. And I see. That's a good one. Yes. Yes. Indeed it is. Aliathra mustered what she can garner from her rapidly overwhelmed the emotional capacity of wonder, curiosity and her earlier previous fears. The elevator door's ring sounded to life as the light motion of descent stopped. Aliathra still has yet to get used to the feelings that these alien contraptions produced. Until the elf size met with the blank blood red glowing orbs attached to a decayed skull standing in front of her. The skull had a body below it and it was bandaged with a linen cloth and the odorous smell of burial spices. An evil sensation crawled over Aliathra's skin as she realized the being that stood to welcome her and her friends from the elevator to be none other than a. R. Sir Crocker you have finally returned. Old Lich of Tyrian himself, Martin's deep voice echoed as he greeted them as the elevator's doors opened. Lich. Take cover, Aliathra exclaimed. The elf's instinct kicked in and her muscle memory raised her arms towards the lich as she begins to cast a holy spell towards the vile creature. Whoa. Crocker pushed down Aliathra's spell as it was about to fire away from the holy blast of light, harmlessly impacting not Martin but the elevator's floor instead. He is a friend. This lich is helping us, Crocker explained. But he is a vile monster that enslaves people's souls. Aliathra argued. Enslavement? Do you mean my skeleton army and workers? Martin asked. Aliathra nodded as she shuddered at the lich's decrepit presence. His scent reeked with rot and the corroded linen cloth that cloaked his body which lives between the realms of ethereality and material existence. As for Martin, a glance of his eyes examining the blonde-haired woman who attempted to lay a finger on him exposed Aliathra's elven leaf-shaped ears that protruded from her golden braids. What have we here? An elf of Elfin aura? Centuries have passed, yet your people still haven't changed at all. Still thinking any other way but your own is inferior or outright blasphemous. Martin spat with sarcasm. Just calm down princess. We are all friends here. Diaz added. A princess? How did you? The lich looked at Crocker and Diaz with his skeletal face emphatically emitting an aura of visible confusion. Like, a member of the royal family? The Lithors? The lich asked. Both of the two nodded silently, confirming the lich's begrudging fears. If it weren't for you Sephidliad I would have perfected my serum if it weren't for your grandfather. Martin scolded. Do not speak ill of King Horanil, Lich. You are an unholy monster. I know what kind of horrible things you are capable of doing. You can raise an army of skeleton soldiers by enslaving people's souls. He is not your friend otherworlders. He will turn all of you into part of his ghoul army. Aliathra alarmed. Who told you my necromancy is all about enslavement? They are not slaves. Merely an extension. The lich reasoned with his cold but soft-spoken voice. Those skeletons. They have no will. If a being has no will how can it be enslavement you speak of? They are just tools, powered by my magic. But the people, their bones. Aliathra muttered. They willingly let me use their bodies for a greater purpose than themselves. When it means that they can continue to serve their children and their descendants long after they pass. Martin justified calmly. They. Willingly let you use their bodies after they died? Aliathra's heart skipped in disbelief. Yes. How else was ancient Tyrian able to be the only settlement to have an irrigation system and walls compared to everyone else except the Slay Agents? Martin challenged. All of my necromancy is to create a substitute for slavery by using corpses of my loyal subjects as a labor force. We will work days and nights tirelessly. The skeletons are void of the soul as only my magic controls them. Besides, skeletons don't complain nor try to revolt and you never have to worry about feeding them as long as a mana crystal conduit is present by their side. The lich continued, essentially like robots. You know the ones you see in Kesselheim, something akin to the Tailey. Crocker added. That doesn't justify you being the origin of necromancy King Martin Hierarch of the Dead. 
The Black Elves use your book Lifro or Kim in Wyamir to create ghouls for their armies. Aliathra said, What do you mean the Black Elves uses ghouls? Martin asked, And what do you mean your estranged kin have my rubbish notes? Rubbish notes? Aliathra asked, to say she was left dumbfounded by the lich, the progenitor of necromancy to call his own creations rubbish astounded her. The elven cleric Teneneth had thought of Lyches as imperial beings who prided themselves on their mastery upon the manipulations of life. An affront to the core teachings of Neneth's dogma of respecting the natural order of all living things and to mend the deviations and occasional disjunctions that disharmonizes the goddess's creation. That book was never meant to be used as a proper spell book. There is a reason why I do not use ghouls, the lich said. Alarmed on Aliathra's epiphany, you do not know what ghouls are, and the Lifro or Kamin Wymir was not a spell book. Aliathra inquired, It's just the refuse of my research. I haven't even perfected some of the spells in those books, the Lich said. And what are these dot ghouls you speak of? he asked. The Black Elves would gather up all of the dead of their soldiers or those that they have killed, then reanimate them into these. These. Decaying things and they use them as fodder and screening troops for their armies. The Yajgung's imperial army broke when they saw their loved ones rise up to kill them. Aliathro explained. Oh, I see what they did. Perhaps it must have somehow ended up with the Black Tree Pact after the Empire had conquered Tyrion, the Lich concluded. But listen here elf, there is a very good reason why these ghouls that you speak of were as I said were junked by my research into necromancy, Martin pointed out his voice softening upon gaining his bearings on this slight to his life's work, what do you mean by that? Crocker asked, these ghouls or I just call them simply the ales to aid as I remember calling them make terrible, well, everything, raising the minmus is too efficient for whatever you want to accomplish and the fact they bring disease and are so vulnerable to a concentrated effort of outside interference such as a magic fireball made them too unfeasible when i was researching them it was way more profitable to animate and then automate a clean skeleton or a mummified corpse after all the useless flesh rots away the extra amount of magic inputted is worth the trouble when it comes to the incantations. Besides, the Aelstrid often tend to go berserk or may not even follow your commands at all that now that I had remembered how my experiments went, I blame the fact that they still retain faint traces of their cough, their living memories still attached to their rather eroding heads. These estranged kin of yours perverted my refuse. How vulgar of them. The lich cringed in disgust. Aliathra stepped back. She could not believe what she has heard from the supposed architect of necromancy. She had thought of him as someone obsessed with immortality, despotism, and narcissism. But instead, she is talking to a placid almost serene even, undead king who just wanted to build what is best for his people at an ancient time where everything had to be done with a painstaking effort of hand with primitive tools for meager returns. His voice, the way he deflected and masterfully defended himself against her accusations astounded her. Martin was nothing like the conspectuses of books and histories detailing all the monsters and vile archival figures of the darkest pasts had described. Oh, ghouls are zombies in Gleesia. You will be both surprised that killing zombies by the droves in the Federation is considered a fun pastime. Diaz chuckled. Grandfather Iris interrupted Aliathro and Martin's confrontation. What is taking you so long? The vampire witch asked. My child, Martin turned to the vampire witch. This snooty little elf maid thinks that I am a tyrant. The lich flicked his finger towards Aliathra. Sir Melona needs our presence at the testing hall at once. Iris alarmed. Damnation. Fine. We will settle this later. The lich cursed as he turned away from this minor contest of ideologies as he followed his granddaughter through the silver halls of the underground science facility. Come now Ailey, just do what I say for now and I will share you some of the potato chips. Diaz ordered. Rushing through the halls of the facility, Aliathra was led to a great spherical dome. 
a chamber of sorts with a translucent canopy that surrounded a great theater of many onlooking otherworldly scholars that Aliathra knows are called by the Federation as scientists observing the phenomena below. Looking inside, Aliathra spotted one of the few otherworlders she could emphatically correlate herself with. A one Lieutenant Samantha rose placing her hands within a bowl of ice water, her hands bandaged with snow-white linens pink and with her blood and partially thick burns especially within the palms and wrists of the intrepid redhead. The gnashing of her teeth and the impassioned screams that the elf here made her realize that Rose was in. Her veins glowed volcanically in pure blue light as the mana energies fluctuated around her like moths to a flame. It was raw unrefined and too powerful for any living being to withstand such flooding. She was suffering under the effects of mana encumbrance. What is happening here? Martin asked, his granddaughter too equally alarmed. The subject is overloading. Martin that potion now. Agent de Sut ordered. The lich, from out of his pocket grabbed a jade-colored bottle with his withered hands and glided towards Samantha as he places the bottle neck onto her mouth. The potion was a classical cure for mana encumbrance. Drink this infant, Martin said, as she swallowed the potion. The glowing blue veins dimmed and the energies surrounding her dissipated into smoky steam as sweat glistened Samantha's exposed skin. That was close. For a second I thought I had to execute her. The sud sulked in relief. What were you trying to do Sir Malona? Iris asked. You know, see how she could take all of that mana for me. I passed along some of that mana that Zartrak provided us but suddenly Samantha started to go overload according to my senses. The scientist answered. That is very dangerous you know. Her training needs to be done by proper mages like me and my granddaughter here. Martin said. The youth scientist turned his gaze to Aliathra and with a gladdened face he turns his rotund body to her. You're the gooey specialist, right? A eh, Flo? Melona asked the elf. Ah, uh, yes, I know how to help channel magic by hand, Aliathra said. The problem I see with Samantha is that she is channeling her mana wastefully. This buildup of excess mana adds up to the risk of mana encumbrance. I just call it overload, Melona commented. If I recall, Elves can naturally cast magic with less reliance for ones and staffs, Iris said. Something I tried to mimic for your granddaughter, Martin asked. Can you show me? Samantha asked. Follow my hand, Aliath threw instructed. The elf's fingers performed to what the elves pioneered and mastered. The somatic heart of the changing hand or a lure spa, the elven cleric, with centuries of experience under belt tucked her right middle and ring finger with her thumb while raising her index and little finger for her left hand, she curled around her hand making sure the knuckles side of her left hand is facing her body. She then proceeded to tuck her ring finger but not her little finger but instead let it stretch flatly across away from her. Follow my movement, Aliathra ordered. She stood up and began to blast away a short burst of mana, its energy blasting forward with her right hand still in the same somatic position she had set up, pushing forward while her left hand faced opposite away from her as her feet stood with her right foot forward. Aliathra may be ambidextrous but upon close observation with Samantha's movement patterns, she knows that the redhead is right-handed. This is an important aspect of Allure to Spa's teachings as the studies say that the strong dominant hand has the strength to give, to emit and to grant whatever the person wishes to output, the opposite is said for the weak and non-dominant hand for its purpose is to receive, to absorb and to take in. The changing hands techniques, however, were more of an elven exclusive art only taught within the walls of Pavia's Arcane Academy. Most humans would rather invest in the creation of tools such as wands, staffs and even arcane jewelry to help channel their gui efficiently but for the elves. It was as natural as breathing. Following Aliathra's commands, Samantha screeched as a ray of raw magics burst through her hands. But unlike her previous attempts to harness her powers, Samantha could feel like the mana, the foreign substance that her body had an unnatural affinity. And worse a craving for was being harmonized within her. For the first time in a long while, the lieutenant's body felt like it was reverting back to normal. Ever since she had absorbed that one magic blast, she had taken in Suville. At first, 
The sensation was exhilarating, like if she had tasted a great new flavor of ice cream that she would instantaneously become addicted to. As it was, the absorption of mana was like a stimulating drug to her. But then, too much of a good thing can be inevitably bad. When she had eaten that mana crystal whole, Samantha felt a great burn within her that was slowly building her insides up that her body urges her to evacuate. She could if it weren't for the fact that releasing the magical energies within her wasn't so unbearably painful. That is why Martin and Iris were there and the bowl of ice water was by her side. But at a moment of weakness, she nearly got herself killed by stabilizing the mana energies within her by keeping them locked inside when it was beyond her capacity to contain them safely. Agent de Sutte was ordered by Major Holyfield with executive approval from Governor White to execute her if she became too much of a risk to herself and her fellow earthlings. The lieutenant collapsed onto the ground, still burning from her previous brush of mana encumbrance but overall satisfied. Like after a long but fruitful workout. Samantha inhaled and exhaled calmly as the scientists in the room began to whisper and exchange their notes eagerly with one another. I think you did it, Iris said. We did, the Lich Martin cheered. That felt much better. Samantha smiled. Thank you. No, thank you for opening my eyes. Aliathra smiled. What do you mean? The lieutenant asked. Your people, all of them, you are not demons. Your people can never be as kind, accepting and loving to someone like me. No demon could do that. Aliathra answered. About time you do Aliathra, about damn time you do. Samantha smiled. So, enlighten me then otherworlder. What happened to you? Aliathra asked as she examined the testing chamber that she was in. It was like a centrifugal theater where the actors play at the middle of a wide circle and the audience. The scientists observe her from above. I was obliged to agree to undergo several dangerous tests to see the extent of my powers. I can absorb mana and release them but it hurts to do the releasing part. Samantha cursed. Your kind is still new to our magic. So, whatever you do with your powers or with your mana you need to consult me or Iris first. Don't be reckless. Aliathra scolded the lieutenant. Recklessness is just the fun part of science Aliathra. This happens in my world all the time since sometimes progress requires to do something stupid, Samantha said. Same for me, I nearly light my house on fire over a botched potion experiment once. You and many of your elven kind are too risk averse, you never try to do something new, always take the tried and true methods to heart. Iris added what the vampire witch said was indeed true for Aliathra. She had always stuck to the teachings that her professors, instructors, and any authoritative figure told her, passed down from their predecessors, again and again for millennia. But look at what all that they had taught got both her and potentially themselves into. The worst that could happen is that they may be crushed violently under the Federation's boot, but if by the divination of her goddess or whomever it may be, she has the power to prevent a calamity. Right now, she needs to continue allowing these other worlders to play her in the present. Perhaps one day, she may return home, and definitely not as a demon. May I ask another question, Lajui Rose? If you are testing out your powers then where are the targets or training dummies you are supposed to test yourself with? Aliathra asked. You see those black spots that smell like ash? Those were the targets. Iris set them up for practice. Samantha bluntly said. Aliathra noticed the burnt marks that tainted the grey ground of the testing chamber. And the elf was both unsurprised and fearful of what extent Samantha's powers is capable of. Bravo. Bravo. A voice echoed down from the theatre above. I knew this would be worth my interest. A silver man in a black suit descended upon the native magic users. Samantha and Dr. Malona while under a heavy escort of two mechanized bodyguards armed to the teeth in cybernetics. The carefree Dr. Malona tensed his hunchbacked spine straight as the man a quarter of his scale walked towards him. Samantha too, wobbled back up with all the remaining strength as she could to do the same, combining that by the considerable security he brought with him, Aliathra. Iris and Martin knew that he is held in much more importance than the likes of all other leaders that they have met. 
They all had very unusual names like scientist and squad mixed with familiar words like chief, governor and the word leader. What can this man's rank they wonder to strike fear into the heart of all of them combined? Thomas Sight, Ministry of Education, English professor and political theorist extraordinaire, the silver-skinned bald man said. I have crossed the stars to meet you. His voice was a mix of a monotonous robotic voice that was smoothed out in an uncanny attempt to sound something vaguely coherent. None of the native Gleasons could forget the sight of this man's face. His eyes had no natural irises. Instead, multiple lead lights glow like miniature suns conjured up the other worlder's unique interpretation of the ocular organ. His neck was of another description entirely, in contrast to his silver white skin. His neck was pitch black with a supporting mechanism across opposite ends of his neck that pumps up and down with each slight jounce of his head. You're too gracious, sir. So, you come to study our magic I presume? Martin returned his pleasantries. Not just that, but I will also be Prince Klovich's official liaison to the Federation's ruling party, the Common State Party. That's being someone who lives and helps advise the Prince on many matters from here on out. Thomas said. Oh, I see. The Prince as I have heard has taken an interest in your otherworldly powers. Me included. Aliathra nodded. I know your very curious case Miss Lytha. I have to say that you have both my personal and the party's condolences. But I am quite pleased to see you are doing well for yourself especially with those. Thomas nudged Aliathra's steel-bladed legs by lightly kicking them. You know, you are quite different than the other ones I have met. Iris commented. Most of your people tend to be either very impassioned or very shrewd. You, of course, speak of Governor White, Major Holyfield, and Colonel Polonsky. All three loyal without fault. It's just how they show their loyalty is what makes them different. Tell me, Miss Cadahagan I presume? What do you think of them? Thomas leaned forward to ask. Holyfield speaks like a preacher but he backs those words with his actions with so much zeal. He is no hypocrite, that is for sure. As for Sir Polonsky, he is calm and always tries to think ahead. He is also very caring for the men he works with. And the governor? I see him as someone who will get the job done and will do anything to see it through. I like that in people people with zeal and devotion but take the time to commune with those. That is pretty interesting, from someone who has to live alone for most of their life. Thomas nodded. That also reminds me, since you and the elf are perhaps our best sources on how magic can work here in Gleesia you should be able to teach what you know to Miss Rose too. The wig said. Are you proposing to us to be Miss Rose's instructors? Iris asked. Of course. You will be well compensated for the trouble and we can even provide you your own lodging as long as you agree to teach Miss Rose everything you know, the liaison explained. My own home? I cannot say no to that. I accept. Iris accepted without hesitation, as for Aliathra, she hadn't quite thought through about how she would actually live inside New Albany yet. She knew that she was essentially a prisoner in a gilded cage with a lofty title. All dancing like a puppet to the whims of her youth masters, but even some form of freedom, her own abode where she can peacefully meditate and contemplate herself would be most welcome. I agree, she said reluctantly. Great, I will have you be arranged to live in the same house together immediately. Thomas Sight said. What? Aliathra and Iris exclaimed. Living together. A cleric of the life goddess Neneth and the antithesis to her teachings, a vampire was almost impossible to be seen true. Surely you. Iris tried to negotiate but Thomas stopped her. Look I know that you two are the opposite of each other in species but you two are among the top mages we have right now to teach Sam and may I remind that you two still owe us a lot. We gave you all of what you have so far and imagine where would you be without us. There is still so much we can do together so you shouldn't back down now. Appeal to their interests and previous favors. Thinking back at the moment, both of them feel that they do owe a lot of things to the youth. For the vampire witch, they released her from Divico's harassment and sheltered her from the persecution of the Inquisition not to mention giving her a chance of having a life where she is accepted for the way she is. In the case of the elf, 
The youth saved her life at least three times already so she feels deeply indebted to them. Plus the recent actions of her kind could lead to her kin's destruction if she is not there to bridge the gap between her people's aloof heads against the youth's guns. Both Iris and Aliathro had their own reasons for wanting their own home. An additional security measure of having dual positions in the youth's machinery will secure her place in New Albany politically speaking. For the elven cleric ranger, sleeping in such an uneasy place alone in the cold green grass may be something she has been trained to do. But under close monitoring and her still shaky trust with the Federation sees that in her own personal well-being, she needs a form of shelter where she can call her own spaceless. She has to sleep under the gazing eyes of the men in the mech bay of the garrison or inside Diaz's car. I accept. Iris nodded as she stared at the elf with hostile intent, her face, stoic not to betray her true feelings. Perhaps when she does move inside her albeit shared home, she can at least invite that handsome Cairn to help warm the abode and even help her move and the inevitable furniture she will have to set up inside. Yes, I will accept too. Aliathra followed suit. When they get to their new home. They will have to establish certain rules to draw the line in the sand of where they can or cannot be in. Very good. Then let the limits of what can be done with magic be pushed ever further with your insight. Thomas smiled. You and I think quite alike, Martin commented. Indeed, it is good to see someone who loves to solve problems as much as I do. Perhaps we can speak again over coffee, a meeting of the minds, the youth minister proposed. I can't drink. I am a lich, Martin bluntly said. Oh yeah. Thomas awkwardly paused. Dash. Iris and Aliathra aside as they crashed themselves onto the underground lab's cozy break room. It had been a long day since the two were just dismissed from debriefing with Dr. Malona's team on Samantha's conditions and what are the plans for Samantha moving forward. Despite the training regimes that they planned from how to properly manage the lieutenant's mana flow in her body in the meantime before she can get her suit in order. To Aliathra's astonishment, who has her fair share of witnessing arcane-related armorsmithing, the Apara Corporation and the cooperating youth scientists sure had an excellent plan of creating a suit of armor that can allow the lieutenant to store her mana properly monitoring said levels, siphon more of mana when commanded to and also to release said energies efficiently with the two minerals, associated with everything arcane and gleesia, actocolite, and gyronite, one for storing mana, the other for releasing it. To both of the gleesian mages, such a project had never been undertaken in the history of their lives or any other records that could suggest such an attempt. They had always thought that Actocolite and Gyronite were two polar opposites that can never intermingle, like fire and ice, oil and water, humans and Dawson. You know Iris, the way your teachings worked on La Dewey Rose was very presumptuous. You nearly got her killed. Alia through a reprimanded Iris. It's not like I have the natural affinity for it elf. Your way is too soft. She will never learn anything if she doesn't know how to push herself to reach it. Iris said, My training was refined and passed down by the greatest of spellsinners for generations. And you? An accident by some hubristic backwater king who wanted power for his own sake. Aliathra appointed. Because he was envious of your kind elf. We vampires have to train ourselves in secret at best or just rely on sheer power to survive as apostates. You can freely roam around your pretty pink paradise without a care in the world. Me? I had to teach myself all of what I know. Iris argued, and yet you lack the means to step back and think before you act. Aliathra said, and yet you lack the means to initiate. Iris argued back you stand there and wait for your opponents to begin. Iris countered, there is no beginning nor an end in elven culture. Have you ever wondered why elven books had such a peculiar design? Aliathra mentioned, I recall. They are circular design and all the pages are attached to a central spine like the spokes of a cartwheel. I think I remembered seeing one being sold by a merchant in Tyrian. Couldn't afford it at the time. Iris said, Indeed. Neither a beginning nor an end. Just what happens in front of you. Aliathra nodded. What matters to Rose is what happens to her now. She must let the gui within her dictate her move. 
let her see the full spectrum of the winds of magic before she decides on where she calls to next. Aliathra said, I disagree, Samantha shouldn't devote herself fully into one discipline of magic, she must be able to reach out to other forms too. Let her take control of her power and unleash it to wherever she pleases. Iris said, then let me agree to disagree on everything but that, Aliathra concluded. About what? The vampire which asked. Only Samantha knows how to use her powers. Who are we to judge what she does with them? All we can do is teach her how to use it safely. Aliathra said. Agreed. And effectively. Iris nodded. Just as then, the door of the break room opened as a large man walked inside carrying multiple bags of food on his hands. By the way, his brown beard was unfurled down. It was none other than Strider Group's resident sharpshooter and proud parent, Abidai Root. Greetings Sir Root. Iris sent her salutations, but the man didn't respond. Instead, he dropped all of the bags carrying chips, soda, coffee and candy onto the counter table's surface across where Aliathra and Iris sat and walked at first quietly to the water cooler next to it. Ah. Hello girls. Nice morning we are having a Bidaya's voice, instead of his usual cheerful self. It was cracked and under duress despite the calming tone he futilely tried to mask under. It's about to be sunset a Bidaya. Are you alright? Shouldn't you be happy now that you have reunited with your family again Sir Root? Aliathra asked. She knows it's sunset thanks to the visual stimuli on her new IC telling her that above at the surface, Malinaries is now setting down to allow her sister Calariel to rise above her in place. Everything is fine, everything is fine, everything is fine, everything is not fucking fine. Go damn you. I am fucked. I am fucked. My daughter is fucked. My wife is going to fuck. Abidaya tried to retain his calming voice, clumsily repeating the same phrase before he croaking and descending into expletives. By Nanith's grace, calm down. What is happening with you? Aliathra stood up from her seat and walked towards the back settled to be dire with Iris following on his trail. It's April's birthday in about a week and I haven't gotten so many things in order. A be dire despaired. I need to secure a venue, get catering and provide entertainment. He cried. There is no need to cry about it. Iris said, do you know what kind of torture? It is to hear April cry on her very special day among all others. I am not going through that again. I want to give her the best 8th birthday party she will ever have, he said. But crying here won't help your daughter's celebration come to fruition. Aliathra reasoned. I know, but everything is just going wrong. I can't seem to juggle finding all three of what Leah told me to get for the party. The venue. The food. The entertainment. Abidaya pulled his hair. If only I had some magic way of solving all of this. He sulked down to the counter, slamming his arms onto the marble surface. He needs something magical if he were to get out of this challenge of parenthood alive, mentally speaking. But then it had hit him, something magical. Abidaya turned to the two mages and smiled, his burdensome eyes filling with his tears tried to straighten up as he made his appeal to them. Are you available to go to my home and do a little practice? If you want to help me after you're done training Samantha with her magic classes can you, like, provide said magic for my daughter's birthday party? He asked. That might seem quite a stretch good sir. We just are about to move into a new home that Iris tried to tactfully decline. I will pay you 1,000 credits to show up for practice every day and then 15,000 for doing the magic show on April's birthday. Please, do it not just for me you too, but for my little April. He appealed. Well if there is some coin involved, I accept. Iris smiled. But Iris, are you sure we should agree to this? Aliathra dejected but the vampire which hushed her. Trust me with this elf. You are going to need these credits this man will give you if you even want to make your stay in New Albany, somewhat tolerable with me around. Iris whispered. Very well I accept too. Aliathra sighed. If it was for her own sake of having to live in the same household as the unholy Iris. Wonderful. Abidaya cheered. That's one dashing magician and one beautiful princess for April's princess themed birthday party. He mentioned a princess birthday party. Aliathra shivered silently at the hearing of that. 
memories of all the strict lessons, etiquette and the pompous superficiality of talk haunted her mind. What on Gleesia's green earth did she get herself into? Dash. Today's tour for Klovich was a factory, but not just any normal run-of-the-mill factory, but the factory for the United Federation's armed forces, the Tahoe Reno Industrial Megaplex an all-government-owned industrial park whose sole purpose in life was to produce the arsenal of the UFIF. Although there were a couple of dozen of megaplexes all over the Federation's territories of similar and even larger size, Tahoe Reno was the oldest and where all the practices of mass-produced arsenals based their models on. Prince Klovich marveled at the sight of the Federation's military might produced endlessly and tirelessly by the steel arms of the robotic drones that inhabit the factory. From military jeeps to weapons of war it was like the strength of millions of blacksmiths had concentrated into one area to do their craft. He had been to dwarven forges as a child when he had toured his neighbors with his late father by the greatest of volcanic forges of Kerfalda before but it paled like an ant to a dragon that was Tahoe Reno. All of the forges, smithies and ironworks around to compare were horrendously slow, insignificant and pathetic compared to what he has witnessed. The speed of the Federation's industry was breathtaking and equally terrifying to behold. One loss of their machines of burden and they can easily replace three times even. Sometimes he still cannot believe all of these wonders of manufacturing are built and done without a single trace of magic. Furthermore, these so-called machines can work effectively days to days without the needs of rest with such precision, details, volume and speed that makes an army of slaves back home in Slay Eaton slave city looked unproductive in comparison. He even got the chance, allowed by the factory workers as to try on several of their inventions and ho oh, what fun he and his entourage had interacting with them. The Prime Minister has got to say. His otherworldly guests look very silly wearing the nightly tactical mesh helmets. Such power. What kind of magic do you earthlings possess? Ed Merle asked. He was examining the test firing of a rod-shaped device that was no larger than a well-built man's arm. At first, the wizened old mage who advises all that is arcane to Prince Klovich dismissed the device as something of a mere toy. But when the rod fired away with a great blast of smoke, a projectile that dashed faster than his eye could see towards a wall set up meters away and obliterating it on sight, Ed Merle jumped onto the weapon tester. Not magic, just science, the engineer responded. Hey, this helmet is actually easier to breathe in. One of Klovich's knights commented when he alongside his lord put on the tactical mesh helmets that the youth standard issues to their soldiers. Imagine. My knights and the men at arms wearing all of this, Klovich dashingly bragged as he toted the Afif's combat rig to the, enforced, approval of his traveling companions. You do look quite great. Wait. You want to have your men have this? Basket asked. The prince nodded, but for a moment of brief silence, the prime minister gave pause. He knew there was a risk in giving the other worlders their weapons but there was also the benefit of being able to puppet control over them through the party-owned military industrial complex. It was much more preferable than letting the megacorpos, even if it was a paracorpo monopolized Gleesia's entire untapped riches, there was also the double-edged effect of having an army of natives equipped with youth weaponry to have a hit or miss effect on the local populace. It could either generate legitimacy on the youth's interests in peaceful coexistence with them or the worst it could frighten Tyrion's neighbors into hostile action. If it were not the way, Klovich smiled at the prospects of uplifting himself for not his own sakes but for his people and his sister's sakes, the prince's prospects would have been doomed from the start. Instead, the prime minister decides to roll his dice. Fortune favors the bold after all. Well. That could be arranged. Basket smiled. Just then, his cell phone rang. Looking down on the screen it was an interstellar call from all the way from Gleesia. It was Major Holyfield, the commander. He had sent a boost to the new colony's security. By the way, he had to pull the strings to get a direct line with the chairman of the High Command Commission. This must better be of most importance. May you excuse me for a moment? 
He begged for his temporary leave. Please enjoy your time in Tahoe Reno for now. Walking towards a secluded area, the Prime Minister pressed his finger on the green button of his phone's screen and started the call. Chairman, there has been a development. Major Holyfield grizzled voice reverberated on the speaker. What happened now Major? I thought you had the situation under control, the Prime Minister answered. A new development has occurred that requires your attention, Holyfield informed. Will this affect our long-term goals in Benham 3? Basket asked. Yes, the Major bluntly nodded. The Prime Minister sighed. When will these natives learn that they cannot fight the Cascading River? Make this quick. What do you need? The Prime Minister opened himself. The defense back in New Albany requires additional security measures and we could use more materials for White's infrastructure program, Holyfield said. I see. The Prime Minister scratched his chin. Who should I write the transfer orders for? He asked. You know of 119 THs and 52 NDs division, right? The 333rd. I need the armored. The artillery the rockets, the infantry, my headquarters, and the reserves too. Holyfield made his request. I also need an additional carrier with more marines and a wing attached. Maybe throw in a spec op team too while you're at it. Perhaps the Aurora's sister, the Tenacity, he added. That is a tall one major, even by your own standards, the Prime Minister said. Some of the watchdogs on my back might get suspicious of such a large number of troops, especially as famous as the 333rd just. Leave from Fort Sparta. Some are going to start asking questions you know. What are you planning Major? The Prime Minister aired suspicion down his phone's mic. I am planning something big. I have reasons to believe that the Empire might not be so friendly to us as you and Governor White had thought, Holyfield said, in a vain attempt to dodge the question, and you're saying, Basket pressed, not buying the Major's ambiguity, I dot the Empire, I have reasons to believe that they are planning to put the boot on both Prince Clovich and the colony, Mr. Prime Minister, Holyfield confessed, I have in the works a plan, a master offensive that will decisively, you're planning to roll in the tanks on these primitives? Basket asked, alarmed by the Major's idea. How sure are you of this? Basket asked. It's not a war one I'm doing Mr. Prime Minister, it is a pacification campaign. Holyfield explained. Based on my experience and a recent dot incident in a region called Souville sir. Details should be in your private email sir. Plus, now it's high time for you wigs back at Earth to push those pencils of yours and make a move. Already a para corporation just initiated and I don't want to be caught when more of them corpos show up. Get your industry friends over here and stat, the major reminded. Actually, you haven't heard? But I have a man already there sent ahead sometime after Clovich left. He goes by Thomas Sight. He's going to help ease relations and push for development with our own people already. But even then, you need to help him know what kind of anything can be feasible down there, the Prime Minister informed. Still even if you go through with this plan of yours, then all of this fanfare I am doing with the Prince will be all for nothing. He is a vassal after all and the Empire is his master. Basket politicked with a reprimanding voice. Well his master has been doing everything he could to impede our progress. Holyfield exaggerated. Look here Major, without a casus belli, the best that we can do in our own interests is a defensive build up or at the very least, we station the troops above orbit quietly and just roll in when the shit kicks the fan. Basket said. I understand. Prince Clovich won't react well to a whole lot of troops in his principality as it would violate the treaty. But, the colony and the principality, the Sleechen and their allies could kill them if we don't make a move and I am having almost zero confidence that Clovich's master would listen to what we're going to say judging from what happened to our little elven princess asset, Holyfield said. He didn't want to see the peaceful coexistence between the New Albany colony and Tyrian be seen as a creeping takeover. He wanted the natives to accept the youth and embrace them and such a scenario requires not soldiers, but builders of all shapes and specialties. I get your point major, but remember, Kazus Billy or no offensive. E.M. Pacification campaign Basket accentuated, or it's our heads, he forewarned. So. 
My 333rd Division, Holyfield asked, thinking deeply. The Prime Minister weighed out his options in that short moment. He reasoned based on his previous encounters with the hardlining major that it was better to be like Noah, building a boat in the desert than to be the rest of the damned of humanity doomed to drown in a deluge. Once he has finished dealing with Clovich's little furlough on Earth, he will start making the power moves that he and the rest of the common state party has planned for their interests and easier to be seen through. Permission granted. Basket cautiously initiated. Chapter 37, A Fading Piece. Are you sure about this? Samantha asked. She was wearing her a plain green training shirt, black colored jogging pants and most peculiar of all, a sparring helmet, designed for hand-to-hand -hand combat training, handily provided by a concerned daily Aether. at the last minute when she had heard what Iris has planned for her magical arts training today. Before the lieutenant deemed the chosen one of the sigil Ranupata or the shareholder, was Iris Kadahagan and whole assortment of various items ranging from weights medicine balls and even a several articles of clothing curled up in the shape of balls being floated around by Iris Mage Hand Spell. You need to learn how hold yourself against any attacks from those who will try to hunt you down. I have to live through this every day before your arrival and it's only right I teach you how to survive. Iris said. Yes. Okay. I remember from yesterday you taught me how to use the shield spell right? Samantha turned to the elf cleric. Indeed, remember what I taught you. Aliathra reminded. The shield spell, as Samantha can decipher from Aliathra's teachings is from a subcategory of the Restoration School of Magic. I got it. Samantha readied herself. She grabbed the unbinilium crystal set aside to her on a pedestal set up by Dr. Malona who observed quietly above her by the testing chamber's theater. Today's lesson. She raised her voice. Block all of my attacks, she declared. Immediately, Iris hurled the first of projectiles, a five kilogram weight flying towards Samantha's direction. Tensing her knees and shoulders, the redhead braced herself as the magical energies circulate around her. Curling her fingers down facing the thumb, Samantha effortlessly casted a sapphire colored circle on her hands, impacting the oncoming projectile. The weight harmlessly fell down before her, much to Iris' closeted sadism and Daliathra's nervousness. At the earliest of stages, the lieutenant was able to fairly withstand the lighter and fairly discernible reeds of Iris' barrage, but as time progresses, Samantha's reserves began to deplete causing the shield to ricochet off the thrown projectiles before dampening the impact of the attacks that managed to come through until ultimately, Samantha faltered to try and hold the shield altogether. Stop, Samantha begged as she shielded herself from the medicine balls thrown at her with her limp arms. Yes, hold this lesson. You are going to injure her. Aliathra rushed to Samantha to check her vitals. Fortunately, thanks to her mana readings she discerns she was still hosting a safe level of mana inside her. After confirming the lieutenant's safety, the elf eyes darted to the vampire witch simmering with apprehension. Iris gave pause, disappointed at the Chosen One's weakness. She was about to exhaust her mana already. Iris, your idea of training will not work, not at least alone that is. Aliathra reprimanded. Samantha needs to push harder if she wants to unlock her true potential elf. Her training is to hold her shield for as long as ten minutes to replicate what an intense magic fight could entail. If she fails here, she could be cut down by fireballs, magic missiles and ice spikes or what not out there. She will be overwhelmed. Iris replied with a scolding voice. Besides, she is a soldier after all. Shouldn't she be used to this? She argued. I disagree. Samantha is still new to all of this magic and must take this much more slowly. Aliathra protested. I agree. To disagree elf. Iris dejected. What can you do? She challenged. May I give a suggestion? Aliathra requested to Samantha. Instead of holding out and just standing in front of Iris all the time, why not strike back? The elf proposed. Absolutely not. Iris dejected. She must learn how to defend herself from an onslaught or she will not survive out there. She argued. Back in the academy, we were told that when it comes to creating wards and shields, abjuration spells or amdefined girl. 
we are to only cast when we have no other means of protecting ourselves. We were trained to use as much as necessary before we find an opening to strike back. In essence, block then counterattack. Aliathra said, Yeah, that sounds right, Miss Lethe. Why not try that? I mean, I am not meant to be left alone all the time. I have the rest of Strider and Yuta in my team. Samantha nodded. What makes you say your way is better? Iris argued to the elf. I am not saying it is better. I am just expanding upon your teachings La Duica de Hagen. Alathro explained. The point back in the academy is not to be told what is correct. But to be able to disprove what you think is correct. Isn't the point of this training being to push the limits of Samantha's powers after all? It's not enough to know just what you are doing now. The elf reasoned. Perhaps I shall try that. Iris thought. Very well. Again, if you can lay one finger against me, then you shall pass this lesson. Iris nodded, conjuring her magics again. Iris Mage Hand grabbed all of the objects she was using for her projectile defensive training and readied herself to release them. Digging down at her position again, Samantha braced for the upcoming barrage. The unbinilium energies reconstituted around her veins again as Iris threw one of several dozens of medicine balls at her. With her powers, Samantha stopped the ball midair before promptly returning the vampire witch the favor by teasingly brushing the ball past the witch's head. Iris reflexively, with a slight delay to register what had happened lost focus for a moment. You see? At that moment, you are now afraid. Aliathra justified, the infamous selven smug protruding down on the vampire witch. Shut up elf. Iris fangs gnashed whilst the elf laughed haughtily. Not to be deterred, the vampire witch released more of the objects she held towards Samantha, but with a renewed will from Aliathra's more finesse's approach to her training, Samantha managed to catch all of the objects thrown at her person before lo and behold to Iris' shock and Aliathra's amusement, now the lieutenant has all the means of attack whilst Iris didn't. Prepare yourself. Samantha smiled as she unleashed one full storm of metal furniture and soft plastics onto the vampire witch who haphazardly curled herself into a protective shield. Her smug grin wiped off of her face and her silky raven hair becoming undone of its flow as she withstood the hail. Point made? Aliathra asked the vampire witch. Point made. Iris admitted defeat. You know, you too, Samantha commented. I am glad both of you are here with me learning everything I can from you. She smiled. You are both right you know. Sometimes I need to push myself with my new powers sometimes. Others I may need to take it slow. Your trainings were both of great help. The lieutenant bowed. For the next few hours inside that chamber, Aliathra and Iris continued Samantha's magical training. The red-haired lieutenant learned not only how to best use wards and shields to protect herself but also several more iconic spells like Fireball, Magic Missile, and even the Tweeterbird spell that Sam abused to playfully annoy Dr. Malona's science team observing her to no end. Despite several arguments between Iris and Aliathra's training methods, one to push, one to nurture, Samantha took all of their lessons to heart despite the differences. Few. The lieutenant wiped the sweat of her brow. That was fun. Yes, indeed. Iris nodded. Perhaps tomorrow we can test how you do with a few alteration spells, Lug Fear. I can teach you how to command the forces of the earth and make metal, trees and water bend to your will. Aliathra said. He he. Samantha chuckled. Bent elements to my will. Reminds me of Avatar. She said as she glugged down her bottle of refreshing ice water down her thirsting mouth. Avatar? What is this avatar you speak of? Aliathra asked. Oh, it's just some show that was popular for its time back at Earth. It's about these people who can bend the elements. Earth, fire, air, and water just like what you said, the lieutenant explained. A show like those plays inside your magic mirrors? Aliathra asked. Yes, she nodded. You know, you actually gave me an idea for it. But that could be for another day. You interested to see? Samantha invited. I am intrigued. I would love to. The elf accepted. Me too. Iris added. Attention. Attention. Dr. Malona's voice echoed down upon them from his gallery. You three. 
Please come to my office right now. I have a few things to discuss with you before you can go, Dr. Malona said. The three promptly climbed up to the scientist's office situated above them next to the observation gallery of the testing chamber. There the girls can see the scientist had placed on a large holographic screen, recordings, textual observation notes and a small obsession well with interconnected colored lines attached to several ineligible ramblings of a disorganized but focused scholar detailing of Samantha's actions throughout her tests and tutorial sessions throughout her time with him. Melona was smiling humorously at all of his recordings as the girls entered his office. The ministry is gonna love this. Melona grinned. Is there anything else that you want to test? I do want to get back out there outside already. I am kind of getting restless just being on my EM dot cell this past week. Samantha complained. When the ministry deems you can control yourself then they will let you go back to command for your squad now. The scientist informed. Oh, come now doc. How long would it take for you to synthesize that armor now? And how the hell are we going to get everything? Samantha inquired about Dr. Malona's proposal. She had heard more of the scientists' promises of a revolutionary new armor tailor made for her but for all of the man's innovation lust, she has yet to see it pass the form-fitting drawings that David showed to her and even then he was no fashion designer due to his unfamiliarity with the female form. I know I know. But your containment and dispersion suit needs the materials before we get this party started. Luckily, we know where to get some right now. Okay, a lead but still. David answered, a lead? Samantha asked. Luya Amirian's brother in the Astrox has some friends who are part of the Miners Guild for the Dwarven Clans. They are a pretty tight-knit group of folks so if one mine knows where to get a certain ore, the rest will know too. We can get all the Gyronite. Actocolite and the scandonite that we will need for your suit plus more. You will be finally allowed to be left alone from, well, not hurting people accidentally by your nuclear powers, Melona said. I have the powers of the atom within me and this is still terrifying. Samantha sulked down and see her two pinked hands with distraught. She cooled her hands off with a quick shake of her wrists to allay the singe of her hands as the vampire witch and elven cleric walked to her. But magic is a gift, and this dot nuclear ya you speak of? Why do you fear it so much? The way you describe the mana crystals and this nuclear ya you speak as if you fear it. But why fear something that you can control? Don't you have machines to contain them? Iris asked. A moment of tense silence gave Malona and Samantha pause to Iris' question. They both looked at each other longingly, not knowing how to say the answer Iris speaks. Neither of them don't want to leave the vampire witch in the dark on what kind of mythical power those nuclear energy can entail in addition to its less than wholesome origins. Not all creations were made with the best of intentions. Melona broke his silence. Some of the things we had made used to start as something very, very frightening, he continued. Malona turned to his computer and then searched around the Ethernet for several videos and photos. Nuclear power is the releasing of energy from two powerful atoms. Like, really small, power, things that we can catch and use. Think like what happens to break a mana crystal but at a more violent scale. Samantha explained, her voice awkwardly dumbing down the more scientific bits of nuclear power. How dangerous can it be? Aliathra asked. If it is like our mana crystals then you can control it, she said. It's not that simple. Nuclear energy or radioactive energy has a mind of its own. When let loose it can do so much harm to everything, Melona said. Samantha's powers. It's dangerous I tell you. You still don't realize what you are doing is probably the only thing keeping Samantha from either being killed outright or worse used against your people as a weapon of mass destruction, he said. Mass destruction? Aliathra gagged trying to comprehend such a combination of adjectives to describe an armament. She never would consider a fellow mage, even if not born of the same world as Samantha, to be a weapon of mass destruction, most mages have temporal limits to their bodies with some having the constitution to regularly push said limits, her people included. Look here, David Leo the two Glizians attention to the screen, tell me, Iris and Aliathra? 
do you honestly believe what you saw in Kesselheim, or what we did in Souville? The big ships, the guns, our vehicles, our cities, was our fullest and the most high of our potential? Melona asked. That is only a fraction of our full power. Samantha grimly added, in our long history of wars on Earth, we Earth humans developed terrifying new weapons of war in order to defeat our opponents as efficiently as possible. Melona reluctantly lectured, efficiently as possible? Iris asked, with a click of David's fingers. The screen metamorphosized to a barrage of images that bombarded the Gleesians' eyes in color, but not of playful prismatic variegations, but of vivid violence in its naked true self. The screen before the girls was perhaps the most macabre sight they had ever seen in all of their long lives. Not even Iris, a woman who had her fair share of the acts of murder and the sight of the very worst of the social conditions of the Empire's racist laws against her kind shuddered at the sight of what she saw. A golden cloud soon erupted from the inferno. At first, the sight was relieving to see that the instinctual fear of fire's burning kiss dissipated, but for Aliathra, at that next moment she wished that if she were to die, she would be dead through the flames. The golden gas descended upon a group of weary blue men who looked upon the gas holding their breath in dread and held their breath in dread the forever did as they clawed their throats with them hopelessly as their life was stolen away by such a gilded yet silent killer. Their eyes frothed in tears as they lay motionless and twisted in mangled angles to the ground as they drown in their own vomit, saliva, and breathlessness. It disgusted the elven cleric to the goddess of life so much that she felt sick in her stomach. Such agony. The antithesis of her goddess's teaching of giving solace to the body. A diary of faces permanently implanted into the poor elf's head. Neneth's grace. Aliathra grabbed the nearest trash bin to her person and vomited. Her naive stomach unable to weather the scenes she is witnessing. Seeing the chemical reactions done to the people in the video had slightly unnerved Iris, for her own magical spells of fire, ice and most especially acid were of similar experiences to the results of previous escapades and soirees, but such grievous harm to the human body was insignificant to the next horrifying weapon David showcased. Images, still and animated, display of fire, burning steel and worst of all faces, faces of people in agonizing stillness as their bodies lay mutilated in ways not even the elf knew the living body could bend or break in such a way, they trembled as the screen emitted the audio of chilling rumble made in place as a great mushroom cloud of smoke erupted from the ground and a voice leaving a crater of what was once a living city in its wake, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. The ominous rumble of the cracking earth made cold sweat flow down their brows as Samantha felt her hand being grasped by none other than Iris Kudahagan herself as she struggled to keep the highbrow demeanor of her own mortality to be humbled by the sight of such power. These eldritch insights into the ways of the earthling war were incomprehensible to the scale of what the natives had ever seen before. The showcasing of chemical gas, the atom bomb and the earthcracker orbital bombardment over Beltavif. Thinking back, she had heard of the stories of the previous demon invasions that Gleesans had undergone through their history. Although the time was long since passed and only told through oral or privileged readings of the legendary romanticizations of the events, to see such a horrifying sight in vivid detail could not compare to speech or written thought. The faces of deceased, their mutilated bodies, the inventions born of war and the sheer scale had made them pale with fear as their volition began to break. End of Block 4